Good day, everybody. It's Sunday, and you know what that means. It's time for some powerful magic here on Loading Ready Run as we present the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championships brought to you by us here at Loading Ready Run, Yellow Jacket uh, Comics here in Victoria, uh, with some additional prize support from Dragon Shield. My name is Graham Stark, joined by Benjamin Wheeler. Thank you for having me, Graham. It's great to be here. And uh, very happy to uh, have you all with us today for, as I said, some powerful magic. Uh, Highlander is a tremendously fun format to watch and to play. Uh, if you, you haven't experienced it yourself, uh, stick around. It's going to be it's going to be a blast today. I'm going to hit on some housekeeping before we get into it. Um, the vod for this. Uh, as with all of our Magic VODs, will be available on youtube.com slash LRRMTG. And for those who are watching us there, hello! Thank you! Uh, and this stream and show and everything that we do here at Loading Ready Run is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash Loading Ready Run, uh, or by subscribing here on Twitch, as some people may do, and we will be uh, welcoming them at the end of the stream today. Uh, also, today, August 16th, is the last day to pre-order the Moonbase Space Lines merchandise collection to help celebrate the launch of Moonbase Mark VI uh, as it is currently being framed. <laughs> uh, it's uh, no walls yet. Well, the skeletons of walls are in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. August? Did I say August? I said August 16th. I'm sorry. April. The other A month. I assume... Chad says... Chad's saying August, so I assume that I'm... I, didn't words properly. There is some general confusion about dates and times and all that. I was going to say, but... speaking of which, we're here in, in the middle, well, maybe not the middle, but we're here, you know, well into 2023, and we're looking at the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. Yes. So what's what's up with that wheeler? So for previous years, um, we would host the year-end tournament mm -hmm. in February. Mm. However, um, there was this thing still ongoing, pandemic, all that jazz. And so tournaments actually starting up in 2022, a bit of a slow roll to get going, uh, trying to make sure that everything is you know safe and, and that when we do get back into it, we get back into doing it properly. Mm -hmm. um, been a heck of a year. <laughs> yeah. you try, try getting eight Magic players together for a specific thing, impossible, impossible. Um, this year also had uh, kind of a, uh, it's been a tough year for mm. the Canlan or Victoria community um, where we had a more reasonable top eight in the sense of everybody was locked in. Mm. Um, and then we had a couple of people having to uh, dip out for various reasons, which means we had to run a qualifier to make sure that people that had tied qualifying points uh, got in and... It's a lot. It is 2023. You're okay. Yes. Take a deep breath. So, who do we have in our top eight? Let's take a let's take a look at the bracket. We're going to be showing you every match of the top eight today. Uh, matches one through well, the the um, the first four uh, are going to be best of threes, mm -hmm. and then we move to best of fives. Correct. for the semis and finals. That is correct. Um, so let's start with the player that had the most tournament wins sure. uh, from 2022. Uh, Benjamin Wheeler. Oh, uh, I'm not familiar with this man. It's going to be in here. Um, <laughs> that's coming up later. But uh, the person with the second most wins, that would be uh, Robin Sorensen, ah. uh, who is actually in our first match against Connor Hayward. Robin Sorensen being, uh, playing uh, Just Guy Green Tempo. Uh, sorry, Spearmint Lovers. Uh, and Connor Hayward playing Thoracle, four-color Thoracle combo. Uh, then the other match on this side of the bracket is myself playing Red Deck Wins against Sasha Christensen, winner of the Chris Sutherland Charity Tournament that mm, we ran right. in 2022. On the um, other side of the bracket, Dave Brunson on Blue White Artifacts, mm -hmm. Matthew Greer on Jess Guy Tempo, mm -hmm. Jace Trimble on Seeker Walk Tempo, mm -hmm. and Jack Hanneke on Death and Taxes. There's a couple of extra colors in that death and taxes list. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, isn't death and taxes usually not blue or green? That's correct. It's typically mono white occasionally with another color splashing. Uh, I believe that's mental misstep and dryad militant causing issues for uh, everyone, <laughs> if I had to take a guess. Um, but yeah, a lot of basic planes over there. Excellent, all right. Uh, so yeah, that's about, I mean, I don't think there's much more we need to do before uh, round before we go to round one. So let's let's talk briefly about our first round. As, sure. as I said, we've got Connor Hayward on four-color Thoracle with Robin Sorensen on uh, Jeskai Green 
tempo. Yeah. So what 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 did, what can we expect from these decks and this matchup? So Connor's deck is a combo control deck using Thassa's Oracle, mm -hmm. uh, which is a big old seven point A plus B combo card. Uh, it looks to get Thassa's Oracle in play after or in conjunction with exiling its entire library through Demonic Consultation or Tainted Pact. Uh, winning through the triggered ability of Thassa's Oracle. Okay. Um, but it plays more of a control role as well as it kind of builds up the pieces uh, as opposed to a more explosive deck like Storm might be. Okay. Um, Robin is playing a four-color deck with a Jeskai base mm -hmm. with a couple of green cards in there for good measure, um, Tarmogoyfs and whatnot, and is uh, a tempo deck. So Jeskai green is something that has a bunch of different interpretations, how big you want to go, how controlling you want to go. Robin's opting to go for a more slimmer, low-to-the-ground build, um, which can really come out the gates quickly, um, but also has enough longevity that if the game does go long and players, you know, hand attack, counter spells, all that, we get to the late game, it can still uh, crawl back in. All right. Yep. Now, some uh, folks in the chat there were asking if there are deck lists available. Not currently. The deck lists are not going to be available until after uh, round four begins because unlike the standard operating procedure of Magic Tournament's broadcast from the Loading Ready to Run Moonbase, which are... Uh, we, we like to say the stakes have never been lower. You know, the, the pre-pre-release is famously uh, competing at REL Axed. Uh, today is REL Comp. This is competitive rules enforcement. This is serious business. It's powerful magic. It's serious business. It's actual, um, uh, you know, it's, it's tournament rules. Deck list error, game loss. Yeah. Um, throwing cards at your opponent. <laughs> Probably game loss. Probably. That's yeah. up to the judges. We Our judges, uh, uh, our uh, co-head judges for the event today, Nelson Salahub, who will be on commentary later, and uh, John Millsup are going to be uh, in charge of all of that. They've been mm -hmm. doing uh, deck checks already. Yep. Uh, and, yeah, the stakes are, in fact, higher than ever. That's right. Yes, the winner today gets a, a custom trophy and a booster pack of Magic 30. Yes, a sealed booster pack of Magic 30, the anniversary fancy schmancy yeah. stuff. Uh, I believe all the players today are going to be receiving some manner of sleeves and whatnot from uh, Dragon Shield mm -hmm. and uh, some other packs courtesy of uh, some other sealed product courtesy of Loading Ready Run mm -hmm. as well. Uh, if Wheeler's playing, are, how is Wheeler also commentating? Well, Wheeler's doing commentary now, and then when Wheeler goes to play, Wheeler will not be doing commentary. Myself and Wheeler are on commentary today. We also have uh, Nelson Salahab, as I mentioned, on commentary. Alex Stacy will be on commentary later, and local Highlander player Trenton McIntyre will be joining me in the booth later today as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on how things go, we may have a three-person booth for the finals, or maybe Wheeler does very well. <laughs> you had to... To clarify as well, uh, I had I have no access to the deck lists for, say, my opponent next round or right. any of this information. I did, however, have the sole read on what everybody was playing. <laughs> <sighs> ah, feels good, and it will make it. It'll make my loss in the semifinals all that sweeter. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, unless you have anything else that you want to fill in before we begin, nope. let's head over to Studio C and uh, get round one underway. Great. All right, Thoracle. You you know I you know I love a good um, portmanteau. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Highlander has a, a series of powerful portmanteaus. It really does. Um, some of them more powerful than others. Yeah. Let's say Thoracle uh, hits that mark on both you know the actual playing of the deck as well as the uh, the fluidity of the name. So this is a deck where, in the early turns, Connor is likely going to spend time developing mana. We see a Triumph fetched here um, that really helps out, you know, a, kind has, of a clunky mana base. Has Robin not even looked at his opening seven? Is that what that, why they're laid out like that, or is that just how Robin likes to do it? Robin's a very good player. I don't think he would uh, just blind, blind keep, keep yeah. seven, although certainly not in the, semi, or the quarterfinals. Yeah. For the finals, though... <laughs> So both players, uh, you know, doing the Canadian Highlander thing, starting with some land fetching. Mm -hmm. So Robin Sorensen, the namesake of the, there's a there's a deck named after this uh, this player. Yes, uh, but it's not a, but it's not this deck, is it? Not this deck. No, no. there. I mean, the joke that I like to have uh, any time I have to retweet something involving Robin, you know, winning a local event is Robin quotations Sorensen 
quotations, Sorensen. Sorensen, of um, course. There was a mulligan named after the man, uh, which we no longer use, and there was, of course, the blue-green tempo deck that uh, I would recommend you no longer use right. uh, from a competitive standpoint. Um, but yeah, quite a prolific player here. Connor as well. I mean, I will happily smack talk Connor just because that's a thing that we do here in the Victoria community. Right. Um, but also viewers of previous years might be familiar with a uh, player playing Moons Over My Hammy. Um, a uh, blue-red, blue-moon deck, if you will. So Robin's... Got, or sorry, Connor has... Uh, Connor has kind of moved away from Blue Moon and is now settling into Thoracle as his baby. He was playing a uh, bug shell for quite some time. Now we're on four color. And uh, speaking of four color, we're seeing one of the green cards in Robin's deck uh, coming out. Territorial Kavu. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So what's this one do? So it's green and red for a star star. Power and toughness is equal to domain. Oh, this is from Modern Horizons 2. All right. Yeah. Yes. Oh, get ready to say that for a lot of these cards. <laughs> It's a 2 mana 4 4, which is pretty strong. Right. It also has an attack trigger that can uh, let Robin rummage or exile cards in graveyards. Right, Both of cool. them pretty reasonable. At the end of Robin's turn there, there's an Eladamri's Call f to search up. Well, I guess we're going to find out. <clears throat> search your library for a creature, reveal it, put it into your hand. If I had to take Shuffle. a guess. Uh, it's, oh, it's the Oracle. What a shock. I would go with Thassa's Oracle. All right. Um, this deck, the Oracle does have the potential to go off very quickly. Um, Connor can use the cheapest, or not the cheapest way to do this combo. Somebody's going to shove their glasses through their forehead if I say that. Right. Um, but if we're talking about Thassa's Oracle plus Demonic Consultation, that's three mana in total okay. to get this combo off. Right. That said, you typically don't want to ram face first into doing that. There are spots where, you know, cowardice is not an option and you want to go as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. But also, there are so many free spells available, especially with the consultation line. You open yourself up to mental misstep, so you just it adds on more. So do you figure Connor was searching for Oracle just to have it for when he wants it, or because he's planning on trying to win the game right now? Ah, okay. No. I, th I think he's setting up. And so that's, tr that's a transmute, correct? Correct, yeah. Demir Infiltrator, right, transmuting for... You want to guess this one again? So likely Tainted Pact. Okay. Uh, if we're talking about a, yeah, filling up the combo here. But even then, you know, Tainted Pact, there are, Thorkel gets a bad rap. Understandably, it's miserable. Right. Um, but you do need to, pressure against Thorkel can be huge because you need to always have in mind, like, do I have time to use hand attack? Mm -hmm. Do I have time? Like, am I willing to play into uh, mental misstep with the consult lines? Days if I tap out of my mana? There's mm -hmm. just a lot of factors. Oh, something we didn't mention at the top and a question that I just saw pop up in chat. It is, uh, at time of broadcast, pre-release weekend for yes. March of the Machine. Yes. What is the legality of March of the Machine cards in this tournament? Mom cards are legal in this event. Wow. Yes. So this might be... So the, we're potentially seeing lines of play that have yet to be seen even by these players. Yes. Potentially. Potentially. I'm not necessarily hyping it up as like it's going to be transformative, but you know, there's a chance that we'll see I'll, some new cards. I'll let you in on something. I am playing two mom cards, okay. uh, but since I am playing red deck wins, uh, they do damage. Oh, I see. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They attack. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. So, I'm sorry, you mentioned Territorial Kavu has an attack trigger. It looks like mm -hmm. that that happened. Connor's yes. down to 13 already. What what were the attack triggers So, again the attack on? triggers exile graveyards, which okay. can be relevant against certain lines that Thoracle can take uh, involving, like, Gifts Ungiven. And uh, we have a discard and draw card, which can help Robin sculpt his hand. Okay. This is an aggressive Thoracle from Connor, though. Interesting. Connor, uh, taking the line of asking his opponent how to do the combo that he's playing, um, decides to cast it, trigger on the stack, cast Tainted Pact. Um, the uh, Mana Leak here, countering the Tainted Pact and not uh, the Thassa's Oracle. Interesting. So Connor scries one to the top and one to the bottom off the Thassa's Oracle trigger, but does not get to just win the game on the spot. Correct. Tainted Pact. 
pretty aggressive Thoracle line from Connor here. Uh, Robin has a lot of open mana mm -hmm. uh, and decides to use a ooh, an unlimited signed uh, Lightning Bolt by Christopher Rush. <laughs> pretty nice. I have a beta one that's It doesn't that's do any more damage, so... but it feels like it should. No, it should. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also relevant for those watching live, um, unlike typical tournaments here uh, on this channel from this moon base, the players uh, cannot see the preview monitor, so there's no way for them to potentially catch wind of what might be in the opponent's hand. They also cannot read the chat, so feel free. You're, you know, your weapon's free to talk about whatever uh, whatever they might they might have going on. So it's interesting that Robin uh, appeared to go for a with the attack trigger on the Kavu because one of them is to exile a card in the graveyard to keep the Thassa's Oracle in the graveyard there. Yeah. And instead go for a rummage. Um, just by very slight glances into Robin's hand, he does have another counter spell in the okay. form of Memory Lapse. Um, and admittedly, the lines from the Thoracle deck that involve winning the game while your Thoracle's in the graveyard, and while Tainted Pact is in the graveyard, they're a bit more mana intensive, and okay. they're a little clunky right. at times. And Connor's down at nine yes. now, so you know he's, the 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 door is closing on how long he has to to set set that combo off. Now, Robin, <laughs> <laughs> what in what manner is that volcanic island sign? Uh, I believe that's a Brian Snotty signature, oh, uh, the wow, artist okay. of uh, the card. Apologies if I didn't get the name right. Um, Connor is familiar with Volcanic Island. I would wager that's the dual land he's most familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and while we do poke fun at the man, he knows what Volcanic Island does. I'll give him that. He's probably just reading this the signature. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually personalized. It says to Robin on mm -hmm. it. Oh, very very nice. We talked about the prizes at the top of the show. Yeah. And while all that's good, the the big one is of course uh, the trophy and the glory. Oh, the yeah no the bragging the, rights. The, the bragging equity is huge today. Yeah. Yeah. That is uh, a large part of this format. Speaking of a former large part of this format, Jace the Mind Sculptor. Still, still seeing play though. Yes, less than less than it was, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, but it's still a pretty reasonable magic card. I'm just so pleased that we've got currently, and it it could it it could go even higher. But I'm really pleased that we have 1,100 people tuning in on a Sunday to join us here for some powerful magic. Beautiful. Thank you all for being here. If the Canlander community is anything, it's first. Uh, it's first. Very attractive. <laughs> oh, I see. It's first. Uh, but also, uh, very passionate. Passionate community. Mm. If the Canlander community is anything, it's, uh, they're looking nice today. <laughs> so what do you think Robin's considering here? Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're on Connor's turn. Well, Robin tapping out for the Jace is interesting. Mm -hmm. Um because we knew there was a memory lapse. I wonder if there was another counter spell in his hand, a free counter, like a force of negation potentially, that uh, was tucked away. Um, because tapping out for a Jace, if you didn't, you didn't decide to exile the Thoracle, which is already a level of confidence that most players you know, look to gain at some point in their life. Uh -huh. um, and then you tapped out. So it's, it's, I can't imagine he's going shields down. But Connor only really has some sculpting to do. He's, he's on a short clock here. Yeah, at the end of Robin's turn, he's cast Latinam's Legacy to put something back into the library, and then he's drawing two cards at the beginning of... I believe this is Connor's main phase. The, oh, this is a main phase. Yeah. All right. My apologies. This is a classic Canlander card, probably the format where he gets the most love, um, as it lets you tuck in, say, a combo piece you would prefer to have in your deck, or just something where you don't need spot removal, you need you know, action. You can just tuck it back and, and get two free cards on your opponent's upkeep. Who are all those tiny blue men on the art of this card? Are they, are they like fancy sculptor bookends or are they alive? They seem like workshop assistants. I didn't expect a question on this that I would be stumped by, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I've, just, I've never seen the art for this card, so I'm very distracted. <laughs> I will say this, Connor going for uh, opting for the art on this card that is not commonly used. Mm. 
the I'm a, I'm a large scroll man myself. So Robin's just wastelanded Connor's triome. Yeah, so this cuts Connor off of uh, white mana, importantly. Ah, interesting. And, and opting to Fate Seal. Fate Sealing, put that right on the bottom. That was very quick. Connor did float mana, but I don't know that that's going to necessarily be relevant. It's just, you know, it's a thing magic players do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if there's no possible use for the mana. You always, you always float the mana in response, Gotta to, float the mana. in response to land destruction. Yep. There's no mana burn, might as well. Expressive iteration. Very nice, okay. Heck of a magic card. Yeah. I like Strixhaven a lot. There are a lot of Strixhaven cards that have grown on me. Mm. I will say that. And I think the, uh, the Canlander community in general. Weirdo of Oz in the chat asks if Canlander was a format during Mana Burn. I don't think so. Technically, yes. Technically, yes. Wow, yes. Man, I believe Mana Burn was phased out in M10, I want to say. Maybe great. tenth edition. Okay. Um, the first, the prototype of Canlander um, was played around two thousand and five, two thousand and to two thousand seven. So Robin's put Windswept Heath into Exile from Expressive Iteration to play this turn. And what did Connor cast there? Uh, Faithless or Faithful Mending, excuse me, using the white mana that was floating from the Rafine's uh, Tower okay. to so, draw two, uh, discard two. Well, I look like a fool now because he absolutely used that mana. <laughs> Commentator's Curse. Yeah. So that looked like Oracle being exiled. Correct. All right. So what does Connor do now? So Connor does have uh, two ways to go about here. He has Jace, Wielder of Mysteries, which has a de facto kind of Thorical text on it, where if he would draw cards and you know doesn't have them, he wins the game. Um, he also just has some pretty reasonable control and mid-range tools. Cards okay. like Uro, um, Titan of Nature's Wrath, Shouldred, the Apocalypse. But that's not what you want to do against Jeskai Green. Okay. Yeah. Question from chat. Do the opponents in the quarterfinals know who their opponents are going to be, a.k.a. could they metagame for the qualifying for the quarterfinal match or against the field in general? So for previous years, we have done pairings based on standing, where the mm -hmm. high standing actually gets to select who their opponent is oh, before decklists are locked. Considering that the people involved in getting this together, especially with all the stuff that happened throughout 2022, right. uh, were the top two seeds, <laughs> we decided to just go with random for this one. Right. So there's no... Real metagaming outside of trying to get a read on what the uh, people in the top eight are going to be playing. Okay. Uh, that's a Blood Chief's Thirst, I believe. Oh, yeah. It's doing a Fatal Push impression in the sense, trying to get rid of the Kavu, but uh, there's that Mental Mist up. That Kavu's not going down. Now, did Robin opt to not play the Heath last turn, or did he had he played a different so land he, already? So he played the Wasteland before doing the iteration. Oh, yes, okay. So <clears throat> just couldn't do that. Yeah. Excellent. Sometimes Express or Iteration is just anticipate, mm -hmm. and that's okay. That's part of the strength of the game. Yeah. All right, doing another Rummage off the Kavu trigger. Yep. And wheeling into the red zone with another, <clears throat> I'm sorry, four damage? Four, yeah. yeah. I don't think Robin is playing the spicy underground C <laughs> or Triome to unlock true domain. All right, so Connor down to three now. And this looks like a Jace Brainstorm. I believe we saw Fire Ice in there, uh, which can provide additional two damage, um, but can also... Keep Robin or keep Connor off of uh, a land for a turn. Basic forest for the turn. A very controversial inclusion in these uh, Just Guy Green variants. Just basic lands <clears throat> at all? Well, they they tend to play a good amount. The initiative has if if it's done any good in the format, it has caused players to play more basic lands. Okay. Um, but the basic forest itself is one where you, you know, do you want access to that in the face of Blood Moon or back to basics? Um, do you want that option with your own initiative cards? It's, uh, yeah, it's something you consider. Connor is wizard cycling. 
step through here to go looking for, I mean, what's, uh, what do you think he's looking for here? So it can't, uh, wizard cycling once the Thoracle is, is gone, uh -huh. uh, can find Snapcaster Mage, uh, which, there, is. there we are. Uh, Connor trying to shuffle cards into his deck upside down. <laughs> The there, door. Is a, there is a judge seated at the table, yep. <laughs> just so everyone knows. <laughs> is Snapcaster the only other wizard in the uh, in the deck? Some lists play um, cards like Vendillion Clique. Mm. Uh, the for those who may have missed it, Thassa's Oracle was exiled from the attack trigger on the territorial Kavu. So Oracle is no longer a route to victory. Jackal Girl asking, uh, the judge at the table currently is co-head judge John Milsip. Nelson Salahub is our other co-head judge, who will also be on commentary later. Basically everybody but the players has more than one job today. <laughs> Nelson's currently doing the card card reader. I'll be doing that myself later. Bear with me. We'll be seeing each match today. Yes, we will. We're going to be seeing all of the quarterfinal matches and the semi, both semis and, of course, the finals. So, so there's the fire ice you mentioned. Yep. Or fire and ice. I know that technically they're written down with just some slashes and they're not, don't have to be pronounced that way, but I like to do it the grammatical way. So fire and ice. What modes? Wait, are we seeing fire or ice here? I believe we're that's seeing a fire. A fire to the, fire to the face. Uh, that's uh, two damage, and that was all it took to take Connor down. So it looks like we're going to game two. Groovy. So, Connor took a pretty aggressive setup mm -hmm. without any uh, hand attack or counter spells up before the combo, mm -hmm. which is not an unreasonable avenue to take. It, oh, it was, I'm sorry, I missed it. It was in response, it was fire in response oh, fire. to a fetch land. Ooh, you love it. Yeah. You love to see it. Yeah. Um, however, if my Jeskai opponent develops a threat as large as Territorial Kavu, mm -hmm. and one as disruptive to my graveyard as Territorial Kavu, so that if my Thoracle is countered or my Tain Pack is countered, that they are able to then exile it entirely, I'm probably going to take a slightly slower line. Mm. But again, you can't sit around forever. Right. Robin's deck has the ability to get on the board quickly, hold up the counter magic, and uh, burn out the opponent, as we saw. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Were you also reading the comment that said these two men are the most Canadian-looking dudes I've ever seen? Yeah, I yeah. wasn't sure if I should read it out loud, but... We're here now. I think the tone of this is, you know, <laughs> the magic is serious, but yeah. ultimately... Everyone, what's more, what's everyone's more, here to have fun. What's more Canadian than a nice little light ribbing, you Yeah, know? exactly, yeah. <laughs> what is, uh, Weirdo of Oz asks, what's uh, Thoracle playing white for? So the I biggest... Mean, we, we did see the uh, Fateful Mending. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. not, not Fateful Mending. No, no. We did see the Fateful Mending. It was Fateful Mending. Good um, Eldamry's Call is the biggest one. The, big, uh, the yeah. biggest cards are going to be Eldamry's Call and Teferi Time Raveler. Right. So we way, saw Eldamry's Call that game, too. Yes. So a way to set up your combo and then a card that's pretty good when you are a sorcery speed combo mm. and your opponent can also only cast stuff at sorcery speed. But Connor's List does have some other tools, Prismatic Ending um, and Path to Exile Sword Supply Shares, so additional removal. Black removal can hit some of the pieces that you're a little worried about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fatal Push, Blood Chief's Thirst, but it's nice being able to scale up for some of the bigger things that um, other popular archetypes might present. Uh, also, Triumph of St. Catherine, a card from the Warhammer 40,000 uh, commander decks, mm. where it's a big life-linking creature. I'm okay. not, ex not excited to see that. <laughs> For those who are unfamiliar with the format, uh, we do have a video to explain it, which was linked in the uh, linked in the chat. Mm. Uh, there's a more recent version, actually, I think, with um, Serge and Wheeler explaining it. But uh, uh, there is no sideboarding. This is just how long it takes to shuffle hundred card decks. <laughs> yes, and I yeah. think they're resolving mulligans as well. But there are no sideboards in this format. So, I I truly believe that Canlander. Um, 
the time it takes between games as you shuffle up uh, in Canlander would take less time if if the darn community wasn't just so interesting and uh, nice to talk to. Because mm. you just see, you just want to talk to your opponent about that game. People are always you know happy to discuss, and that just adds seconds to the clock there. But we're taking a look at our sevens here. Connor's not sure about that. Showing his hand to the opponent of uh, <laughs> were there were there lands in that hand? There were. I don't believe they were the correct ones. Ah, I see. All right. Uh, Robin opting for a mulligan as well here. So both players going to six, we think, unless we've missed uh, one round of mulligans. Yeah, I believe they're just going to their six there. Um, for clarification on folks, not that might have uh, tuned into some older Canlander content, but not mm -hmm. necessarily newer ones. Um, Canadian Highlander uses the mulligan of, well, every format. We yeah. effectively try to be as close to something like, say, vintage mm -hmm. as possible. Um, in fact, sanctioned Canlander is just vintage. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, the... <laughs> the the agreement of the players of like well I'm not going to play Black Lotus and Ancestor Recall in the same deck. The Mothership Mulligan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Canlander used to have its own variety of entertaining mulligans. Yes, uh, we had the Sorensen Mulligan. Ah, uh, which is uh, he's got a deck list. He's got a deck archetype and a mulligan named after him. Yep. Wow. Um, which had the uh, the second six, so you would go seven six six five five four four etc. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but that proved to be a bit too broken. <laughs> it's really good. It's uh, why you ended up uh, seeing some decks with under thirty lands. Wow, because you just mulligan until you. You just play a combo deck with a low land count and. Uh, mm, fair enough. Yeah. So we are indeed playing the the London Mulligan today. Yes. Which, as a reminder, is just the mulligan that everyone. It's, that's the standard mulligan. The, the mulligan. Yeah. yeah. Draw seven every time and then just scry mm -hmm. away. Or not scry. Yeah, scry away the... Uh, or bottom. Bottom. Pardon cards, me. Not yeah. scry away. Bottom the however many cards yeah. for how many times you mulligan. We may be Canadian Highlander, but we do not use the Vancouver mulligan. No, which is a shame. I like that we had a, the mulligan named locally yeah. for a brief period of, what, like a year and a half there? And what a year and a half... I don't remember how long it how long it was. Uh, looks like Robin is going to five on this. Connor has selected the card to bottom. All right. <clears throat> Just guy is uh, the Just guy green and and other variants. I'm most of the time if I say Just guy. It's going to still apply to uh, Jeskai Green in this case. So, yeah, I gotta ask: is it be is it called Jeskai Green because it is primarily Jeskai with a little bit of green in it, or like what? Why that particular delineation rather than just calling it, you know, like four color tempo or, or something or like Spearmint that isn't necessarily descriptive? And <laughs> I definitely don't have a grudge. Yeah. Uh, Great, great question. A couple of things. One, there's precedence in okay. coverage in that uh, during cons block and cons BF said, mm -hmm. you would have decks uh, with this color scheme or similar color schemes being called Jeskai Black or Jeskai Green. Um, and two is because it is primarily a Jeskai shell. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually closer to just being a blue-red shell with some, uh, you know, some builds end up playing fewer white cards than, than others. Um, but mostly just guy yeah. with green. We're the, not, no, we're not calling it creamer. Thank we, you, We Jeff. will not call it creamer. Um, however, creamer is closer to being a rug deck with a little white in there. <laughs> it depends on how creamy you like your rug. I, I mean, I like to keep a creamy rug. All right. <laughs> Looks like Robin has settled on keeping a five here and just deciding which two to bottom, which yep. he's done. And uh, we're underway immediately. Connor in with a tap land. That looks like one of the triumphs, I think. Yeah, it's a goth triumph Thank for uh, salt eye mana here. And over to Robin immediately. So Robin's deck does have the the bulk of his points are going to ancestral recall. 
one blue. Oh draw, yes, three right. Cards. I was going to ask what the. I should have asked at the top what the points are in these decks. So Connor's deck has Thassa's Oracle for seven points. We used a total of ten points for folks at home. So that's most of the points. Most then, of Thassa's the points. Oracle. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Tainted Pact for one point and Gifts Ungiven for two. Okay. So for the for combo decks like that, it's pretty locked in. Right. right. You, you have some flexibility in tutors, but we've more or less figured out what's the best way to approach it. Um, Robin's deck has Ancestor Recall, which a lot of these blue control decks or blue tempo decks can anchor themselves to. Mm -hmm. Some variations do go out to uh, Triple Moxon. Excuse me, Triple Moxon or a couple of Moxon. But uh, Robin's points are Ancestor Recall, so a one mana draw three. Treasure Cruise, in air quotes, one mana draw three. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we are not on Dig Through Time. I just want to mention in the game that uh, Robin's first turn there was cracking a fetch line, getting Volcanic Island, and playing Dragon's Rage Channeler, which mm. we did see on the overlay briefly, and Connor took a, took a look at as well. Darcy is a heck of a card. Uh, Robin is also on True Name Nemesis. Oh, Ledger Shredder. Ooh. Shredding through every format. <laughs> I feel like Ledger Shredder connives a lot in Highlander. It does. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the 10th one is Mana Drain. And yeah, Mana Drain is the 10th uh, point for Robin there. Ooh. Really seeing the tempo part of the Jeskai Green tempo here. I love Electrostatic Infantry, but then I'm a limited player, so it was very fun in Dominaria United. Well, these decks play a lot of cheap spells. Mm hmm. A lot of one mana cantrips. Robin, after submitting his list, begrudgingly messaged me and said, "I forgot to include opt." <laughs> um, so one fewer can one fewer cantrip than most. Okay. There's the blood chief's thirst again, which we saw last game. Now last time it was met, met with a mental misstep, but mm -hmm. that doesn't look like it's going to be the case this time. Infantry down. And are we going to see that Ledger Shredder connive with a second spell from Connor this turn? No, we're going to combat. That's something that some players might uh, too eagerly play into. Mm. Um, but for a deck like Connor's, you also want the flexibility. When you know Robin is down on cards from the mulligan, um, you know, if you're deciding to make this a bit bigger, casting another cantrip or holding up, say, a mana leak or whatever, um, then it's just one point of damage. I mean, when's that ever mattered? Well, they're currently trading one point of damage back and forth between fetch lands and one power creatures, so 17 to 18 currently. <clears throat> no. Well, no play that turn from, mm -hmm. from Robin. While he's still missing green, importantly, Robin does have, you know, the anchor tri uh, trio of colors. He's got the jazz guy. Yes. Just not the green. Just not the green. <laughs> yeah. Baleful Strix. Mm -hmm. Love the <laughs> Baleful Strix. I think there are a few instances where there are bad Baleful Strixes. Really? Ooh. Oh, it's world champion winner Yuta Takahashi. Oh my god, <laughs> and we're seeing it right out the gates. Very so nasty. flashing that in in response to the Baleful Strix so that Robin also gets to draw a card because Connor will be drawing his second card for the turn off of the Strix. They're just explaining the interaction of this new card. Yep. Great to see it happen immediately. Mm -hmm. Just explaining the uh, interactions. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Figured we'd let everyone... Yeah hear that. Uh, well, welcome Raiders, by the way. Thank you, Brew, Brew Crew, for coming over from Surge's channel. Here for some powerful magic. We just, uh, we've just witnessed the Fairy Mastermind flash in in response to Baleful Strix. 
for uh, Robin to draw a card. Though it looks like, so is Connor pondering in response to the mastermind? No. no that's all resolved. Yeah, that's okay. all resolved. And this is just Connor, Connor looking to ponder. So the mastermind only ever cares about the second card yeah, drawn. So yeah, yeah. any beyond that is fine. So, um, but before the ponder resolves, the ledger shredder connives. Yep. And that's, I believe that's what's happening now. So yes. he's discarding logic knot. There you go. All right. Damn. Wreck. I don't know where I dredged that up. All right, so Ledger Shredder now a 2-4, and now Ponder's happening. Mm -hmm. Delve, not dredge, but... Delve, pardon. <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm just razzing. Oh, I got... Yes, I didn't yes. even... I, wow, yeah. you, you, you tricked me into thinking I had said the wrong thing there. That's a sign of a, a good commentary duo, don't <laughs> you agree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really goofed me there. <laughs> I definitely should have said I don't know where I dealt that from. That's good. I'll write that down for later. Can we take this again? Can we start again? This is all pre-recorded, of course. Yes. <laughs> Quick, use this one in the edit. While Robin does get a card off uh, the Fairy Mastermind with that Baleful Strix, you now have a, a bird that does a pretty good job disrupting the board. Well, mm -hmm. you have two birds that are pretty good at it. Baleful Strix can uh, obviously trade with the Mastermind and trade with the Dragon's Rage Chandler if it sticks around. But also just this Ledger Shredder is a 2-4, which is the biggest creature I've ever seen in my life. How do you a have two a 2-4 four. Four flyer? I know, it's ridiculous. So Robin now down to 16 mm -hmm. from the attack with a 2-power Ledger Shredder. And back to Robin. What land is that? Prismatic Vista. It is Prismatic Vista. Okay, and now hold on. What what just happened? He put a card on the battlefield and is also revealing a Renin Seven. So Robin is evoking Fury. Okay. Uh, which is going to be able to kill the Ledger Shredder here, um, exiling Renin Six. Renin Six. Pardon. Yeah. Me. Okay. The evoke on Fury, exile a red card from your hand. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it was just cards being thrown around, and I was <laughs> having trouble keeping track of which was which. This is a spot where if Connor, or sorry, if Robin wants to unlock green, uh, having that basic forest in your mana base is going to be helpful. Prismatic mm -hmm. Vista only finding basic lands, so finding that basic forest. So that's a, I mean, it was a, a two for one to, considering he's already on a mulligan to five, two for one just to take out Le Ledger Shredder. To, to me says Ledger Shredder's a big threat that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, it it says that this card is not dying unless I kill it now, right. effectively. Well, because then it gets out of range of Fury. It's just yeah. going to be so big. Yeah. Players also just actively discussing um, what's going on, just like why they took actions. Oh, -hoo -hoo! <laughs> he's so Connor's looking to reanimate Robin's fury. Yes, that seems scary. That's pretty. That's not great for Robin. No, if this resolves. But so. so Activating Fairy Mastermind, both players draw a card, and then because this is Connor's second card drawn for the turn, Robin is drawing a second card himself. Yes. Trying to trying to dig for presumably a Force of Will, which he, or he could have had him was missing a blue card. That's true. And then there's a Surveil Trigger for the Dragon Rage Channeler as well. But that's not to resolve, we're not resolving that ability yet because more responses from Connor, Mana Leak. Countering, I assume, the force of will, yes. Yeah. And it's, yeah, in response to um, the Darcy trigger here. Yeah. I do think Robin might actually have a daze in his hand as the last card, which is kind of funny. Not going to do anything because we have a breeding pool untapped here, but. So Mana Leak resolves. Dragon's Rage Channeler trigger still happens, so he still gets to surveil, but the reanimate on the uh, 
surveilling that basic island into the bin. The reanimate on the Fury is still resolving, though. Yeah, this is killer. Not to do a Guy Fieri impression. Yeah. But this is going to be uh, clearing up the board either way. We are not at Delirium yet, but even if we were, 3 plus 1 is 4. Yeah, Connor goes to 12 from the reanimating the Fury, but um, does that does clear both of Robin's creatures, so... Pretty good. And this kind of showcases when Thoracle can play a control game. I mean, in this case, Robin, of course, mulligan to five. Yeah. But that's not the end of the world in Highlander, and certainly not for a deck with Ancestor Recall. Mm -hmm. No plays, and passing back now. When Thoracle and similar archetypes like Flash Hulk and other kind of A plus B combo decks get into that control role, mm -hmm. um, they 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 don't do a bad job of playing the control deck. Mm. They just appear as though they are a control deck from 2017. <laughs> like they feel a little like they have been out modified by the uh, you know the meta game and new cards printing and all that. Comment from chat reminding us of the fun fact that, of course, Yuta Takahashi wanted Fairy Mastermind to be a 1-3, not a 2-1. Specifically, this was this was not mentioned in the reminder from chat, specifically because it 1-3 would block Raghavan yeah. and Snapcaster. Can't have that. Nope. Can't have that. That would be too good. Also, 1-3 still would have died, along with Dragon's yeah. Rage Channeler to Fury. No, Latinam's legacy again. Is this another main phase, Latinam's Legacy? Mm -hmm. All right, so Connor's going to draw two cards at the beginning of Robin's upkeep. Typically, that's when you're looking to. I mean, you can end a turn Latinam's, that's fine. But in a spot like this, doing it on the main phase is going to set you as what is now functionally the control deck in the match up with just more cards to be able to mm -hmm. react to what your opponent's doing. Right. <laughs> While this does gate you on your own mana... Um, Robin's in a tough enough spot that this is, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine. <clears throat> so what do you think Robin's looking to, to draw here to get out of this spot at six? I would say uh, Ancestral Recall mm -hmm. or Treasure Cruise. Oh, are those are the cards good? One. They're okay. <laughs> um, if Robin does have some removal and a turn, then there's a way that he can, you know, crawl crawl back, being a little uh, reductive. But yeah. looks like that was not to be the case. <laughs> no. All right. Well, then we get a game three in our first round. Exciting. Yeah. We're here for the powerful magic, and we get to see as much of it as possible. <laughs> Connor holding up uh, a life pad, uh, <laughs> saying, who needs combo, as that has been the conversation between the two players over the past minute or so. Yeah. The, the combo deck just winning by attacking the f life points directly. You know, hey, that's still a valid way to win a game of magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reanimating <coughs> Fury was... That was uh, that was a good that was a that was a strong play a spicy meatball yeah for sure if I remember from what we were able to observe watching the Mulligans that uh, that reanimate was in there uh, in his opening hand mm -hmm. just biding its time waiting for the right target yep and evoked fury yeah the Thoracle deck is going to play reanimate and unearth another one mana reanimation spell. Mm -hmm. A bit more gated by what it can actually bring back, just three or less, mm -hmm. uh, as part of its Gifts Ungiven package. So uh, the deck has a uh, Gifts pile, as they say, which basically just says, still you lose, um, <laughs> where any combination of the cards you give are still going to result in a Thassa's Oracle winning the game if it goes undisrupted. Right. Um, some require a bit more mana than others. Some are a little reliant on you having at least two life points, but, you know. Mm -hmm. 
game? So <laughs> remind me again uh, what the uh, point spread Ooh. in Robin Sorensen's list are, because we were talking about it sort of <laughs> during the game. Connor's basically got Oracle, Tainted Pact, and then Gifts Ungiven. Gifts Ungiven. Uh, Robin has Ancestor Recall, mm -hmm. Treasure Cruise, Mana Drain, and True Name Nemesis. Okay. So for lists like this in the tempo uh, and the Jeskai variety, they, if you go to the Recall plus three, as we say, right. um, you are basically always playing Ancestor Recall and Treasure Cruise because they're just very good. They're very cheap. You're a deck that plays a lot of cheap spells, and you're a deck that plays a lot of pitch spells, so you might get cards in your graveyard quite quickly. Um, and you want to recover. And then you get some flexibility in, am I playing True Name? Am I playing Mana Drain? Uh, am I playing Umezawa's Jite, Dig Through Time? Um, Jite and Dig are a bit too... Jite is a bit too board-based and it costs two points, mm. so you, know, you might not want that. Uh, and Dig Through Time is often... It's just more of a control card. You know. <clears throat> How long do you think, on average, it takes to shuffle a hundred card deck? Forever. Forever. <laughs> uh, volunteers, Nelson. I. <laughs> I have very large hands, yeah. mm. and I shuffle very thoroughly. Mm. <laughs> And I would still say that between games... I also have and do both of those things, but it's no less irritating. Yes, yeah. It, um, it takes practice yeah. to get to it. Because obviously you want to be able to randomize your deck in, uh, efficiently, yeah. but you also want to be able to do it at a reasonable pace. Mm -hmm. This is why we have a North 100 Showdown bingo sheet where one of the, I believe it's even the free space, uh, that <laughs> is both players, both shuffling, players at shuffling at the same time. Yeah. So you'll see players that say, you know, uh, they're going to fetch and just just go at it. Just use that moment for everybody's like, okay, we're just doing this. Yeah, Get both nice players way. fetch the first thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mitra's Bobble in chat says, I totally forgot this event had started. I wanted to catch the entire thing. Well, good news. This is only round one. We have... We're, not only have you not missed all of the first round, because we're going into a game three, but there are uh, six more rounds to come to come your way. Some of them best of three, some of them best of five. So we have a, a long day of magic ahead of us. Impulsive Tempo says, I'm not even Canadian and I enjoy this format. Good news. That part's not a requirement. You can play Canadian Highlander anywhere. Now, why is it Canadian Highlander? Do, are there other two predominant, distinct communities of people around the world that play Highlander? There are communities that have their own Highlander variants. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, Australian Highlander, different 60 card, plays with sideboards, still uses a point list. Uh, and then there is European Highlander or uh, German Lander, although, I mean, even I gotta say, I prefer to call it European Highlander, especially when the last time I checked, a lot of Finnish players were, uh, well, they were taking those trophies, if you know what I mean. Um, and then there are, you know, you'll have uh, some other people. Those being are the two like, primary. Those are the big the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like a gray ogre. But Canadian Highlander, because it uh, started here yeah. in Victoria, British Columbia. The points are not the same, and the band list uh, are it's it's not the same. Yeah, all different. All with well, there's no nuances. there's no actual band list for Canadian Highlander, correct? It's only the points. Uh, yes. Yeah. No band. Well, we share the vintage band list. Okay. Which means uh, anti -cards. conspiracies, anti cards, right. dexterity cards, cards that have been removed from the game yeah. due to um, cultural, or racial insensitivities. Right. Um, Cards that I personally don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that for those keeping score at home, that was a, one of Wheeler's hilarious jokes. <laughs> but as a member of the council, I um, every you know every time I try to pitch, hey, do we really need collector roof in this format? I mean, come on. <laughs> hey, if someone wants to get into Canadian Highlander, where would be a good place for them to to 
internet their way on over to? Oh boy, do I have things to list off. So there's CanadianHighlander.ca. Okay. That's the official website, has all the information there. There's a Canadian Highlander Discord that you can get to, presumably from that website. Uh, of, course, of course at uh, LRRMTG on YouTube. Um, there is information on the format, of how to play the format. There's a more updated one than the one in the command going around there um, that yeah, Serge and I recently recorded. I'm trying to get that command updated. I say recent as I realized we recorded it a year ago, eh, but well, still, it's what about is, the same. What is time? That's a great question. Um, North 100 Showdown, North 100, Friday Night Paper Fight. Mm -hmm. Bunch of resources. There are some articles that have gone up on the official Wizards of the Coast website about the format as well. Uh, we also have uh, we have an inside man at Wizards of the Coast. We have a couple. Of, we have inside people at Wizards of the Coast. Frankly, it's uh, what, are they, what are they talking about? They're talking about Thought Lash. Thought Lash is a card from Alliances. It's an enchantment with cumulative upkeep, and you uh, have to exile a card from the top of your deck to pay that. But it also has an activated ability of exile the top card of your deck, prevent the next one damage you would take this turn. It's a card that can set up with Thassa's Oracle. I wish there was a camera on your face right now. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, with with respect, mm -hmm. why they're talking about Thought Lash right now. I believe Connor is mentioning other options for exiling cards from the top of your deck to set up Thassa's Oracle. Um, there is another local player that plays uh, a five color lands Thassa's Oracle combo that if you look at it, Really? You may go well, into cardiac arrest. It is, it is wild. But just, it is also the most winningest archetype of 2023, with that player putting up two Ws so far for the uh, this year's season. I think one of my favorite thing about the things about the, Highland, the local Highlander community is, you know, when's a good time to do metagame theory crafting? I know, between games two and three of the top eight of the championships yeah. with your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> Which I put at the bottom from the multiplied. Uh, what are we at on the state of Mulligans? That was Robin mentioning last game's multi five. Looks like he's keeping a hand. Well, maybe Connor actually mulled to five here. Did they? Did bo maybe play both players must have mulliganed to five? Uh, yeah, it looks as though both players mulled to five. Oh, wow. Okay. Is that, is that accurate, Paul? Sorry. I know that the viewers can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like Robin might have kept seven and Connor's on a five. Oh, so we must have caught the shuffle uh, okay. from Robin initially and uh, assumed that that was the mulligan. That's a basic island, Connor. I think he's looking at the specific edition. <laughs> and what is that? Uh, steam vents. Oh from wow! Infinity. That is a fancy looking steam vents. I do like the spacex. I mean, there's not a basic land, but the space lands. I like the space lands. <laughs> Electrostatic infantry died very quickly in game two. Maybe it'll get to do a little bit more this game with Connor on the mulligan. It's not too common to see uh, in a match both players take fives. Although, uh -huh. that said, again, a lot of these decks can mulligan quite well. Some might have to mulligan based on the matchup, you know, to get your pieces. Um, Robin preordaining there puts a counter on the electrostatic infantry. Scrying two, one up, one down, he says, and drawing a card. Looked like he bottomed a sprite dragon. Doesn't need redundancy on the threats, I'm guessing. All right, and in, in for two. Notably, Robin took two off the shock land there to have it enter untapped. So, I mean, anything's on the table at this point. It's Highlander.
Kind of playing a mana confluence. That's not exactly the land you want to... Oh, into a Grim Tutor. So this is a painful turn. Oh boy. Yeah. So paid one for the... Oh. Paid one mana... Sorry, paid one life for the mana confluence to mm -hmm. cast Grim Tutor. Uh, that was met with a spell pierce. Mm -hmm. So it didn't end up hurting Connor in the life points, but it did end up hurting the game plan. Another counter on the infantry, and now another counter from an Ancestral Recall. Which, as we established uh, in the commentary for last game, is a good card. It's a very good magic card. I'd oh. recommend playing it. It doesn't get old playing it. Um, <laughs> Robin did miss a land drop last turn, and I don't think I... Maybe... Oh, okay, so one of them was a land there on that Ancestor Recall. So this is a bit of a tricky spot if we're Connor. Um, yeah, this feels... Yeah. Feels bad. It feels, feels bad for Connor <laughs> it here. feels yeah. bad. You have developed a threat that scales as you play a match of Magic the Gathering. Yeah. And the cards that you have played throughout this match of Magic the Gathering include... Ancestor Recall mm. and Spell Pierce, the one mana invalidate Connor's entire turn while also still taking damage from mana confluence. Yeah. So Windswept Heath for uh, dual land there. And infantry is up at four power now. So I assume that'll be into the red zone. Yep. Taking Connor down to 13. And passing it back. So how can Thoracle get out of this? I, I mean, <laughs> removal, obviously, but like, you know, Robin's got two two mana up, he's got a bunch more cards. So one of the issues that Robin could run into mm -hmm. is that his deck does have a lot of cheap removal, right. creature removal, which is effectively bricked um, by what Connor has. Connor also just can go to try and combo as quickly as possible, recognizing like, look, I can't beat counter magic, so I just have to hope that you don't have it. Um, so that's is, is, that's another whole turn being eliminated from Connor being able to do anything as uh, Robin ca casts lose focus mm -hmm. to counter solve the equation. Another card from Modern Horizons too. Yeah, another card from Strixhaven on the other side. So that's just. Again, that's two, two complete turn cycles that, of Connors that Robin has just fully eliminated from being able to do anything. This is one of the weaknesses of A plus B. We're also seeing Robin actually has a Stifle on top of there. Stifle is a, a really great card against Thoracle, right. as it's a one mana uh, card that can force your opponent to commit to their combo, mm. and then you Stifle the Thoracle trigger, which leaves them without a library, which mm -hmm. is pretty hot. Um, I do appreciate the flavor value of casting lose focus in response to solving the equation. Yeah. You're trying to do your homework and you just get distracted. Um, sorry, ponder, and then you mentioned probably drawing that, presumably drawing that stifle. Yeah, looks like he kept stifle on top and maybe a fetch land to get rid of one of the uh, the third card, which is a pyrokinesis, a effectively dead card in this spot. So in for six, and now we have a Tarmogoyf. We can listen to how they're... <coughs> I believe that's a 3-4 right there. Instant sorcery land. Yeah, that seems like the extent of card types. So yeah, that one of the issues with the Thoracle decks and the other A plus B is that if they they really hate Spell Pierce early on. Right. Because the way that they develop their uh, combo is less about density and more about resolving some of these clunkier tutors. Mm. And because their points are... Uh, filled with what they need to combo, they don't get to play Demonic Tutor or Mystical Tutor. Gifts Ungiven, sure, um, but that's a four mana spell, even if it's an instant speed. Hallowed Fountain paying the life from Connor, mm -hmm. going to four. Thought Seize. This is a Doritos bold move. I believe Connor is uh, Connor going trolling. To, going to two, you think yeah, so? Eight, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there we go. There's there's uh, game one of the top eight going to Robin Sorensen in three over Connor Hayward. Jeskai Green Tempo takes down Thoracle. Ding dong. The witch is dead. That is the <laughs> scariest. The witch, of course, being uh, the ham sandwich, uh, uh, loving a nickname for Connor Hayward. Uh, I see. Locally. Yes. Gotcha. Um, also... 
Thoracle was probably the scariest art deck in you the think top so? eight. I, it's one of them. It's it's definitely something that is on the mind of everybody. It's like a um, almost a stress test of whether or not your deck can uh, compete. All right. Is what do you do if you're against a Thoracle opponent? So is uh, this single elimination? Asks the chat. Yes, it is. In fact, if we can take a look at the bracket, uh, whenever we have an opportunity to. So there we are. Robin Sorensen defeats Connor Hayward in the first round. And uh, coming up after a quick break, we'll have round two with uh, yourself, Benjamin Wheeler. Who, me? Uh, versus Sasha Christensen on Omniciative. Looking forward to that. So, yeah, uh, round two is also going to feature Nelson and Alex in here on commentary. Um, but uh, we'll both be back later in the, later in the day for more commentary. Uh, but yeah, we're going to take a quick break while we swap out the players and everything, and we'll be right back with more coverage of the 2022 Can Lander Championships. Don't go away. Welcome back to the top eight playoff of the 2022 Canadian Highlander season at Yellow Jacket Comics, brought to you by us, Loading Ready Run, and Yellow Jacket Comics. Um, that's a long name for this tournament, but it's an exciting uh, set of matches. We already saw um, Connor Hayward against Robin Sorensen in the first round. My name's Nelson, joined with by Alex Stacy here. You're familiar with us, of How course. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you having a good day? You, you pumped to see oh, some powerful yeah, just magic? Started it. I'm stoked. This is this is the most powerful magic that you can see. Yeah, we are uh, we are summoning the best monsters and firing off all of the cards that aren't allowed in the other formats. It's true. We want to, to, we want to have the power. What is Highlander if not a sort of curated uh, Magic Greatest Hits yeah, collection? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's the strength of the format. Only the top tracks. Yeah, we were having a dance party with all of our favorite Magic cards and we've only got 15 minutes. <laughs> We have a hundred minutes. Oh, we have a hundred minutes, but still, that's only time for like fifteen or eighteen songs. You yeah, know? No, they're they're really good. Just songs, your though. favorite, just your favorite bops that you can think of right now. That's all that you really all get. All hits, no misses. No misses. Okay, so speaking of not missing, um, we're gonna not miss one of these players after this round, hopefully, because we'll be so happy to see the other player. Just kidding, we're not taking a side either way. But speaking of hits. We've got two fantastic deck lists. Benjamin Wheeler is playing Red Deck Wins. Have you ever heard of this archetype before? I've never heard of Red Deck Wins. No. I I, what does it do, Nelson? It's a different one from every other format <laughs> where you might have seen a similar list, right? Instead of uh, attacking with Goblin Guide, they, you know, they just go for a tally. They're just ramping up. What? Yeah, they just want to play like Malignus in Canadian <laughs> Highlander. We just cast a lot of rituals, right? We've got, we've got mana acceleration. We're just from here too. Oh yeah, all jokes aside, um, Red Deck Wins is a, uh, a deck that's good in every single format, I think. Yeah. And Highlander is no exception. Um, Absolutely. So Benjamin's going to be piloting, um, you know, a set of cards, most of which are going to look really familiar to you. I know that he, he did mention he's playing two mom cards. So I don't actually even know which those are yet. I so, know one of them. Okay, great. And I don't remember the name of it, but it's the, um, uh, it's the Trample Prowess uh, Bear. Okay. It flips. Yep. That's going to be exciting. That card seems kind of bananas, yeah. particularly in this deck. So hopefully we get to see some of these new mom cards here. Mm -hmm. um, but if not, you know, expect to see fast creatures and lightning bolts out of Wheeler. Kenra Spellspear, I think. Is Kenra Spellspear. Yeah, that one does look exciting, actually. That's, I remember that one now. That's, uh, that's going to be a drubbin, I think. Mm. Wheeler has an interesting history with red decks in Canadian Highlander, actually. He? He's, he's the uh, creator of the medium red archetype. Oh, okay. So that's, that's his joint. I believe so. Yeah, I mean, there might have been a, a cadre of people, but he's the one. Well, because like there was Big on. Red before that. Yeah, so Big Red actually, and we have another pilot uh, in the top eight. We're going to see later today, Matthew Greer, who's put a lot of reps in Big Red over the course of his career. Um, but Wheeler's deck should look fairly familiar. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the table, we're going to see Sasha Christensen piloting what he calls Omnitiative. Omnitiative. Now, is that going to be playing Omniscience? No, not named for Omniscience. Just Omniscience. Just named for Omnath. So this is a deck that features a lot of powerful enter the battlefield effects, and I don't think we see an ephemerate, but it is, um, it is full of great cards that give you the initiative and pretty straightforward control elements be beyond that. I've so I've heard the, that the initiative is very strong. Yeah, but I think we'll see that uh, Sasha will kind of be the control, looking to stabilize in this match, and Wheeler will be the more aggressive player. And sounds like they're ready for us now. So let's take a look 
at Sasha Christensen versus Benjamin Wheeler. All right, shuffled up and oh, would you look at that at the bottom of the screen? Is that an attractions pile? It looks like Sasha's deck includes ways to get attractions. I know he's playing Com Comet, I believe, Stellar Pup, and possibly even another card from Infinity, uh, not with a acorn border. Also, Sasha won the die roll here, mm -hmm. playing a, a fetch land and then passing. A nice beta mountain coming out on the left here. Among the, uh, among the die rolls that Sasha has won this year, this one might be his favorite. Getting to have the first turn of the game against the Red Deck Wins archetype, always, always a little piece of good news there. And we've got and it's, the robot. Yeah, Bowmat Courier on Wheeler's first turn here. Looks like um, some sm slight alterations done there. Is that is that your work there at the bottom of that Bowmat career, Alex? Do you know, no, uh, that you know where like those a signature might be? The uh, Craig, is it Spearing? Yeah, it looks like a signature, Craig signature potentially. Signature okay, bottom. or just might be some fanciful additions that uh, Wheeler or someone else has done to that Bowmat career. This has been a classic in a lot of uh, aggressive red decks and some um, two color decks. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Bowmat Courier. It's, I mean, it just like it thumps your opponent and then it just refills your hand. It's real good. Looks like Sasha fetching uh, before his turn there to get a, a tapped Rogrin Triome. That'll fix uh, most of the colors that Sasha's deck needs. Do you think he's going to have to worry about a lot of non basic hate from Ben here? I do believe Ben is jamming Price of Progress oh, yeah. and quite a few mountains. So that's one that Sasha's definitely going to have to watch out for with its four-color mana base. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time, there was a period of time, I don't know if you, did you play back then? Price of Progress was on the points list it for a little was. while. Just because Red Deck wins tends to be like, in, in a bunch of you know weird sort of casual formats I've played, this one included. It wins a lot. Yeah, it tends to be like one of the best decks when you, when you try to play a tournament format with, with strange rules, mm -hmm. um, which Canadian Hounder certainly you know counts as one. Here mm. comes the Swift Spear. More hasty one drops from Wheeler. Okay, still just two points of damage though. Yeah, vroom vroom, filling up that... Uh, well, we see the fury Career. in Sasha's hand, so there's an interesting sort of tension Ooh, here yeah, between a... the Monastery Swift Spear prowess and yeah, the will fury he or won't he? damage. Because he, yeah, he's going to want to cast um, or ev evoke rather the uh, fury in response to the prowess trigger. Yeah, I think uh, from Sasha's point of view here, if we can get a clean two for two against the Courier and the, uh, the Swift Spear for Fury plus another card. He'll probably make that choice, but it looks like Sasha's hand hasn't yet provided a red card to Exile to pay the Evoke. Oh dear, that's, that's tricky. Yeah, no, we're not going to see the Fury immediately. It doesn't have Flash, that's right. We're not, we're, not, we're not seeing that this turn, but... The big fish, still might true be name Nemesis. Hmm, yes. Now this is part of Sasha's point spread, true name Nemesis, uh, on the points list since... I want to say maybe it was six months after the first printing of Commander that, Cards, that popped in. Cards was very good. It wasn't too long after True Name was printed. Naming that we protection from jumped on the Benjamin list Wheeler here. Yeah, that's a good call. So Ben's going to have a really tough time attacking through this. This is essentially one of the best walls in the entire game when you're a Red Deck Wins player. I know Ben's playing some flying creatures. Cemetery Gatekeeper now from Wheeler. It's just uh, oh, wow. choosing hey, it's land. Got... Okay. A non-haste creature. So this is a way to get th through some extra damage. Uh, you know, a bit of reach, as we say, ways to deal damage directly uh, to your opponent, and it's also a first striking two one. So maybe the first strike will matter. Not right now on this board, though. Of course. Exiling um, the fetch land to punish uh, later land drops seems like it could be pretty backbreaking. That's right. Cemetery gatekeeper doing their best possible Zozu impersonation here, or. Uh, is that's that Dingus Egg, if you, anyone no, else who played way back in the day? I mean, it's less expensive than... Right. And we got a Dragon's Ray chan Channeler. I mean, he's got a lot of critters on the board. Adding two more creatures to the board on Ben's turn three here is going to provide a way to get through this uh, True Name Nemesis just by going super wide. Mm. Takes out the Courier. All right, we don't get those extra cards from Bomat Courier. We never get to find out what those are, although if Ben uh, tries his hardest here. He could potentially flick through his library to determine what they were, uh, but players do have to play at a reasonable time, so probably won't seem to do yeah. too much of that. Just finding a mountain. That's a tricky call, I guess, on the um, the path, because he's choosing to, to rob uh, Ben of 
later carrot advantage rather than uh, dealing with the um, cemetery. Yeah, absolutely. The cemetery gatekeeper, I think, did connect for two points this turn on Sasha. Mm -hmm. But Sasha might be thinking that, you know, four or five lands, that might be all I need. Yeah. And uh, the cards underneath Bone My Career could have been, you know, Stoke the Flames or Lightning Bolt. Because, so. like, all his, um, all his relevant initiative cards are four CMC. Right. So, it, so, so we're there now, I guess, is the... The move for Sasha. Oh, a figure of destiny. Oh, I, I'm so happy seeing this guy still get work. Me too. I'm also really. It's I'm the, stoked that figure still has a job. The original level up creature, and still like the best one because it, you know, it's it's instant speed. I I got a chance to look at Wheeler's list before the tournament started, and oh, yeah? the other red one drop that I really like, that still has a job, still gets work, as you say, is Stromkirk Noble. That's one Dang. I always I always favored um, when yeah, I play I mean, deck wins I, on Monday. I suppose protection from humans just keeps getting better. Yeah, just and and just having a slith, a one mana grow creature. You know, mm -hmm. if you can if you can clear the board with your burn spells, your strong quick noble can sometimes play the role of an electrostatic infantry like we saw in I in feel like one. there's a snowball's chance in hell joke to be made here. Mm. Red oh. and six comes down here. Where you maybe maybe see a plus one or a minus one from Ren and no activation from the figure of destiny? Is there a chance that happens? Maybe. Um, Gatekeeper continuing to put some work in here. Yeah. So like Ren and Six is going to get Sasha some lands back, but he's going to have to really pay for it. That's going to be a lightning bolt to the face every time he plays a fetch. That's right. I think we're just checking on life totals to make sure everything's correct here. Okay, figure of destiny now, a 2-2. Two, two. So just ran six, extra land drop, take some damage from Cemetery Gatekeeper, pass back. And this true name, I think it's starting to look like, you know, Sasha has to do the math here on how much damage true name can possibly prevent. You know, the current flunge, it looks like we're, we could hold down the figure if we want, and then we take at least More four. More one yeah. drops. Mm, yep. The games in, in the Red Tech wins where you draw all the creatures can be kind of funny because usually you want some mix of the burn spells to go upstairs. Yeah. But, but if your opponent's enemy mass removal, you know, just turn them sideways. That can be good enough. Yeah, this is a this is a really scary board state to look at because um, Highlander players have been playing fewer sweepers these days. Am I correct in that assumption? Yes, absolutely. As as time has gone on, control decks and just decks in general have played fewer mass removal cards. We used to see blue-white decks playing several Wrath of God or more expensive ways mm -hmm. to sweep the board being viable and good, but as creatures have just gotten better and as players and deck builders have understood that with that's lose focus now on the stack, looks like targeting... Nope, we're just... Okay, yeah, we're paying... Paying Lose Focus plus Replicate to counter Rakdos Crackler. Uh, as, as people include more Moxes and aim to end games sooner, mm -hmm. the Wrath God effects have been the worst. Lose Focus, a pretty good counter spell from uh, Modern Horizons 2, was yeah, it? Yeah, we've, we've seen Lose Focus in a couple of lists now. Modern Horizons 2, a uh, great set for Canadian Highlander. And yeah, it's nice to have what I think is like generally accepted as a a solid upgrade for miscalculation. Miscalculation used to be a pretty common mm -hmm. include in these lists, but lose focus gives yeah, a little like more value. That's... Oh, here comes the hard cast on Fury. We also last turn just saw the figure of destiny go up to four four, and then no attacks from Wheeler. Everyone Good except gravy. figure. Yikes. Okay, so that wooded foothills will stay exiled. Cemetery gatekeeper done dealing damage. Oh, blammo. And then, yeah, that DRC, not quite delirium yet, so it was able to get taken down along with the Monster of Spirit. Huge fury for, for Sasha. Massive play there. Why play Rats when you can just play Fury, I guess? Absolutely. This card stomps, by the way. It's yeah. really, really Another good. Another Modern Horizons 2 staple of the format now, really. Okay, we see Bloodstained Myers. Uh, from Wheeler, and then a pass, and then uh, Sasha just cracking his own both same Meyer at the end of the turn. So he might have a breath of uh, air at this point, but at nine, at nine life points is not a lot to be sitting at against Red Deck. 
Yeah, so if Wheeler does have an instant that he's drawn at all this game and can take Sasha down even one more life point here mm -hmm. and then untap, play his sixth land and attack for eight in the sky with Figure of Destiny, that's certainly a route, you know, home here. Figure's Count. top mode that gains flying? Yes. Good gravy. Yeah. To the skies. Also, um, uh, price of progress is... Uh, Pretty harsh. Yeah, Ooh, it's gonna, aggressive. It's gonna, now I think now if you're thinking what the line that I just described from Sasha, mm -hmm. then it seems like this attack kind of makes sense, right? If the, if the figure wants to trade with Fury, that's good news. Deathrite oh. Shaman, and then five mana four. Okay. Uh, Triumph of Saint Catherine. This is a five five life link for five. That's scary. Right. So Sasha says. I I see that you could kill me with this figure of destiny, and instead of trying to leave up any mana and try to be tricky, I'm going to say I hope you don't draw your sixth land, and if you do, I lose. That's all assuming that Wheeler also has a bolt or something right here. Well, let's see. Otherwise, it's going to be a really awkward get you to one. Fetches. I think we're going to see this game end in the next turn cycle one way or the other. I definitely think so. You were mentioning that Sasha didn't have a lot of life points to play with, but since Wheeler didn't want to block the figure of Des or block the Fury on the figure of Destiny, um, Wheeler's dropped down to 9 himself and now 8 from the fetch. Mm -hmm. Live by the burn spell and die by the burn spell. Yep. It would seem. A candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. See what that draw step gave him. Flat Luigi in chat asking, who's Catherine? This is a card from the Warhammer 40,000 uh, Universes Beyond Commander decks. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a Bane Slayer, but um, it has an interesting uh, little twist to it um, in that you can cast it for Miracle. And when it dies, uh, you, you sort of put it back on the top of your library. Somewhere in the top. Somewhere. Yeah. It gets, it gets to go back in the top seven of your library where you'll have another chance to miracle it. Now, you can respond to this trigger by exiling it with, like, a scavenging use. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, tr it's a trigger, not a replacement effect. Yeah, that ooze gets a lot Okay, so of play. no spell from Wheeler on Sasha's turn. Yikes. So he doesn't currently have lethal, even if he were to upgrade the figure one more time. There are a lot of... Okay... Hardcast Rift Bolt. Targeting Target Fury. Fury. Interesting. That is interesting. Looks like Wheeler's decided he's the control after all. Grim Lavamancer. Huh. This is not a spot I would like to be for Wheeler. No, that's not so good. Yeah, we don't um, have the advantage muffin overlay right now, but uh, I think it's, you know, two blueberries on the side of Sasha right here. Grim Lavamancer and uh, Deathrite Shaman, uh, enemies to the end. <laughs> now, Sasha does not have any... Does he have black mana? Sorry, what's that land underneath that volcanic island? I think okay. I think Sasha doesn't Bye, really... Bye, Lavamancer. Ren and Six nugs him. Okay, Ren and Six taking out Lavamancer. He, ouchie, Bob. 5-5 five, five, tagging into a 4-4. Four, four. Yep. There goes the figure... And so, Sasha bounces back to 14 life points. That's yeah, that triumph of St. Catherine doing some really triumphant work here. Hello, Raiders. Welcome. If you're just tuning in, this is the top eight final of the 2022 Yellow Jacket Canadian Highlander season. So the players earned their That's way into this tournament through their play on Monday night tournaments in, in uh, 22. And uh, took a little bit longer than... Than most years to schedule and organize this tournament uh, for several reasons. Um, if you're curious, look outside. It's those reasons. Mm -hmm. But here we are in April playing this uh, top eight championship. You know what Red Deck hates? Life game. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of ponderance after the match. Yeah, players trying to decide what to do when. Sort of like notes. Yeah. I don't know if you ever did theater, but there's always like notes after a performance. And then it got to a point where it's like, well, I have to beat this tree name on the board somehow. And like, got to go wide. Yeah. Yeah, player, uh, Wheeler there just expressing his desperation at the end of that game. 
Yeah, it looked pretty good when he uh, managed to get that wide, but uh, Fury, I think, basically one stash of that game. Getting to go, like, three for one. Fury Almost, like, better than three for one, because, like, it blows yeah. them all up, and he keeps the permanent. And then that permanent ended up trading with a removal spell for another as well. After that card's pushed. Damage. Yeah, so one of the... One of the great enter the battlefield effect cards that Sasha's playing, it's sort of mm -hmm. theme of his deck a little bit. <laughs> yeah, true name just as good on defense as it is in, on offense. It's, uh, I mean, better than a brick wall. Anything that runs into it mm -hmm. is likely to be killed. <laughs> Sasha's points beyond true name, I believe, all go into moxes. Yeah, we saw a red mox there at the end, arriving a little late to the party. So the 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 idea for Sasha's deck is that we have some moxes. We're hoping to get some mana going really quickly. That's what we're using our points for, and then we have like powerful, you know, three through five mana creatures, mm -hmm. and we're gonna try to leverage those along with our planeswalkers for additional power every turn. Could be on Yeah, this is sort of. Um, I guess emblematic of like the four color decks is just like you try to jam these extremely potent multicolor spells as soon as possible. <laughs> I mean, I can you tell know, you like more. Omnath. I I know what yeah. they are, but I'm just trying to gauge on. Like, I can never remember what that card does. I mean, there's like several iterations of them, but this would be the four drop one. I yeah, the four mana one is a four four for every color of mana except black. Um, so four four for four, and then it draws a card when it enters the battlefield. And then also, whenever a land enters the battlefield, it has landfall, it has a few abilities. I think if it's the first time it's, it's, uh, it's resolved this turn, you gain four life. If it's the second time, you get four mana. And if it's the third time, it deals four damage to your opponent. Woof. And possibly also their planeswalkers. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Wow. So really, uh, an entire kitchen sink worth of value in one card. Mm -hmm. Well, the more colors you put in, presumably the more difficult a card is to cast and the more abilities you can stack onto it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but of course in this format where you have access to the most powerful mana base, uh, it's not as difficult to cast spells. However, there is always the, um, the, the punishing factor of having such a diverse mana base. Uh, particularly from a deck like Red Deck Wins, um, which is looking to, to uh, exploit reliance on that kind of um, mana diversity, you know, with Price of Progress, with Blood Moon. Um, we saw Cemetery Gatekeeper as well. Although that that's going to potentially punish any kind of uh, lands or spells. It's a very cool card. I don't think I've seen that one played yeah, before. Yep, yeah, still fairly new, only about a year, year and a half old for Cemetery Gatekeeper. I like it. Yeah, solid card. Um, looks like Wheeler has kept a seven, Sasha going back to the well here. Now, in Wheeler's deck, mm -hmm. we definitely also see a Mox Ruby, and I believe a Strip Mine, and I'm not sure uh, which other points cards. Um, once again, our deck lists are gonna become public and available for everyone to peruse after the quarterfinals, so that's, uh, you know, two and a half more rounds away. You get to dozing get rod get is pointing on towards GT. Yeah, GT would make some sense. Sometimes these decks play an off-color mox as well. They're also allowed to, you know, play a soul ring if they feel like mm. it's worth... They, they include, you know, the soul ring versus just another mountain is essentially a decision. My suspicion is that he's not on soul ring for this deck. Yeah, it seems like the curve is really low, so probably not a soul ring here. We do see soul ring often in the medium red archetype. But sometimes you just, you know, I've seen uh, Colin Miller, a regular mm -hmm. Red Deck Wins player around uh, Yellow Jacket, play Soul Ring in a, in a fast every, version as well. Yeah, every once quick, in a while. Quick first see, two turns. Yeah, yeah, every once in a while you'll see a Red Deck that plays um, Ancestral Recall with a teeny tiny right, blue tiny splash. splash. Also Black Lotus. You'll see every now and then yep. a Red Deck Wins yep. is playing just the Mox Ruby and Black Lotus. You know, no strip mine, no fancy equipment. Goblins will play Black Lotus to terrifying effect oh, sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You, you just like you want an explosive first turn. There you go. And it looks like Sasha might be keeping a six here. Yeah. Looks like yeah, we put a card on the card. bottom. All right, here we go. Off to the races. There are five or a six. Getting to play the first turn is Ben Wheeler with Labomancer. That's nice to see. 
Lavi Mets are probably able to do, you know, a little bit of work in this game where Sasha's got planeswalkers he needs to protect or mm -hmm. various creatures whose main purpose is their ETB and there might be some two toughness targets. Yeah. Or even just to get a few more points to the face. Always happy to see this wizard. He's just such a good one drop. Yeah, absolutely. In the conversation for sure. Overshadowed by Ragavan these days, but uh, you know, historically up there with That's true. best I mean, one drops he's, conversation. He's quite a different kind of uh, one drop. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Ragavan is just like getting in there and ruining your opponent's day. Right. Just like building you advantage. Uh, yeah, Ragavan. Is, it's almost like a scalpel. Right. Yeah, a little more thought needed to kind of plan what the Lava Mancer is going to do. Also, you'll often see Lava Mancer attacking in early turns. And then uh, sometimes having to decide one way or the other. Robber of the Rich now joining the team for Ben Wheeler. Okay, in response, or before attacks, Sasha's going to sacrifice his Bloodstain Mire. Uh, this is another you know, relatively new one, I suppose. Not as new as Cemetery Gatekeeper, so. Have you seen, seen this thing across the yeah, board? It's got a really complicated trigger there. Yeah, it, um, you draw... No, you, it's, it's another one of these, like, swipe your opponent's cards. Yeah, it's like Cousin of Ragavan, right? You know, when it, when it attacks, they have to exile a card off their library. And then you can cast one of those cards with spending any mana. Um, you can't play lands, though. So if they exile a land, it's gone forever. The card's going to get exiled face up. Both players will see it. And if it's a land, it's just gone forever. But otherwise, you that, can cast their spells. That could be pretty big. As long as you attacked with, get this, a rogue. <laughs> so, so when you when you attack with robber, those cards know that they've been exiled with robber's trigger, and then in later turns, if you have either robber or your mute vault, or maybe you have another rogue in your deck, um, you know, then you can cast those spells. Oh, got the land. Yeah, but still a two-two reach haste. Yep, yeah. reach a weird ability on a red creature. Oh, we're starting to see it more and more. You know, there was a there was a big common in uh, one that was like kind of a cool, um, you know, include in, in draft decks that was like a five five menace reach for hmm. five in uh, in red. And we've also seen like a few spiders and giants. It's it's becoming a bit more common that That's red fair. cards have reach. Uh, I'm seeing here's Ren and Six again. Ren and Six again. Grim Lavamancer's least favorite party guest. Yep. Yeah. Does he two for two on nugging that poor lava monster? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna guess here that Ren and Six's job is to gain two life and kill a kill a grim lava monster. Yep. It's also gonna keep um, Ben for what? Well, does he still get that trigger? We might need to look at Robert the Rich one more time. I'm not sure if it's one that attacks and then says defending player, or if it says one that attacks an opponent. Yep, attacks defending okay, player. So, so you yeah, are the defending player when someone attacks your planeswalker. So this trigger will still work. So, and then we're just asking the judge for confirmation there. Yeah, that's fair. So we'll see if he peels anything powerful off of this attack. Yeah. It's being thorough with the shuffling here. John Millsup here. I'm trying to let see what it, else let is there. Know that yep, it's still gonna text all card. Uh, I saw a um, comet stellar pup in there. Okay. Well, Which is a weird one that has a whole bunch of. Goofball abilities that I'm. Yeah, he's a stellar pup, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the little Boros puppy that could. I know you've done at least half of that. I mean, it could be, could potentially be Wheeler's comet this game. Maybe Wheeler's going to have to suffer the, the misfortune of not having brought an attractions deck to the game for other people. Oh, personally. that's harsh. I mean, I mean, there's a there's a world where Wheeler might want to cycle one of his own cards. Yeah, it's true. Or just cycle the remand, I mean, and pay extra to recast his own card. But I guess I it's mean, not a tempo play. Yeah. You keep hoping for some sort of like huge delve card or something. Oh my goodness, it's Ooh, Fury Fury's again. Back. More Ren and Six and more Fury from uh, and he's got, Sasha Christensen. He's got a red card this time, but not I don't exactly know if he... what Wheeler wants to see. There's another card in there that I cannot identify. We see uh, behind Fury, there's Otawara, which is a, a, a land that adds blue or can be a, a bounce spell for a uh, channel and four mana, and the channel gets cheaper. The channel cycle from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty has been really, really good. Fa yeah, fantastic cards. I Absolutely. finally got a copy, uh, a copy myself of uh, Boseju, Who Endures. 
Nice. Yeah, Which that's... is just like, this card's very, very good. It's a good one for Black Mold to, to play, I think. Yeah, I, I've been wanting to have that for a long time because it, it kind of um, sidesteps the, the Highlander conundrum of playing um, like specific hate cards like uh, Disenchant. Right. It's like, you don't have to choose. It's a forest and a disenchant. They also did, I think, a, the designers did a good job of recalling the feeling of the first set of legendary lands from Kamigawa um, back in 2004 or whenever that was, which were untapped legendary lands. Yeah. Oh, Mawlock now. Mawlock. This is a card I've really wanted to play. It sort of like snuck up on us from uh, uh, the um, 40K set. This is a Tyranid with Ravenous. It enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, and if the value of X is five or more, wow. you draw a card. Infuriate from Wheeler in response, you're gonna fight my creature, I'm gonna giant growth it. Wow. Holy moly. And Wheeler gets to make a little control play there, a little counter magic. That's an exciting turn for Wheeler. Uh, uh, Sasha having spent three mana on the Moloch there and getting, uh, getting denied. Moloch with... picked a fight with uh, a bigger bully. You know, that could have just been a lightning bolt from Wheeler, but the fact that it was Infuriate's kind of, you know, a little spicier. Yeah, that's like, it's a gorgeous Infuriate, too. Yeah. Yeah, Moloch is a card I definitely want to pick up a copy of somewhere. Yeah, seems like a solid card to include. It's just like, it's also just a very straightforward card. It's just like this donkey that fights stuff, and it can be as big as I want. Another land from Sasha off the top for Rob of the Rich. So no, this Robber of no the Rich is coming yet. up shorthanded. That's right. Yeah, every now and then you think that you're, uh, you know, you're knocking over a bank, and it turns out to be a gas station. Sorry, Robber of the Rich. Yep. You got you got some bad intel. Is Infuriate the one that scries one? Or? No, it's just plus three, plus two target creature. That's not so bad. Four CMC. It's the pup. So. We're gonna roll a six-sided die. And we got a four. Okay. It deals damage equal to the number of loyalty counters on him to a creature player, and then minus two. So he's gonna five the robber of the rich. Right, it's gonna have to be a really big pump spell out of the red deck wins deck to save the robber this time. <laughs> so Comet Stellar Pup is, um, it has four random abilities, because um, it's only Activation is to roll a die, and then you see what you get. Right, and it, it turns out actually, sorry, I know this card was from the same set as the attractions, but this card doesn't uh, yeah, enter it, it or does create attractions create or whatever. Uh, so it's just going to be, you know, burning creatures, uh, going to the graveyard because it got targeted by Royal Eruption, and, you know, if it comes back, maybe also returning other things. Mm -hmm. We see a wasteland here from Wheeler. It looks like he's going to choose to activate it right away. That's Takes probably... off green. Wise. I think Royal Eruption somehow slipped past my notice. This is just like another. Yeah, just, it's a pretty good. Um, yeah, Volcanic Hammer Plus. Absolutely. Yeah. No, this was an important one that came out uh, uh, this, uh, yeah, a couple years back. Legend of the Mirror Breaker. Yeah, Fable of the Mirror Breaker here. So um, you get a two-two. And the two-two, when it attacks, it makes a treasure token. Sasha is also going to be allowed to rummage next turn, and then eventually you get kind of a slightly worse Kiki Jiki. Yeah. Oh. Wild Slasher token. It's it's really rare that you can do better than two for winning yourself against Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Yeah. Because the token is relevant, you know, making making treasure when it attacks. Um, so it's it's very common that you just blow up the Fable of the Mirror Breaker if you can, and also blow up the token, and that's kind of the best you can do. Sasha's in a tough spot. Just, in, does he have double red here? Well, it looks like he's deciding whether or not... So after drawing Hallowed Fountain for the turn, Sasha may choose to rummage. De decides not to. Once again, hard casting Fury. Kablamo. Wow. And we're going to... If we don't see another removal spell for the Fable of the Mirror Breaker or after it becomes a creature, that's we could be see Fury tokens entering the battlefield. Oh, Alex. that's... <laughs> Really not what Wheeler was expecting when he uh -uh. sleeved up Red but Deck Wins. Sash is at four. That's... He's still dead to potentially one burn spell. That's right. Yeah. Price of Progress could do it. So not sure if Flame Rift is in the list for Wheeler, but now we're gonna see the Fable of Mirror Breaker transforming uh, as reflection of Kiki Jiki. So now this it... is a two two. Doesn't have haste, so no fury token this turn. 
Okay. Stomp it. Stomp now. Oh, not sure why the stomp Is went that, to the graveyard there. Uh, I think that might it? be an error. Yeah, we wanted to cast stomp, but when you cast an adventure, your adventure oh, wait, card should go to the uh, the exile zone. Maybe Paul, if you can hear me, if we just want to get the judge's attention there about the zone Did of he, the yeah, Bunker Giant. I see a mana leak in Sasha's. Oh, head. there's a mana leak. Okay, sorry, I totally missed that mana leak. Thank you, Alex. Okay, yep. that was so quick. Uh, just immediately mana leaked from Sasha. Great. Okay, so now he was turn. Just to hang the. Uh, Rift Bolt. Which land is this that he's played it's here? Shatter Skull Smashing. So we are choosing to suspend Rift Bolt rather than just casting it targeting one of the creatures. Uh, yeah, maybe he's trying to take him out in one blow here. Yeah, I'm a little confused. Thank you very much, Alessandra and Facetchuk in chat. Yeah, and various other people. It was a really fast mana leak, wasn't it? The fastest mana leak. Might call it like a blowout tire. Now, a Fury enters the battlefield and wants to attack. The wording on Fury, it, I think it says opponent's control. Any number of target. Now, don't we have. So to... any number can be zero, right? Okay. Roiling Vortex comes down. Oh, wow. Uh huh. That's uh, that's looking pretty scary. I don't think Sasha wins it. Yep, that, wow. that'll okay, win it. Wow, okay, the last it. point. Okay. That was his top deck? Absolutely wild. Woof. Okay, so Ben taking game two. After all, that was just a flurry of, an, of what a exciting plays butter. there. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not the way it looked like it was going to go there. So we're going to see the, the full three rounds here. I mean, the the Roiling Vortex was a really exciting one to draw, but could have could have been pretty much any spell that went to the face there, right? Yeah, yeah. I just think like getting Exaxes there, mm. and like also, I suppose like preventing any sort of potential life gain. Yeah, that's just fun. Pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like one of the first playable um, sort of like I don't know how to ca uh, categorize it. Um, What's yeah, the name of the other one that nugs yeah. people do uh, for two every upkeep? <laughs> Sulfuric Vortex. That's the one. I think also in Wheeler's list, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's always been a, um, a staple in these lists, um, partly because it speeds the game up and also because it prevents life gain. Um, yeah, it's less expensive to cast, and the anti-life gain aspect is an activated ability, but still pretty good. Weirdly, it's Baby Vortex, yeah. Because if I get the return, I can get back like Renin 6 and then just oh, throw it to Fury. Yeah. And then I just have a big combat in play. So then, like, what, Squirrels? It's the word, but no, I think Sasha's going to gonna like draw that, a Fury three, three games in a row. Yeah. I think we'll probably see a Renin 6 on turn two from <laughs> Sasha here, followed by a turn five Fury. That's what I'm like, expecting. Hey, here. wait a minute. After all, the point of um, creating a format with 100 different cards is to make sure that every game is more or less the same. Yeah. Right? That's what we're trying to go for here. One of the most consistent possible. That's why we make the decks extra large and uh, have a restricted list of one times cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can see that fury every single one game. times cards that exist in superposition. That's yeah, they're multiverse decks. That's right. Yeah, the the thing is, Sasha's shuffling his deck in the fourth dimension as well <laughs> here. So if he doesn't see the fury in the first few turns, he can just choose to draw from, you know, the shadow realm. <laughs> Get the, get the fury from there. You may you may bring a card from your fourth sub sub board. Swamp Soul Ringo in chat asking what our can letter weapons of choice are, uh -huh. and uh, why don't we answer for each other? Because we both uh, we've both played a lot of decks. So why don't you tell me what you think well, my I sort think of my main your can lander main deck is? Can lander deck is. I think I want to say mono black. Okay, yeah, I've been playing several mono black decks over the years, but yeah, but mono black. Like, you do play well a lot for. of other. Um, Decks. Yeah, and for yourself, I would say Black Mold. That's so the one. Kind of yeah. similar, black but green. So we both like to uh, attack with zombie tokens a fair bit. Love zombie tokens. Deathrite Shaman off, off uh, uh, a fetched Taiga for Sasha on turn one, and a Fire Drinker Seder. This is a slightly Party better jackal time. Buck. Yeah. So this uh, this is a two power one drop from red with a bit of a downside. I heard a rumor that Jackal Pup might be in Ben's list. 
I heard that Strom Kirknell made the cut instead, but it was down to the, la the, the last two. Oh, really? I think Jacklepup is the 101st <laughs> card yeah. in uh, in Benjamin Wheeler's list. You know, it's, it's sitting a... on the sideboard, or sitting on the bench, you know, howling uh, it's, in, it's in, a... with, <laughs> cheering for the rest of the team, exactly. I mean, it, it, it has been outclassed by Fire Drinker Seder, but it it is still a, a two one for one that yep. attacks and blocks. Absolutely, yep. You know, still a still a relevant uh, piece of the conversation. If you think the second power is better than the uh, claws on the Stromberg Noble, you can get it in three mana. Sasha now for Sasha. Life, yeah. tapping three for three fairy. Teferi. Yeah, it's a fairy time raveler. So the first clause here, the static ability on on Teferi probably not going to matter too much against Ben. But uh, Mox comes down. Does does draw a card and, and no attacks immediately from Wheeler, so Sasha might have a way to protect it. Well, let's see if we have a hay creature here that might take out that uh, planeswalker. Sasha playing the Mox after drawing it from Teferi, uh, threatening to have a lightning bolt to deal with any hay creatures. Doesn't look like he actually Spike does have that. Oh, okay. Spikefield. Uh, Spikefield hazard. Hazards, see yeah. you later, Teferi. Does it get exiled? The permanent dealt damage would die. There you go. Nice. That's another good one. These uh, dual face modal cards are so good in our format. Yep, Wheeler from uh, from the recent Zendikar set. Wheeler is playing both Spike Field Hazard and Shatter Skull Smashing, and Smashing the one that takes out lands. No, it's uh, so on the one side it adds for a red, and it comes to play untapped if you pay three life. So it's really expensive, but you can come and play untapped. Mm -hmm. And on the back side, it's X. Red, red, or is it XX red? It's it's expensive, yeah. and you can deal damage to um, up to two creatures. I think and kill two creatures with uh, uh, dividing the amount of damage. Gotcha. Sasha fixing his draws with Sylvan Library here. Okay, and a fiery eyelid. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any reason to have blue mana in your deck. I think that's just a mountain that can sac from, cycle from play. That sounds about right. As well as Felden, Ronom Excavator now from uh, from Benjamin. He's got a haste, guy. This is a haste creature. And it looks like the, the path is cleared here to start trundling in towards Sasha's life total. You almost have like opposite ends of the spectrum here. That, uh, both these creatures that Ben has um, have an effect that uh, when they suffer damage, but uh, one's a lot better than the other. Yeah, that's right. You'd much rather be pinging your Feldon Ronom Excavator than pinging mm -hmm. your Fire Drinker Seder. It's true. Two. No blocks. Oh, no blocks. Eats the, oh, eats the four. Looks like we're going to Petty Theft the Feldon, setting Wheeler back a turn here, costing costing two mana for Tempo in exchange plays. for two mana. Which is a nice move if you uh, if you're up two mana against your opponent. Ooh, Sasha bringing his own oh, adventure it. token. Yeah. Love that. Got a little adventure zone going there. <laughs> Make it a bit easier for our adventure. viewers to see what's happening. Thanks very much, Sasha. Mm -hmm. It's sort of an exile. Mm. Bur danger, danger, and burst this lightning. Spells the end for Deathrite Shaman. Getting rid of Deathrite Shaman is probably going to be just. You always feel good about that, because it's just like saving you so much of a headache later. Yeah, absolutely. If if you suspect you're going to end up pointing this burst lightning at the death rate shaman at some point, best to do it as soon as possible. Yeah, because it just it represents a lot of things that give red deck uh, problems. Not the least of which is life gain. Sasha tanking for a little while in the top three and decides to put two back. Ooh, and now an expressive iteration. Just nothing but library manipulation over here. Yep. Uh, Sasha looking Band a little bit like Connor in round one with a, with a combo deck almost. You yep. know, just dig, dig, dig. This card too good Bonus in Bonus modern. Bonus if, 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 am I correct? I think that's right. Yeah, didn't, did expressive just get hit by the ban? I haven't played modern. It definitely well, got but banned. I, know that I think it's banned in. Maybe it's Pioneer. Maybe it's still okay in modern, but been gone in Pioneer. Let us know in the comments. Legal and modern band and pioneer. There we go. And legacy. Band oh, band and legacy. Yeah, that makes sense too, actually. Intriguing. It's a lot of card. <laughs> no points yet, though. Nope. Okay, Feldon's back. Gets mana leaked. Sasha's saying, I really don't want to play against that creature in particular. Now, is that a force of. 
Looks like Force of Negation and Consider the cards it had for Sasha. Oh, and now we see Soul Scar Mage coming down for Wheeler. This is a prowess creature uh, with no power haste, two toughness. But yeah. Yeah, sort of a slightly worse Monastery of Swift. We have Monastery of Swift Spirit at home. Um, although in standard, this com combined in, in decks regularly with uh, okay. that 3 mana 3 3 first strike goblin that pings everything. Remember what that? Fire Wheeler? No, not Fire Wheeler. I don't know that one. G yeah, you do. Chain, chain Whirler? Goblin Chain Whirler. Oh, do you remember that, that one? guy. Yeah, yes. so they were both in the stand same standard format. So you'd end up putting a bunch of minus one, minus one cameras on all your pretty, creatures. Pretty, pretty hot. Goblin Chain Whirler. Thanks very much, chat. That's right. Well, I mean, this uh, Soul Scar kind of gives all like, your burn spells weather, which. Uh, exactly, yeah. Tarmagoose. So. Technically combines with lots of cards in Wheeler's deck, although all the cards in Wheeler's deck that uh, Soulscar Mage likes to see, Wheeler would probably rather point at Sasha. Dose mana. But in this matchup, it's entirely possible that we'll see some minus one, minus one counters come down yeah, on a big creature, yeah. I mean, they might actually be good yeah. against this Tarmagoose. Yeah, this might be happening. Now, how big is that? We've got instant creature land. We do have sorcery as well. Sorcery. So it looks like it's going to be a 4 or 5 Goyf. Wheeler, I believe, also playing Tarfire, so there's a chance that a tribal card could hit the bin at some point. Yeah, I, I guess Tarmogoyf now has the chance to get an additional point larger with battles being printed. That's right. Yeah, we get to. We're living in a world of nine, ten Tarmogoyfs as of today, with uh, with the. March of the Machine cards being legal in this format. I'm not sure if any of the players are in included in any battles. I have in their, no idea in their how to decks. evaluate those cards at all. I think they're kind of neat if you're an attacking deck, and a lot of a lot of decks are playing, you know, like initiative creatures. They have creatures on the battlefield, mm -hmm. and they're interested in um, maintaining kind of a comfortable board presence. So, I could I could see a I'm world probably, where they're, they're, yeah, I'm probably going to let people smarter than me evaluate those cards, and then I'll just ape them. The only the only one I've I've seen that I thought might make a, an interesting include so far. I'm not sure if it's you know up quite at the power level, but maybe, maybe consider... I can't remember which plane they're invading, but it costs exactly one blue and one green mana. Ooh. And then uh, I believe it replaces itself immediately before you attack it, and then you can uh, you can get a creature if you manage to attack it down. Neat. Invasion of Pyrulia. Thank you, Harold Holmes and chat. And Sib, wow. Yeah, the Invasion of Pyrulia. I, I would... I would personally try that card on the deck. Guess who's back? Ooh. Back again. If you can have Fury every game, I want to have Figure of Destiny twice. Yeah. Okay. So once Love an Encore. Once again, Sasha has put a big uh, big creature down. Last time it was the uh, true name Nemesis. So big, powerful blue creature. This time it's the classic biggest vanilla creature in the game. Tarmogoyf trying to hold down the board against the several smaller creatures of Wheeler. So promoting figure of destiny to a bear straight away. Yeah. We don't want to get run and six this game. Oh, okay, and it looks like Sasha wants to respond to that first mana being put into figure. It's gonna consider? Yeah. Considering what to do about that. Probably we're gonna let it be a two two, but who knows? Now, Maybe is we'll that rip a, a fire. Thinking race. cap or a looking cap? That I think is how you find out which set of glasses you need. Better when you show up Worse. the optometrist. Yeah, better this one. Two, How about this one? Or now, three. can you read the consider? Three or four. So Does it look closer to the blue mana now or now? Okay, and so main phase Wheeler had put four mana in, or, th or yeah, four mana total, I guess, in to the figure of destiny after the consider resolved. Have to exile. And it's consider from Sasha. Okay, so things going pretty well for Sasha there, getting to Wheeler's entire turn and giving him a, an extra land now that just about the only card in his deck that would care if he had six lands is gone. We got one card in yep. The good news for Wheeler is one of those lands is a fire islet, so we'll probably get to see that Ooh, yeah, that's, that's, turn into some more gas. That's going to be good. I mean, this exact situation is kind of why you play those slightly off color. Yeah, um, exactly. Just in case we get a little flooded. It's just something to do. The real story here that Wheeler's got to be annoyed about is that Sasha's still up at 12 yeah, and that's... holding the fort with this Tarmogoyf. So, you know, Wheeler doesn't have on the board any way to it's really deal with, um, you know, Wheeler's, or Sasha's current board state. Yeah, Sasha's top decks don't look too spicy. Yeah, it I looks like I saw Sasha's any new thing? gas anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, interesting sort of little double stalemate here going on. That's, 
Well, we wait to see. Let's see who flinches first. Yeah, which which player is going to find something yep, that pushes the, the islet getting cycled. Pushes the game into a different era here. God, I hope that wasn't a mountain I just saw. It might have been, you know. Ooh. Well, better cycled than on the top. Right. Statistically, I think the larger your deck gets, the more likely it can be that you get a huge long lineup of lands or spells. Just as uh, you know, random chance works. Certainly, Highlander is no stranger to the oops all lands no, situation. I mean, this you is know. this is land drops incendiary leaking in. Oh, from it's Richard happening! Damage. Oh boy! We see the incendiary flu with the minus one minus one counters from Soul Scar. That's range. hot. It's on the stack though, so maybe Sasha will uh, find a way to deal with Soul Scar in response. Oh. Nope, we're just going to negate the spell. Fair enough. Just paying no, retail for it. Don't burn my goif. Yep, three mana in against two mana spell, so good for Wheeler in one regard. Now, if Goyf is still just a 4-5, we might also even, if Wheeler got flooded, you know, with six mana available, we could just spend a bunch of life and a bunch of mana to offer Fire Drinker Stater to trade with Tarmogoyf. Yup, that, that could happen. It's possible, yeah. Rolling in with Fire Drinker Seder. This is exciting. It's a Soul Scar Mage, yeah. So oh, sorry, two, Soul that's Scar okay, Mage. yeah. The Fire Drinker's staying home, but a 2 3 Soul Scar Mage. Is this a bluff? Do we have another Lightning Bolt? Or do we just want to take two? Sasha has to consider. This is tricky because it's like. He knows that the, the 1 2 can get a lot bigger. Could be a Bird Strength, could be Infuriate. Now, do we see Sasha's last card in hand yet? I feel sure. like it was another blue one. Everyone in the chat saying, probably it's going to be the Infuriate again. <laughs> the Infuriate it works. A Lightning Bolt would also work. Soulscar Mage is, uh, okay, it looks like Sasha opts to take two there. Okay, and now we see a Fire Ice on the top. Sasha would love to see a fetch land here. Mm -hmm. Looks like maybe going to content himself with just drawing that Caracas after casting this uh, this fire ace. Caracas and not that amazing here, and not hugely relevant against a uh, red deck, is it? There's like a tiny handful of legendary red creatures. Well, we saw Feldon earlier, and it's they'll, against Ragavan. they'll play Lelia, Ragavan. It's it tends to be a bit better than you. You expect it's going to be. I, I think can, that's the I situation that. with Caracas. I can see that. You know, we keep talking about it on the podcast constantly, and in terms of evaluating new cards, because the number of legendary creatures printed every year has been like really ratcheted up. Yeah, recently. it's. I mean, I guess uh, Caracas is good against like any kind of creature-based deck because you can have it. Okay. Oh, we're going to main phase spear. another bolt here. Yeah, Searing Spear. So, it seems likely that uh, Wheeler had this in hand last turn during the attack with Soulscar Mage. Now, if Sasha had a remand. No, he did, no, just right. got the fire ice. Yeah, I think Remand is the last card in hand for Sasha as well. And uh, and two blue sources, so could end up casting it's not, it's, yeah, it's both halves of these. So I think he's going to Remand it, but that's just... Well, it's going to draw him a card. I feel like Ben's probably just going to cast it again. Right, we know that the card we're drawing is Caracas for Sasha. Flip. But it does mean that we're digging through this little pile of lands on top of our library. So now we're going to see two new cards with uh, Silver Library and our Justin. Yeah, people asking. Currently, Goyf is a 4-5. We've got uh, all the normal inclusions. No Planeswalker, Artifact, Tribal. He's yet. already got a Prowess trigger off of casting that the first That's time. That's right. So, right? yeah, we have a 2-3. Um, I mean, so this is actually a pretty interesting judge call. And at, you know, competitive, if Wheeler hasn't said that his trigger resolves, technically it could still be on the stack. This is a really, really awkward... Uh, Situation. I think we can assume that it's resolved. Okay, so he's gonna tap. Yep. Yeah, okay. Oh, just tap that one, draw a card. Okay, so now we've cleared out all the cards that we had seen on the top of Sasha's library here. So that's that's good news. And now those are that dice on the Tarmogoyf. Now that's not how big the Tarmogoyf is. Those are three minus one minus one counters. It's a small because goyf. the Searing Spear resolved and the uh, Soul Scar Mage is in play. So I guess a one-two Goyf at this point. 
It looks like we see Preordain and a Windswept Heath. And Oko. Oko. So, what does Oko have to say about this situation? I don't know. He's probably just going to, like, chill and eat some fruit or we something. Could, yeah, we might just, honestly, we might just eat some fruit, chump with the Targoy for one turn, and then uh, maybe start turning, I mean, I turning our food tokens into elk. I suppose turning uh, Goyf into an elk at this point is an upgrade. <laughs> well, the minus one minus one counters is. stay. Yeah, it doesn't exile the creature. So it, actually, if we turned our Goyf into an elk right now, it would just die. Oh, it just die. Ah. Yeah, yeah. What a handsome man. Mm. Yep. If, if only it wasn't across the table, I'd always be happy to see Oko. Yeah. Well, Oko has brought a pie to the potluck. Okay. Pie on the table and a pass back to Wheeler here. He goes to six loyalty? Yep. What is this nonsense? Mistakes were made. Oh, baby. Okay, Arc Trail here in God. full effect, targeting a two toughness creature and getting an extra point onto. If there was sure a it's card Sasha Oko. that was emblematic of Highlander, I think Arc Trail might be it. Arc Trail is another one that I'm really happy to see still has I a home am after so, all these years. Yeah, yeah I, I love fantastic. that it's still around. Yeah. Fork Bolt too. You know these cards don't don't tend to see as much play in other uh, other competitive formats nearly. Any any format where you can play four lightning bolts, you don't usually see an arc trail, but uh, it's great to see it here. Now I feel like Ben probably has enough damage to finish off this Oko if he pumps because uh, he's got four heading that way. Yeah, I think an activation on Fire Drinker would kill Oko if there's no other shenanigans. Yeah, that's, yeah there we go. Because I feel like that's that's right to just like get rid of that. So including the point from the Arc Trail, that's six life points of Sasha's we could have taken away to instead mm -hmm. kill that Oko. So, you know... That's a drag. I, 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 I agree with the, the situation from Wheeler, but it's just worth noting just yeah. how powerful that Oko is, even when it gets killed immediately. Uh -huh. You know, just a huge life point swing, um, and even kind of mana efficient. Like, what we put in two for Arc Trail and two for yeah. Fire Drinker. What did you think about him making food rather than... I don't know. Well, there wasn't a good target for the elk, I don't think, because if you elk one of the opponent's creatures, they already yeah. only really ever have three power at most, and what that's about, with some work. What uh, about elking the mox there? Hmm, elking the mox is a decision I hadn't considered. So potentially elking the mox makes that turn a bunch different, yeah. and uh, possibly Sasha would have been in a better spot. But uh, it's you know should have could have yeah. woulda. Exactly. Now we've preordained to try to get a new look, and still only found land here. Oh, I think. Now we're going to cycle a Rogren trial. And a red oh, card for Sasha. Oh, it's Burst Lightning. Okay, oh, it's not. Oh, it's, it's strangled. strangled. It's pretty close. Okay. Here's another one that uh, sort of slipped my notice. Oh, yeah. Fairly recent. Nuke Pena. This card's still in standard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Pretty cool it's card, just, right? Well, it, this, this It's not quite uh, Flame Slash, but, but it can hit a Planeswalker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that's, that's the card I would compare it favorably to. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is Kumano something. What's it called? Thank you. Kumano, Kumano faces Kakazan. Uh, saga from New Kapana, starting out with one point to each opponent and Planeswalker. When Zergo Bell Striker as well it's here. It's just all two twos all the way down. And there's the Caracas being right. relevant. Another important target for Caracas. So Wheeler showed this now and can let Sasha know that there's going to be attacks. Oh. And now we see Dress Down as well as That's... Murktide Regent on the top of the library for Sasha. This is one of the powerful hits in his deck he's hoping to see. So this is a huge flying dragon, essentially. There's some more words on it, but what you need to know about it is it's, big donkey. it's cheap. It's big. It's kind of like a Tarmogoyf with flying. It's big. And here it comes. And Uga uh, Chaka. Yeah, so seven mana for a 3-3 flying, oh, but it God. has Delph. Oh, dear God. It's <coughs> going to be huge. And then it also enters with a plus one, plus one counter for each instant sorcery exiled with its delve ability. And whenever an instant sorcery leaves your graveyard, you know, after it's in play, uh, it gets another plus one, plus one it's counter. It's so, so big. It just watches your yard and says, hey, every time spells leave, I get bigger. So it's going to come down as an 8-8 flying. Exiling only instants and sorceries chooses Sasha, saying, hey... Yeah, the, I want this dragon to be as big as possible. The cheaper it is, the bigger it gets. 
That's why I love these dragons, man. Second mode there for the uh, Kumano Saga, and if Wheeler can have a creature into the battlefield, or no, cast a creature spell, sorry. If Wheeler can cast a creature spell this turn, it'll come down with a plus one, plus one counter on it. It's an interesting little uh, saga. I mean, it's, it's a lot of effect for just one red. Yep, absolutely. Another one of these, on the back side, you get a 2-2 haste that uh, exiles creatures if they've been damaged by one of your creatures this turn, and, and then they go to the graveyard. It's not too bad. Fire ambush. <sighs> Soul Scar Mage, continuing, continuing to put in work, it's going to reduce the number of plus one, plus one counters on Murktide region, assuming this resolves. I don't think Sasha has a counter spell. I think Sasha's last card is just a Savannah. Fire ambush sneaking in here from Portal Three Kingdoms. That's right. It is a... Um, Volcanic Hammer look-alike. Okay, Zergo gets bounced. Oh, we just... Oh, we didn't go to the Murktide region. I'm sorry, we went to the face with that Fire Ambush. Wheeler saying, my, Let's out, go. my out for this game is that that Murktide region attacks and, and I'm in the following turn. Yep, and there's the Renin 6. Okay. I'm not sure if Renin 6 has a lot to say about this game. I think we might just want to go for the uh, so Dress Down... And then maybe play it in hopes that Wheeler wants to attack it instead of our face. You know, Wheeler has just spent his last turn casting a sorcery targeting Sasha's life total. So I'm not sure if the Planeswalker here is going to... I think it's a gonna... fall from favor rather than dressed out. Oh, it's fall from favor. Thank you very much. Okay, I thought That's it was dressed the, out. That's um, the uh, initiative uh, freeze effect, isn't right. it? Right. Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe getting the initiative here is going to work out for Sasha. You get a shuffle off your first time into the dungeon, so... You know, hoping the next turn not see any more lands on the top might be great for Sasha. Oh, my mistake. It's a monarchy freeze. Oh, never mind that. Okay, fall from <laughs> favor. Getting the monarchy does not let you go search for a basic land. Um, Sasha oh, here. A, having the absolute, you know, um, bravery, the gall, if you will, to call his deck Omnitiative and then including a monarch card. Just... Just to torpedo the casters. Fraudulent. Right? Obviously, you know, we've, we're on opposite sides of the fence here. Uncouth. Fall from Favor, a pretty Churlish. interesting one from, uh, I think, First Commander Legends? I think so. Kind of like snuck into being popular in other formats. It's it wasn't a like really big news. Cheap. It sort of came in the back door, yeah. right? Like, yeah, you get, uh, you get all the value of. I'm not sure what the first one of those three mana tap this creature doesn't untap cards is. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one, there's definitely one from First Innistrad. Are there any other three drops that give you the monarchy? Uh, that's a good question. I think the answer is yes. Um, but a lot of them are four or five, yeah, almost, right? I think almost all of them are four or more. Right. Okay, so we've tapped down this Soulscar Mage. It won't be attacking, which probably, frankly, ruins... Oh, um, boy, rooms in with the yeah. Tide. So we're now six to seven life points. Sasha doing an interesting job of representing the board state here with the Fall from Favor on one side and the Soul Scar Mage on the other. Wouldn't be my favorite, but it is important to note that the Enchanted Creature doesn't untap while, uh, while Sasha is the monarch. So it, it's an interesting card, right? It, it doesn't lock down the creature forever necessarily, just like Palace Jailer. Kumano flipping now. A 2 2 haste. Immutavolt activates. All right. So he's going to get in, potentially pick up the monarchy. Sasha says, Show me what you got. Okay. So Ben just wants to peel any burn spell here. Well, as long as it's an instant. Oh, yeah. but maybe he's already got it. Oh, oh, oh boy. Well, that's still not quite good enough, right? Because Ben's oh, at six, no. and the Murktide region threatens lethal. Oh, no. Now, if he can rip like a Lavadart even, it could be any small burn spell here. Uh, I would like to go to... <sighs> oh, I can't, I can't watch... Oh, I don't think he got From it. From the body language, it seems like Sasha's got this. Goes to one. <laughs> oh, Sasha peeling Sasha the peeling lightning the bolt. And, and also the Omnath here to get well, well, you can't actually gain life, sorry, with uh, with Sulfuric Fortress and Blade, but, you know, Omnath's sort of the namesake card of the deck. Okay. That is now a we, wild we get to see a textless version of it, both on the field and on the card reader, unfortunately. This card has some words on it, I promise you. Do the casters know what all of them are? No. It looks like the Hulk didn't render all the way. 
Oh, oh, tragedy. Oh, well that was done, a Sasha. that was close. That was very, very close. Wow. What a battle. That was Genuine answer is psychic damage, but I can justify it with Ragaban. There, Sasha's just explaining a card choice that he's made to include yeah. this deck. It has something to do with dealing with your opponents, stealing your stuff all the time. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to be as, you know, efficient. That was some powerful like magic. Did not see the initiative okay, even I mean, once I, I in those three games, like though. That's true, but Sasha's going to go on to play in the <laughs> semifinals, at the very least, so we'll have another chance. I'm certain that there are some initiative cards in his deck. No. It's not just, it's not just fall from favor and, uh, you know, a, a red herring. That, that would be a pretty next level kind of thing. It's just like uh, Legacy Fish featuring no merfolk. <laughs> yeah, I mean... We probably could see that at some point, too. Hey, welcome back. Look, it's our faces. Um, so, pretty exciting, very back-and-forth match there from uh, Ben Wheeler and Sasha. It's quality magic. That's right. Yeah, we saw, in that last game, we saw the power of Soulscar Mage dealing with the Tarmogoyf. Mm. That was pretty exciting. And uh, in earlier matches, you know, we saw all kinds of interesting decisions from uh, Ben Wheeler as he was just up against it in those first two games, just barely managing to beat the... the the sec or win the second one after Sasha had played Fury twice in the first two games. So Scary, yeah. Red deck really in, hard fought in yeah. this format, and I mean sometimes in others, it, it it has I think a reputation as being like a very brainless linear deck. But there is a lot of decisions going on there. No, absolutely. Uh, while pow powerful and quick, uh, the red deck wins archetype is not without plenty of decisions and thoughtful magic to be played. Mm -hmm. So we certainly saw that going on as both players sort of danced back and forth, vying for victory. Sasha ending, uh, ending up the champion of that round. Now this is, uh, this is good news and bad news. You know, obviously we, we hope for the best for Ben Wheeler as one of our fellow sort of Lure crewmates. However, now that he's uh, not occupied now he gets with playing commentary. magic in the later rounds, we get to definitely see him back here in the commentary booth um, in the later rounds. Not right away, though. We're going to take a short break, mm -hmm. and then Alex and I are back uh, to, for round three, and we'll tell you all about that one when we come back. Go stretch your legs, drink some water. It's like a little fluids. Welcome back to the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. Brought to you by Loading Ray Run and Yellow Jacket Comics. Now, why is it a 2022 championship? Everyone keeps asking. To get into this tournament, this is a, a top eight playoff from the season of games of Highlander at Yellow Jacket in 2022. I know it's April, but the world being as it is, it took a little while to get this tournament together. So here we are fighting with all the current cards that are available in Magic now, but with the players that managed to get into this topic. It's like how you year. pay your taxes for last year. Yeah, exactly. But this is a lot more fun. Yeah, we're doing just as well as the Canadian government in collecting things, collecting, uh, you know, information at a reasonable pace. Well, it wouldn't be a Coach Nelly stream without a little bit of mute on camera, right? Sorry about that, team. Oh, yeah. It was genius, I assure you. Yeah. No, just just saying welcome back to the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. Brought to you by Yellow Jacket and Loading Ray Run and explaining how the players... <laughs> they, they, they could hear you. It was just... They could hear me. I just was muted. You were on I'm, Alex's I'm so confused. Oh, I see. I was, I was heard through Alex's mic. Perfect. Okay. Great. Anyway, uh, Highlander. <laughs> Highlander. Hi. Landon. Okay, a little false start there from Nelly. Um, we're going to have Matthew Greer against David Brunson in this, the third quarterfinal of the day. And Matthew, unfortunately, uh, has to take a game loss starting this round Rough. off. Rough. Because of a deck mistake, missing a card from his deck, and um, the way we're running this tournament. That's comp Ariel. That's one of the, uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, enforcing those rules at this, this level. So, so. Matthew's going to get to start the game on the play. And... Uh, he's playing a Jeskai Tempo Control deck here. We see a lot of the same cards we saw from uh, some, some of the cards from Ben Wheeler and some of the cards from uh, Robin in, the, uh, in mm -hmm. the, the first match there. So lots of exciting, cheap 
uh, uh, threats. You know, we've got the Ragvan, Terramander, Murktide Regent, just like we saw from Exciting. from Sasha, and then uh, you know, a big slurry of removal spells <laughs> and interaction stuff, and some of the better initiative creatures. So kind of like Jeskai fast, good stuff. Mm -hmm. This is like a pretty archetypical. Uh, Canadian Highlander deck. Honestly, Matthew's deck, I would say, like, hey, what do you want to do? Play Highlander? Here you go. Like, it's a pile of best stuff. The, you know, the overall plan of the game is stop your opponent and win. Gotcha. You know. I'm excited for David's deck uh, because it has an Arcbound Ravager in it because it's blue-white uh, artifacts. Well, when I saw the title blue-white artifacts, my first thought was, you know, uh, Mana rocks like mind stone. So did I. I, I, yeah. I definitely thought that it was going to be like a um, maybe I mean, a probably, paradox engine. Yeah, exactly. But this looks like it's a um, an aggressive deck. Great. Um, it's uh, we're playing uh, Hangerback Walker, Hope of Gear per Hull Breacher. We got Ledger Shredder, Lion Sash, lots and lots of stuff. So we're probably going to see. There's a reality chip in here. That's exciting. So I'm not an aggressive card. So maybe a little bit of both, right? Some, yeah. Some of the some of the artifact beatdown. Well, you can play both ways. And what are the points in David's deck? Uh, I think it's a bunch of moxes. Nice. If I had to guess. A big pile of them moxes, hey. Let's see. Let's, uh, there's opal, uh, pearl, and sol ring. Yeah, it's mox mox sol ring. So just all artifact uh, ramp. And it's the same from uh, Matthew. Really? Uh, Matthew yeah. opting for Mox Pearl, Mox Ruby, Mox Sapphire, and the one more might be a true name. Yeah, and a true name nemesis. So both players looking to get ahead quickly on mana. Wow. Let's... Uh, let's well, just before we do, board. I want to have a quick shout out to Amazonian for that big raid. Thanks so much, Amazonian. Appreciate it. Uh, and all you do. But yeah, otherwise, if you're, if you're ready, let's check on out what the players are doing in this, the third set... The third quarterfinal of the 2022 Canadian Islander Championship. Matthew Greer starts us off at the volcanic island here. Drop the Volk. Now, I didn't catch whether either player took a mulligan, but perhaps as the game continues, it will be. Ooh, a big start oh, from Davy with a Mox Sapphire vroom. and an island. A 2 2 Stone Coil Serpent. That's the X casting cost artifact creature from Eldrain. Love this creature. And in response, Matthew's going to have a mental note. Yeah. Uh, Dovin's Veto and Plateau, Plateau are getting the milled. Bin. There we go. Great. So, already getting a whole bunch of cards in the yard. Um, we're not playing any Delve cards in this list, though. But, really? Yeah, but you know that Dovin's Veto is a target for a Snapcaster Mage out of. So uh, it, with no, that's an interesting choice to have Mental list. Note in a card in a deck with no Delve cards. Yeah, so. it's possible that Matthew's playing like the full suite of instants for one blue that draw you a card. Um, but there also might be some other interesting things happening in his list that uh, that want you to get stuff in your bin. Yeah, I think that's... we saw Dragon Rage Chandler. Yeah, there's there is a Delirium card. We've got Dragon Rage Chandler potentially for Matthew. We're brainstorming. Brainstorm in response to Davy's fetch on turn two. So this is the Flooded Strand, activated ability on the stack. Matthew has played a lot of Stifles in his day, and he is playing Stifle in this deck list, so he might be able to dig for it and then sacrifice that Prismatic Vista to get an island. We'll see if that's what comes down here. Matthew's pretty well known uh, on the Monday Night Circuit for being the person who has the Stifles. Looks like uh, that I uh, didn't find the stifle. Okay, looks like we let that brainstorm finish resolving, hopefully. We got a hull breacher. And now a hull breacher. It got kicked out of oh Commander my. and has found its way to our format. Oh my goodness. And this is this is main phase, right? Now, I'm sorry. I thought the brainstorm was in response to the flood strand, but maybe the flood strand was in response to the brainstorm. Holy smokes. I'm not entirely sure what's, what's going on here. That brainstorm does still appear to be on the stack. Oh, is, he, is this in response to the... Oh, good so if, gravy. <laughs> if, uh, if it was attack for two after playing the Flood Strand and then pass, and then end of turn Matthew brainstorms, then that Hull Breacher is going to look a lot angrier. So we'll just have to wait and see here. Are we going to see some treasure tokens? Yeah, whether we're seeing these treasure tokens happen. Okay, it looks like the brainstorm finished resolving. Okay, so maybe there's a little bit of auto-order sequencing there. 
No, oh, no, I see. Not entirely sure. Oh no, treasure tokens are in play. Okay, so holy moly! So, so instead of drawing three there, Matthew <laughs> just, just ramped had to him put three times. Two cards on the top of his library from his hand after casting brainstorm. So essentially, oh. getting mindfulled by his own brainstorm. This is after having to take a loss for a deckless problem. At the beginning I feel queasy. Of the so can't be a comfortable seat um, at all. Hey, isn't he supposed to be on tempo? Right. Yeah. And, you know, this match, it might end up being a really quick one, unfortunately, with five power already on the side for Davey, and Matthew down several cards due to that absolutely backbreaking hole breacher interaction. It's up to six mana turn two. I'm trying to think what the biggest, scariest thing he could slam here would be. Um, for Davey? Yeah. I mean, if I was Davey in this position, I'd just want to have, like, a cryptic command or something, you know, mm. or... I mean, along those lines, it's supposed to be playing Sublime Epiphany. That's six mana and completely locks your opponent out of any, doing anything interesting. Um, but realistically, from what di what's in Davy's deck, probably just another creature. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe Teferi Time Raveler. That'd be a really strong follow-up because Matthew wants to do a lot of instant speed plays in this deck. Maybe an Urza Lord High Artificer. That's another Windmill Slam. No third land here yet from Matthew. Oh, that play passes back to Davey. God. And a second mox. Second mox. Okay, well, you know, this is a tournament, folks. And while we have had a lot of really good, interesting-looking games, it's Surgical Skull Bomb now from Davey. But while we've had several really back-and-forth close nail-biter games, that's not, you know, typical of every round of Magic that you play in a tournament. And sometimes you just get these, you know, less interesting stomps, unfortunately. And then when you combine those with uh, now what? some tournament errors, it can be really brutal. So the Surgical Resolves, and then there was a Michiko's Reign of Truth. It was on the stack for a moment, met with a counter spell from Matthew. What were we asking there, Alex? Oh, yeah, just, I was, which um, saga that was. And oh, this one yeah. flips into... It turns into, a, a, like, a star, star creature with a number of enchantments and artifacts you control. So, mm. um, I'm trying to think of what the first one of those was. Good question. Yeah. yeah, it flips into Portrait of Michiko. One of these sort of grow creatures, right? Oh, and a Nettle Cyst as well during the table. Wow, so just nothing but gas from Davy. Playing a fourth spell this turn after the Mox, Surgical Skull Bomb, and then using some treasures to cast so Nettle that, Cyst, yeah, which is Nettle another is one of one, those two, three, XX four, creatures. Five, you know. Six, six as, that I can see. Looks like we're just looking around for a germ token. Beep, beep. Gosh, and Matthew's day just went from bad to worse, it seems here. Oh, now, I wonder what he could, he could hope to look for to deal with this. Typically, Matthew's deck wants to, ahead again, get ahead on mana, like we talked about, and then leverage little interactions like uh, Third Path Iconoclast for a bit of value, or you know a bunch of one-for-ones and then a Murktide Regent. And we really just need to, we need to start dealing with the th these threats individually really quickly. I think really I saw quickly. Jace the Mind Sculptor off the top there, but I'm not sure. Okay. A again, no third land, and then just passing the turn. Okay, Davy coming back in the rolling in here. with some big boys. Oh, two. It's Fairy Mastermind here, okay. another Yuta Takahashi on the table here. We're a big fan of this uh, this printing. Thanks, Yuta. We would like it even more if it was a one three as well, but this one's good. So it looks like. Enters the battlefield and then just immediately chump blocks that nettle sift so that we don't die. Well, I mean that's a that's a savings. Uh, is it dig site engineer? Ooh, I hope so. Is that? <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, dig site. Anytime you cast an artifact spell, you can <coughs> pay two to make a um, a construct. So I only okay. got three. Prismari command here. Okay. And the first first really uh, sign of hope here for Matthew. Uh, finally, a two for one going in Matthew's okay, direction here, okay. destroying Nelsis and dealing two damage to Olive Breacher. And Davy's going to cycle in response. Now, he, for the first time, doesn't have a lethal attack here on the board, but the equipment might change that. Five mana available for Davy. Oh, a Caracas, the third land for Matthew. That's going to be relevant sometimes against mm -hmm. Davy's deck as well. So, uh, we could potentially see Matthew clawing back here. Well, fingers and toes. Gets in for four. 
Greer goes to two. This is going to be a big top deck. Does that dig site engineer have a third point of power somehow? Uh, I yeah. thought it was a 2-2. Two, two. Oh, it's a 3-3. Three, three. I'm sorry. So we got a we smuggler's go. copter. Oh, oh, my goodness. And nothing else from Matthew. It. And that's the All end she of wrote. that match. So sorry, Matthew. Tough beats. Not like this. We don't like to see it like this, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah. I mean, I didn't, this could have been a lamp, but this was an insane one. Yeah. Yeah, obviously Davy did have a really, really strong draw anyway there. Yeah, sometimes you play magic, sometimes magic plays you. Yeah. Sometimes you play magic, and sometimes you play Hull Breacher. <laughs> Unfortunately. You play Hull Breacher into their brainstorm, and then they just go to die zone. Yeah. It's the zone where you die. <laughs> you know, your opponents have uh, flashed in the, the Hull Breacher against you before in your commander games, and it turns out it's just as bad when it happens early from a mox in a Canadian Highlander game. You don't so, even have other opponents to bargain with. Yeah, I'm, I don't know how many people have joined in the last five minutes, but if you, uh, yeah, if you've just gotten here, we saw, unfortunately, Matthew have to take a game loss for a deck list problem. So a tough way to start the, the round for Matthew, and then uh, David on the Blue Eyed Artifacts deck ramping into a Hull Breacher in response to Brainstorm. And that was that was basically that spelled was the end. Matthew tried to climb back in with a Prismari command there, but unfortunately it was too little too late. Okay, so we'd like to see the bracket now. That's our third quarterfinal. So we just saw David advance against Matthew. We're going to have one more quarterfinal featuring Jay Strimble and Jack Hanka. Yeah, and we see their, their deck names. Um, Seeker Walk Control refers to Spell, Seeker, and Time Walk. That's the uh, end game win condition for Jace's deck. Just Time Walk until the end of time. Yeah, you just present to your opponent that you're going to take all the turns. It's a it's a hard lock, similar to Time Vault, where you get to involves, Eternal um, Witness. Yeah, Eternal Witness. Or yeah. Just yeah, Eternal Witness, Ephemerate, Time Walk. Got it. That's about all you have to do. Um, although there's a bunch of other little backdoors to it. And then Jack's deck is basically Mono White. I believe we have planes, and then we have hybrid mana creatures. So we will see some non-white yeah, the, technical cards. Yeah, the blue and the some... green is for, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it, the 2-1. I heard there was a Dryad Militant. Yeah, Dryad Militant. And right, maybe, maybe Judge is Familiar or something. I remember could be. playing both those cards from the same set and getting Just into... Just the tiniest little sometimes. dash of blue-green. Yeah. Okay, so we'll look forward to one more semifinal, and then we're going to see all the matches today. Uh, once again, in this top eight of the Canadian Highlander League from Yellowjack Comics, brought to you by them and us here at Lunar Ray Run. Uh, shout out to all the Patreon sponsors, patreon.com forward slash LRR. And if you're interested in LRR merch, head on down to store.loaningrayrun.com. We've got, ending today, this uh, promotion where we're moving. And so there's some cool pins. And also, I'm not sure if there's a shirt but there's a bundle or some pins you can get. It's usually a shirt. To, uh, to acknowledge the, uh, the, the move into the next iteration of the moon base. So please Gotta do. buy a lot of rocket boosters. That's right. So please do check that out. Buy some pins so we can afford all of our rocket fuel. And we're, and we're going to come back. <laughs> send hydrazine. That's right. Don't, do not send hydrazine. <laughs> Don't send hydrazine, really. But, uh, um, <laughs> all right. Hey, Alex, it's been a lot of fun doing comedy. It has with been you. a lot of fun. I wish that second match was longer, obviously. But uh, we're going to swap our fluids and, in fact, swap our persons uh, into some different people for next round. You'll see some other commentators. You'll and, see a wheeler. Uh, a wheeler, that's right. A wheeler gets back. Okay, right after these messages. See ya. Hello, welcome back to the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship here on Loading Ready Run, brought to you by Loading Ready Run and Yellow Jacket Comics, with additional prize support from Dragon Shield. I'm Graham Stark, I'm back here in the booth, and I'm joined by Highlander Community Local, Trenton McIntyre. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm pleased to have you because, uh, you know, as, as you may have picked up from the earlier rounds, those following at home, I'm not as uh, deep into this format as other folks. I picked up a lot through osmosis from other folks around here, but... Uh, uh, you're going to be the one who's going to have to tell us what the heck's going on with these decks. I think if you picked up a deck, you'd, uh, you'd be slinging with the rest of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've, I've thought about it. It, lo it looks like a lot of fun. Uh, we're going into round four, our last quarterfinal, and we're looking at uh, Jace Thrimble on Seeker Walk Control. Sorry, Trimble, pardon me. Versus uh, Jack Hanneke on Death and Taxes. 
Yeah. How does this um, matchup look to you? This matchup's really intricate. It's really interesting. Um, Jack can set a lot of the tempo for how things are going to pan out. The cool thing about Highlander is that uh, both these players have been playing these decks for a long, long time. Uh, Jack's been playing Death and Taxes for 10 years. Jace has been playing this deck as long as I've known them. So we're going to have a really good match here. Um, right. Both of these uh, players are respective experts of these decks that they've built. And mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see that through their play style and also the cards that they've picked. They both uh, have put a lot of care and love into their deck and their archetype. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting a really good match. What's the sort of... Um, what are these decks trying to do? How do these decks win? Um, so, Death and Taxes looks like a mono-white deck, but it's uh, sort of a mix of aggression and uh, control of the game state. Uh, so, Jack is playing a lot of cards that interrupt what Jace is doing. Um, Jace, on the other hand, is going to be looking to control the board and manage life total. Uh, and then eventually either uh, attack for lethal through uh, like really good evasive creatures or get up on card advantage with a lot of the two-for-ones that he's put into his list. Mm -hmm. uh, or he can uh, combo kill with uh, Spellseeker and Time Walk. Uh, you play Spellseeker, get Ephemerate, you blink it, get Time Walk, and then you're sort of off to the races. Uh, an interesting thing about Jace's list compared to other Seeker Walk lists is... Uh, since the creatures are a little better than some of the other lists that we've seen in the past, Jace can just kill with a time walk. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in previous lists, you'd be playing like one mana, one, one elves and stuff, but uh, in this list, he actually can kill. So, yeah, uh, Jack is going to. Uh, a lot of uh, the game state is going to be dependent on what Jack plays. All right. If he's playing Thalia, Jace is going to have uh, a harder time. A lot of his uh, deck is spell based, and he's playing a lot of permission too, so if Jack can get under that permission, uh, and maintain a really solid board state, then Jace might have a hard time coming back from that. Okay. Well, it sounds like the players are ready to go, so let's head on over to Studio C and uh, check out round four, the last quarterfinal round. Now, we don't know, actually, you and I, if the players have taken mulligans or anything, so I'm curious if we can get that information. But you can see that Jack is on the draw, or play, pardon me. Yeah, and you can already see that uh, these players have foiled out a lot of their decks. Is that Ancient Tomb dealing two there? Into yeah. what's this? That's an Archon of Ameria. Uh, so it's going to slow down uh, Jace's game plan of being able to ponder, cast multiple spells and, and turns, etc. Mm. Jack is definitely better set up to... Um, to play one spell a turn. And then also the non-basic lands entering tapped is a really big deal too. Since Jace is playing four colors, there's not a whole lot of basics to go around. Right. So Jace is cracking a fetch here. And looking for a triome. I've yet to see a fetch today not grab a <laughs> triome, I think. Yeah, triomes a really big deal for the mana bases in Canadian Highlander. Mm -hmm. They fix a lot of the issues in the past that uh, we've had sort of managing four-color mana bases. Even three-color has gotten quite a lot better. It also lets you play more fetch lands, um, which a lot of the time can be quite helpful with Deathrite Shamans, etc. You know, your Grim Lava Mancers, those types of things. So, uh, yeah, the Triumphs have been a huge, huge addition to Highlander ever since they got printed. And I know people are really excited about the Triumphs that just came out in um, New Capenna as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say just. I suppose that was that was the deck a year ago now, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Turn two Archon seems like a pretty strong play from the Death and Taxes player. It's a it's a really good play. Well, there's time, time walk. walk here. <laughs> uh, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. This Sometimes it's two mana draw a card. <laughs> Yeah, this isn't ideal. Um, you definitely want to leverage it when you have stuff in play, but um, this is actually an interesting way to sort of get around the Archon of Amiria tapping your lands. Um, because you're gaining that uh, extra turn, you you can take the sort of turn off to play the scrub land. Mm. Oh, and Archon attacks also. Oh, yeah, it's a 2-3 flyer. The, the card does so much. <laughs> What's this land from Jack over here? Um, it's so foily, and it has a counter it on it. It has a counter on it. I'm not sure. 
Uh, it's worth noting as well, the Ancient Tomb damage from Jack isn't going to matter that much. Right. Uh, Jace generally doesn't uh, have uh, a high amount of pressure on the life total, especially in the early stages of the game. So. Oh, is that Cavern of Souls? Oh, yeah. Oh, naming human. Mm -hmm. I see. And so then casting... Um, the, the recruit that was from Dominaria United, I don't recall the... Resolute Reinforcement. Thank you. Yeah, it makes uh, the 1-1 one, one plus an additional 1-1. One, one. Uh, right. Looks like uh, Jace spell colored it, though. And yeah. That, that still works, because spell color takes the spell. It doesn't counter it. Or it exiles the spell, rather. Right. Jack might be a little mana flooded here. Is that a Yav Oh yeah, Yavamaya Hollow. Mm -hmm. On Jace's side there. Worth noting the Triumphs make things like Yavamaya Hollow a lot more playable in four, like decks like four color because your mana base is so much better than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Scavenging Ooze is met with that's solitude. solitude. Yeah. <laughs> Flash lifelink when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target creature. That creature's controller gains life equal to its power. Exiling spell queller, allowing Jack to cast resolute reinforcements. And this is a huge tempo swing for Jack. Um, there's nothing in the graveyard yet for the scavenging us to eat, so it's just the two two. Um, the lifelink is now. Why didn't the reinforcements get cast there? Because the spell. Queller didn't die, or oh, Archon says it can't be. Yeah, you can't cast the second spell that turn. Right, I see. Excellent. Yeah, Archon is symmetrical, so. Oh, so it's fair. Yeah, it, well, <laughs> 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 some would say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like this attack from Jack. Um, the scavenging use is only going to become a problem later on. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely one of the creatures that can outscale what you're doing uh, on the ground. And your solitude is, has done its work. Like, he's, you've just gotten your clean two for one. You get in there for two. Uh, we'll just see what Jack has to follow up with. Gaining some life off the, to off the solitude as well. Yeah, the life's actually not that irrelevant because uh, I, I know I said before that the ancient tomb was pretty good because Jace doesn't threaten the life total, but at some point it does start to matter. Yeah. And uh, Jack has a silent, silent clearing as well, so two of his lands hurt him when he mm. tries to cast spells. That's another to Ancient Tomb mana. Oh, yeah. Ranger Captain Evios. Uh, so this is this creature is really good against what Jace is looking to do. Um, Jace has a lot of non-creature spells. Mm. Um, and uh, the 3-3 three, body is pretty relevant. Uh, and <laughs> getting getting the one mana card is also uh, really, really relevant. It lets, it lets Jack keep up with any two-for-ones that Jace have, has of his own. What one-mana creatures is Jack looking for here? What's um, on the list? He might look for uh, some sort of Mother of Runes variant. Uh, I could see that. He could also grab something a little more aggressive, like a oh. Dryad Militant, for example. Dryad yeah. Militant, there we go. Uh, so it looks like Jack values the aggression on, on the Militant. Um, and he didn't cast it there because of the Archon. Right. So we're back to Jace's turn here. Jace looks like has a mana leak and a green sun zenith in hand. Tapping out for the zenith. Zenith for three. Interesting. We'll have to see what Jace uh, is looking to get. Jack is still shuffling from tutoring up the militant. You get a lot of shortcutting in Canadian Highlander. <laughs> Everyone's just sort of used to it. It's like, look, I'm going to be shuffling for a while. You may just yeah. go ahead. And t you may just you may as well just take your turn. When you're shuffling a hundred double sleeve cards, <laughs> it oh, takes a little while. Yeah. We uh, we call it uh, big hand advantage. Right. Back, back in the lodge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so will Jace be looking for the spell seeker of of the deck name or something else? So Jace can't find spell seeker because he has to find a green creature. Right. Um, he could find Eternal Witness, um, and that looks like Leovold, Corsair of Crucifix, yeah. Yeah. Corsair seems like a pretty good, pretty good pick there. 
Yeah, this is a good addition to Jace's board state. Um, all Jace really needs is card advantage here. Um, and the fact that this keeps uh, Jack from substantially threatening Jace's life total is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Also, it's one of the only creatures that can just profitably block a uh, Ranger Captain of Eos. Uh, a lot of Jace's creatures are um, three threes or three twos. Uh, so the advantage that Jack would be getting from just being able to get in with the Ranger Captain is mitigated. Right. This, sorry, more very Highlander moments. Jace is shuffling Jack's <laughs> deck from back when Jack tutored for the Dryad Militant. <laughs> and vice versa while looking for the Corsair of Crufix. If you so. like shuffling, this is the format for you. On the top of Jace's library, which is now revealed thanks to Corsair of Crufix, we have an Amonkhet Invocation. Um, I believe that might be a Vindicate. Okay. Might be a Counterspell. It's, it's blue, certainly, from the, the little details on the side of the frame. But I'm not sure precisely which, which one. That, stifle? Is, oh. it, is it Stifle? I'm not sure if it's... Uh, do we have the uh, Invocation... Or it'll be in your list if it is, Alex. Anyway. Uh, if, if it's a Stifle, Stifle's a little late here. Yeah. And it looks like a Misty Rainforest on top here for Jace. Jack just plays the Dryad Militant and passes. Um, the choice to get the Militant uh, is a little... Um, isn't really working out for Jack here because of the uh, presence of the Corsair of Crufix. Mm -hmm. Probably would have been better to get like a Mother of Runes variant if possible. Um, but I do, in the moment, based on the information Jack had, I, I actually like getting the Militant. You want to close the game out as quick as you can, because Jace's deck is designed to sort of win a longer attrition battle. Good to know. So that land went into play, gained a life. There's an Assassin's Trophy on top of Jace's library now. We're back over to Jack. The Assassin's Trophy knowledge is really relevant for Jack, too. Um, the Archon is still a pretty big part of his game plan. Uh, a large part of what Jace is trying to do is to pull ahead by casting multiple two-for-ones in multiple turns. Mm. And the Archon keeping Jace at bay has been a really important part of this game. Uh, so Jace being able to kill the Archon and then start to um, sling together spell after spell uh, is really like not where Jack wants Jace to be. So, oh, we have a... Oh, I think that's a Dromar's Charm into a, uh, yeah, into a fight. I believe it's called Fight is One. It gives Indestructible and plus one, plus one. Yep. Oh, wow. That's a cool addition from Ikoria. So Assassin's Trophy's been drawn. Caracas is now on top. Draws, or plays the Caracas, rather. Yeah. Verdant Catacombs now on top. And we can see the work that this Corsair has been doing. Like, it's already drawn Jace multiple cards. It's helped to mitigate the land, lands entering tapped claws. Uh, and it looks like we have a Ephemerate, I believe, from Jack. Uh, this Ephemerate's pretty relevant. Jace isn't going to be able to cast anything after this Assassin's Trophy, which might have been part of his game plan. Mm -hmm. This is the Japanese Mystical Archive yeah. <laughs> Ephemerate blinking the Archon to save it. Uh, so if Jack casts this Ephemerate on his turn, he's not going to be able to cast yeah. anything from hand. But he can Ephemerate the Ranger Captain Vios. And if he does, he can get a one drop that might be a little bit more significant. Oh, with the rebound, right? Yes, yes. yeah. Of course. Um, but it still counts as casting, so he isn't able to cast a second spell on his own turn. Well, apparently that was a Void Rend earlier. Oh, a Void Rend, okay. Yeah, instead of the Tromor's Charm. There it is, right, it's the new yeah, Capenna yeah. <laughs> Void Rend. Goodness gracious. I guess I was just wishing that it was Tromor's Charm, yeah. <laughs> You're allowed to wish for things. Um, yeah, this is an interesting decision. Depending on the context of Jack's hand, he might not want to cast the Ephemerate. Like, there might be a more impactful spell mm -hmm. that he's looking to work towards. Um, sort of based on the 
context of the way that he's played, um, my guess is that he'll probably just ephemerate the uh, Ranger Captain of Eos, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it's like, oh, he's sti oh, Jace is stifling the trigger. Stifling the trigger of the ephemerate. Interesting. Hmm. All right. The stifle and the Assassin's Trophy should also be in exile thanks to Dryad Militant. It's, it's, it's being pointed out. Yeah, yeah, that's relevant. Um, yeah. We definitely want our table judge to make sure that uh, those are exiled. Jace has a lot of way to a lot of ways to get cards back from the graveyard. So, mm -hmm. that, that information is being <laughs> passed their way. There we go. They got perfect, it. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. That's fair. Yeah, Dryad Militant does have an ability. <laughs> yeah. Most people play it as a 2 1, but it, it has a relevant ability. So, because Jace stifled the uh, rebound trigger, Jack just gets to cast the spell this turn. Armageddon. Wow. Hmm. This is an interesting decision point from Jack. Um, the knowledge that Jace is for sure going to draw a land off this Verdant Catacombs and does get to retain. The Core Surf crew fix as well means that he's more likely to be able to get out of this. Um, but I think Jack has assessed that this is... Um, That's got to be worthwhile. It's got to be worthwhile, right? Yeah. Like his, his board state is definitely better uh, suited to this. And his deck is built to work around Armageddon's. And the Archon delays the fetch land for another turn as well. Oh, yeah. That's actually a great point. So, Jace... Cracking the fetch and upkeep to not draw whatever that is on top of the yep. board there. And what what land? Uh, Jack did play a land that turn? or why Yeah, did he just played a out? modal double-faced card. I believe oh, okay. it's the Emeria. Ah. Um, interesting decision point for Jace here, whether or not he gets a basic land or a triumph. I think, just briefly, for the benefit of those watching at home, I believe that was more Highlander shortcutting as uh, Jack had to turn the card around in the sleeve. So he oh, just yeah, would have said, yeah, I'm yeah. playing a Myria, go. <laughs> and then futzing with the sleeve before playing it, which is why it only just appeared there during Jace's turn. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, that, that's a classic Highlander shortcut. You just <laughs> tell them what you're going to do, and then you pass the turn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Jace gets a Swamp here, um, which indicates to me that he is looking to cast something this turn. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're most likely looking to get um, another Triumph. Um, because of the nature of Armageddon, you have you don't have the mana, you don't you don't know what you're going to hit off Corsair, so getting a bunch of colors of mana is generally what you're looking to do. Uh, so Jace draws an endurance. I think we just spot yeah, I was going to say spotted an endurance on mm -hmm. top. This th we've seen a lot of these incarnations today, and they're uh, pretty frightening. There's an ephemerate now on top of Jace's deck, and a Sedgemore Witch. There, a card I know. <laughs> It looks like they're just playing Drago. This is sort of how Jack um, uh, drew it up when he was casting the Armageddon. I was going to say, this this has to have been the plan. It was Absolutely. Soldier of the Pantheon. Fascinating. And every creature that Jack can add to the board is uh, more and more relevant uh, because he starts to get to um, Alpha Swing. Which is what's happening now. We've got Ranger, Captain, Soldier of the Pantheon, and the Archon in. So that's in for five. Soldier of the Pantheon down. And I really like that attack from Jack. Um, you want to give Jace as little time as possible to come back from this situation. And indeed, Jace cannot. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's death and taxes doing the death and taxes thing. Nobody gets to play magic but me. <laughs> well, and uh, I come back to... Um, it isn't just a mono-white deck, right? Like, it can go long. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel like your traditional sort of mono-white aggro, right? Where you're right. playing a bunch of one-drops, and then you just get in for as much damage as possible. Um, Death and Taxes is designed to sort of be able to play both games, right? Uh, in uh, other Magic formats, it's described as aggro control sometimes, or mm. uh, even in Legacy for a while, they were describing it as a control deck, uh, even though it just plays a bunch of small white creatures. Uh, but yeah, uh, Jack's, Jack's game plan there, uh, he stuck to it. Uh, the turn two Archon was relevant for the entire game. Super relevant, so yeah. So relevant. <laughs> and he also... Uh, has set up his deck in ways to protect the creatures that end up mattering 
the most in the matchup. Mm. Uh, because of the nature of Highlander, uh, you don't know which creature you're going to have in play that's going to matter the most to your opponent, right? right. Some opponents, Containment Priest doesn't matter to them. Or some opponents, the Archon might not matter to them. But another creature does. And if you're playing these Ephemerates, the Fight as Ones, these protection spells that keep those key creatures alive, uh, then you get to continue to enact your game plan against a variety of different archetypes instead of just hoping that they don't die. Right. right? Now, in the next game, Jace presumably will be on the play, unless, yeah, unless he wants to choose to draw with that <laughs> he'll, he'll definitely take the play, for All sure, right. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, game one, Jack was on the play and was able to, you know, like we said, Come out swinging, in so far as swinging was playing that archon, which again was relevant for the whole game. What what do you, what's Jace hoping to do on the play? Um, so because of the nature of Jace's permission in his deck, like the counter spells, the mana leaks, etc., I think a lot of it's going to hinge on um, Jace is going to probably try to keep two mana open on turn two because mm -hmm. a lot of his hands will lend itself to trying to counter the first thing that Jack does. All right, and we're already underway. Oh wow! With a uh, with with a fetch land, I assume because that changeover was so quick that both players kept seven. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's my <laughs> assumption anyway. And then um, Jace's uh, essential game plan is going to be to counter anything super relevant that Jack does and to delay um, Jack's progression of his game plan with removal as well. Right. And then eventually uh, try to win with an overwhelming amount of two-for-ones uh, or to uh, get six mana into play and then cast Spellseeker and win from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we'll see how this plays out as Jace goes to second turn. Is that a basic planes on the other side of the table? It is, yeah. It's rare to see basics today. Yeah. <laughs> Another basic planes? Jack has the planes that he likes, and he's got them all foil and signed. And again, that's just one of the cool parts of the format. You get to really, as we see in Containment Priest. Yeah. Uh, the Priest isn't super, super relevant in this matchup. Um, like, Jace has a lot of ways to kill it, but it does stop the Spellseeker combo. Oh, that's true. Yeah. It's a Castle Ardenvale, I think. If I'm... Yep. Yeah, that is. Yep. Yeah. And then, uh... Ether Sworn Canonist? No. Yeah, we see Jace oh, holding up the mana for a disallow. Uh, yeah, it is the Canonist, yeah. it was disallowed. So this is sort of the game plan that Jace is looking to have. Um, he's not under an extensive amount of pressure. He ha he's been hitting his land drops. He has uh, more than enough mana to choose what to do. A lot of his deck interacts at instant speed. Uh, so we'll see how Jack can manage uh, the fact that Jace now does have the amount of resources that he's looking for to push through his game plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the previous game, we saw that Jace was behind resources basically the entire game because of the presence of the Archon. Um, but this time, Jack doesn't have anything uh, like that. Uh, so even though con the Containment Priest stops the Spellseeker combo, um, Jace sh is in a decent position to continually uh, cast two-for-ones and enact his game plan until he gets to a point where he'll be able to kill the Containment Priest and then go for the win. Gotcha. Uh, I see people are asking for deck lists. I believe this is round four, right? Yes, so they'll be Wait, made public yeah. after. I mean, I guess I guess it could be now because both players are already in the match, but uh, they'll be made, be made made public after this round. A reminder that today's uh, tournament, unlike most tournaments that we broadcast from the moon base here, is uh, being judged at competitive uh, rules, and so uh, there was uh, we didn't have public deck lists. Uh, nobody knew what the other ones, what the others were playing until. They sat down across from them, though 
again, as you mentioned, Jack has played Death and Taxes for years, Jason has played this <laughs> deck for years, you know, there are some assumptions that could be made from a, from a metagame perspective, but strictly speaking... <laughs> yeah, there, there are some Highlander top eights you might see where people don't know what's going on, but yeah. the, this top eight, there's a lot of people who are specialists in their archetypes, so... Uh, we had a Sun Gold Sentinel from Jack, and it looks like a... Mystical Teachings? Yeah. From Jace there? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know yes. what that's getting, though. Oh, I guess we'll find out in a moment. Sun Gold Sentinel. Force of Will. Ah. Force of Will. Sun Gold Sentinel needs uh, Coven, which obviously Jack does not currently have. It's hypothetically possible. Or maybe it's just it's a... Maybe it's just an inefficient 3-2, I don't know. The the Coven actually works uh, a decent amount of time. You okay. have a lot of varied uh, power in uh, Death and Taxes. and I, I've learned after playing against this card in Standard for a little while that you should not underestimate it. It, mm. it definitely packs a punch. Uh, exiling the card from the graveyard is pretty relevant, too, against Chase. Mm -hmm. Courser of Crufix. And there's that Courser again. Let's search for Ascanta on top of Jace's deck now. We'll see what Jack has to be able to deal with this Courser. Um, oh, and he's getting in there. Now, 3-2, there's an attack trigger to exile the Mystical Teachings, but the... Okay, I was going to say, the Courser just blocks and eats the Sun Gold Sentinel. Oh, I oh, see. Oh, interesting. So we're using Walking Ballista. Oh. Yeah, we had a follow-up Walking Ballista, but Jace was forced to pulling it. Exiling uh, the uh, Nimble Obstructionist, it looks yes, like? Yes, yes. Yeah. Meat Hook Massacre <laughs> on top of the deck now. So the plan there was to Walking Ballista and pick off the last point of damage on the Courser of Krufix, I assume. Yeah, and as we can see in that last game, the Courser was really, really good for Jace, even though he, uh, Jack ended up being able to take it. Like, the Courser was instrumental in him being in the game at all. I believe that's a Tamiyo? Ah. Uh, yeah, the Field Oh, right, researcher. with the hat. Yeah. <laughs> it's the hat confused me. Right, Tamiyo Field Researcher, okay. Um, the knowledge of this Meat Hook Massacre is um, really, really relevant here. Mm -hmm. Um. This, card, this is one of Jace's best cards against what Jack's doing. Uh, and because Jace's board state is already um, relatively strong, uh, Jack will have a hard time dealing with it. But this, this Palace Jailer is amazing. Oh, excellent. So Palace Jailer eating Courser of Crufix. Uh, Jack gains the, gains the monarchy. And was Tamiyo's plus one only if d damage was dealt to Jace or just deals damage? I'm curious if... Okay, well, there was no attack anyway. I, I assume then that it was just if it deals damage. Um, I, I appreciate that Monarch token, by the way. That's a very funny joke. <laughs> yeah, that's a good Monarch token for sure. Yeah. This, this Monarch um, is extremely relevant because the Meat Hook Massacre um, being so good against Jack, the Monarch is one of the best ways for him to get back into the card, like the equivalent card exchange with Jace. Right. Uh, and also, Jace doesn't have a really good way to attack it. Um, most of his creatures are, like, summoning sick when they come into play. We've already seen him use Nimble Obstructionist, so I think he only has one, one or two more Flash creatures. Uh, and de generally, Jack is better at fighting the creature fight anyways, so this Monarch should be really, really strong for Jack. Uh, and Jace is going to have to come up with some creative ways to... Um, get it back. Uh, and we see a Stoneforge for a... Ooh. Cauldra complete. Ooh. Okay. Seven mana, but that's, you know, Stoneforge helps with that. Well, I mean, Jack's at five lands. That's like, true. He, he might just get there. He might just get there, yeah. <laughs> Second spell for the turn here. Oh, shoot. What is that? I'm surprised I don't know this one. Uh, oh, that's new. That's from March of the Machine. That's why. That's the. Um, uh, it's. It, it it cares about Phyrexian creatures. Phyrexian <laughs> sensor. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. This is this is this is brand new, as of this weekend, pre-release weekend. Yeah. Two and a white for a three three Phyrexian wizard. Each player can't cast more than one non-Phyrexian spell each turn, so sort oh, of wow. doing the same thing as the Archon. Yeah, and yeah. And non-Phyrexian creatures enter the battlefield tapped. 
Wow, this card is sweet. Um, that Timeless Witness should be tapped. Yep. Um, yep, there we go. There we go. It's like, <laughs> like they could hear us. <laughs> they can't, but it's like they could. And the Tamiyo keeping uh, Jack's two creatures tapped down. This is a way for Jace to get the Monarch back. Um, sure. We'll see if Jack has follow-up creatures or any way to deal with the Timeless Witness. Is that Tamiyo's minus ability, I assume? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it, it ices two creatures. Oh, nice. Okay. Do we know what uh, Jace got back with the Timeless Witness? I missed it. I was so <laughs> distracted by Phyrexian Sensor. <laughs> Force of Will. It was the Force oh, of Will. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I, that, that makes sense. So we have an Archon here, so people really can't cast more than one spell. Yeah. Archon <laughs> entering tapped, not being a Phyrexian. Yeah. And is that the Force going away again? No. Something got destroyed. Yeah, it over looks there. like. Uh, okay, yeah. It, uh, force pitching Search for Escanta. The Search for Escanta is probably just a little too slow here. And, yeah. Uh, Continuing to draw lands off the Monarch, though it looks like. That might have been Jack's last turn as king. Uh, although, you know, two mana up. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, Jace having this Tamios um, definitely swinging the tides of combat for him in terms of being able to take the Monarch. Mm -hmm. Jace continuing to keep those two tapped down. And oh. we're looking at a uh, removal spell of some oh. sorts. <laughs> I saw. Sorry, Alex is running card reader. Was very oh, excited to see harm's, harm's way. Harm's way. Oh my goodness! And then uh, saw in half. Okay. In wow. response. Wow. All right. Saw in half <laughs> from Unfinity. Shout out to Kathleen for the flavor text. Uh, goodness, it's amazing to see this in Highlander. So destroy a creature. If that creature dies, its controller creates two tokens that are copies, but power and toughness are half rounded up. So those are two. One one, eternal witnesses, timeless witnesses, correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! And that flavor text is incredible. So there's a meat hook trigger, and uh, oh my goodness! So yeah, two timeless witness copies. Wow! What an amazing interaction. We never thought we'd see Saw in half. <laughs> in response to a harm's way of all things. Is, is the the thing that the character and the art doing what you do when you saw in half your own creature? You I just guess, raise yeah. Your arms up? Look upon me. It looks like that, that guy's got a, a chainsaw for a hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really cool interaction. I'm not sure what Jace got back with the Thomas Witness triggers. I don't even know if we've resolved those triggers yet. Yeah. I think I think uh Jace is currently making sure to correctly represent those copies. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it looks like we've got the... It looks land like a, and the Force of Will? Yeah, fetch land and yeah. a Force of Will, it seems. And I think we just saw there's another blue card in Jason's hand, but I don't know if Jack is... I don't know if that's open yeah, information. Yeah, it, it does. It looks like it's a... Uh, oh, um, uh, uh, it's the one from... Oh, uh, Mission Briefing. Thank mission you. Briefing. Yeah. I totally yeah, yeah. know it. I was it's like, like oh, shoot, what is that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, blue, blue, whatever, yeah, okay. White Plume Adventurer from Jack now. This is a really interesting choice to introduce the initiative as well. <laughs> yeah, we got um. Monarch and Initiative. <laughs> That's true, Jack never lost the never lost the crown. Nope. So nope. Jack He's now up on cards. has the Monarch and the Initiative. This, uh... <laughs> well, and, uh, this land from the Initiative is so important because it gets Jack to six this turn, which means next turn Jack is threatening to cast Cauldre Complete. Right. So Jace is going to have to be cognizant of that. Now, he, Jace does have the Force of Will to deal with it, but um, since Jack is drawing so many cards uh, and Jack has a pretty decent board presence, uh, Jace has to consider Monarchy, Initiative, and uh, the Cauldron Complete in uh, Jack's hand. Mm -hmm. And that's just a lot to keep up with. Like the, There's a lot of decisions that are going to be made. And it was pointed out by chat that that germ token will enter untapped because it is, it is a Phyrexian. They've, oh! Yeah. They've oracled. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> Trenton and Alex both looking very excited because, yes, they've oracled the germs to be Phyrexian. Oh, now. that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Potentially very relevant. Jack, Jack is playing Phyrexian tribal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, so we're back to Jace now after a... 
whirlwind of a couple turns. Yeah. Now, why is Stoneforge untapped all of a sudden? What did I miss? Oh, was that to do with the, the initiative? Yes. Yeah. Ah. The initiative uh, ability on White Plume lets you untap one creature. Right. Uh, unless you've completed a dungeon. Then so you're untapping everyone. We may be looking at flashing in Cauldra here. Yep. Wow. And that Phyrexian token being untapped is huge. <laughs> it's it's so big for Jack. Wow. So this is a 5-5 a five five with First Strike, Trample, Indestructible, and Haste. And Cauldre Complete itself is indestructible. Well, and the White Plume being able to untap the Stone Forge so that Jack can put the Cauldre in play and get around the Force of Will mm -hmm. is such a heads-up play. Okay, so Jace is attacking so that uh, he can take the initiative and the monarchy. Which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. So gets Courser back, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, he gets Courser of Krufix back. It comes into play tapped, and then he's going to find a basic land from the initiative. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. The, the White Plume ability was actually unbelievably relevant there. Mm -hmm. Um when you look at White Plume, you you really see the flashy things, right? Yeah. Like it gives you the initiative. It's a 3-3. Three, three. It's only three mana. Um, but the untap ability uh, can actually be quite, quite relevant in Death and Taxes. There are a lot of uh, creatures that have really good like tap abilities. And then also, just due to the nature of your deck, a lot of the time you're racing uh, to see who gets across the finish line first. And being able to give your creature pseudo-vigilance is a really big deal. Right. Uh, so Jace gets a swamp here. If we accept the meta flavor explanation that a game of magic is a duel between two wizards. I love the idea that they are now also doing that while running through a dungeon. <laughs> With a crown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're playing like uh, King, King of the Hill yeah. <laughs> in a dungeon, <laughs> slinging spells. Your courser's uh, crashing through walls, so it's tapped for the turn. It can't <laughs> a centaur's got to have a hard time in a dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> so little headroom. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see what Jace flips with this courser here. Creeping Tarpet, that's pretty relevant. Oh, okay. It's a uh, land if also. So. If you're going to flip a land, that's that's a land that is um, is definitely one of the better ones. Well, I had not seen the showcase Adam Paquette Creeping Tarpet. That is that is some creep. Oh, yeah. That's a that's a creepy it, tarpet. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. Fantastic card. Now, having said that, it looks like. Having just shuffled, it looks like Jace immediately cracked Tarn to go looking for a basic instead of the yeah Jace is, sh shuffling the tarpit away. Jace has probably identified that he needs more than just being able to play a tarpit. Right, like he needs something else. Um, we'll see what Jace decides to do with the forcible slash mission briefing in his hand. Um, it, the mission briefing is his only blue card, um, but he might end up deciding that he just needs to go for a bigger play. Mm. Uh, his graveyard as well isn't actually fully stocked. Uh, I believe it's just lands at this point. Um, there might be a saw in half. Mm. Uh, so that's something to consider as well. And, and an eternal witness. Yes, uh, but you can't get that back with the mission briefing. No, no. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I so didn't realize you were I missed that you were talking about mission briefing specifically, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was just naming cards. <laughs> There is the seven mana ability of the um, Timeless Witness to come back eternalized. Yeah. So that, that's something Jack has to think about as well. Baleful Strix, Baleful Strix, pardon me, words tumbling out of my mouth <laughs> uh, on top of Jace's deck. The, the Baleful Strix is actually pretty good. Yeah. It, a, a lot of presence on the battlefield. We have um, now reached the mid-game of this match where the turns are long and complicated. There's just so much to upkeep, right? You've yeah. got Monarch Initiative um, abilities that are intrinsic to both of them. Is that a... What is what is that on top of Jace's deck now? That's an Abrupt Decay. Oh, yes, thank yeah. you. So, in with the Germ. I'm curious to see how Jace is going to uh, deal with this Cauldre Complete. Yeah. Jace down to 10 now. So, Monarch and Initiative back to Jack. 
Yeah, and the, the college are complete. It's amazing at taking back the Monarch and the initiative. Uh, and now that Jack isn't being pressured by the Tamiyo field researcher abilities, mm -hmm. he's actually going to be able to keep creatures back to start blocking Chase's um, attackers that are taking back the initiative and the Monarch. So. And what's the second room of the Underdark? Uh, so you can choose uh, a player to lose five life or you can scry two. Right, so uh, Jack scryed two. It looks like put both on the bottom. Mm -hmm. sure. You don't get a lot of card selection in mono white, mm. so sometimes uh, that's where you, where you need to be. Sure. So that was uh, Mother of Runes being cast by Jack and then being Force of Willed there. Yeah, and then we have a... Um, uh, Cave of the Frost Dragon, I yeah. believe it's called. It's uh, You can activate it for five mana, make a 3-4 flyer. I adore this particular card frame. <laughs> super cool, super cool. <laughs> Shout out to D&D. &D. Yeah. Uh, and Jack's also going to be, be able to make a Castle Arden Veil token here at mm -hmm. the end of Chase's turn. Um, I'd say if we had a advantage meter, Jack would be slightly advantaged here um, based on the current board state. Uh, that being said, Jace has a lot of lands in play, and he has a lot of ways to draw cards. Tons of 2 for ones in his deck, and uh, he could easily draw something like a Toxic Deluge that could totally open up the game. He just drew what looked like a, I think it was a Celestial Colonnade? It was one yeah. of the creature lands. It was Celestial Colonnade, yeah. yes. And then now revealing some manner of secret lair nonsense on top of his <laughs> library. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, it looks like a counterspell of some sorts. <laughs> yeah. Jack cast Solitude there, exiling the Courser. Oh, wow. And now everything's untapping. So Jace is up to 13, but is down a Courser. And the only creature Jace has untapped is the 1-1 one, one Eternal It's been Dilling Click on top. Cool. Oh, OK. What's Jack's middle creature? Uh, the Phyrexian Sensor, I believe, is what you're looking for. Yeah. from. Uh, right to left, he has a, the Germ Token, Phyrexian Sensor, White Plume, Adventurer? Yeah, and uh, Solitude. Uh, Solitude Stone and Stoneforge, yeah. Um, I'd be interested to see if Jack has drawn more cards than Jace in this game. Somebody can go to the yeah. tape. I, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, I've lost count. <laughs> so this is a big attack here from Jack in with the White Plume Adventurer, the Phyrexian Sensor, and the Cauldre Complete. Jace chumping with the 1-1... One, one Eternal Witness token copy, and this will be taking six, uh, assuming that was the block that I he, thought it was. So the Caldra Complete has Trample. Oh, so okay, so the Caldra he Caldra blocked the Phyrexian Sensor yeah, and took, dies, took, yeah. Caldra, took damage from Caldra and the White Plume there instead, okay. Checking out Jace's Graveyard. Going to five. Ravages is... of War. Oh, What if wow. no one had land anymore? That is That would incredible. leave Jace with a Baleful Strix and a Meat Hook Massacre. Uh, Jace nope, just that's it. it up. Yeah. Holy moly. Ravages both games from Jack Hanukkah. Turns out mass land destruction when you've already set yourself up to be in a commanding board state uh, does the job. Yeah, and again, we can really see a mastery of uh, deck from Jack in terms of like when he played played the White Plume, he was introducing the, in, introducing the initiative on turns where Jace could have potentially taken it, right? Yeah, it seemed like a scary moment in the game to to yeah to introduce that large incentive to uh, to be to be attacked. <laughs> well, if you and if you're um, if you're new to that uh, archetype or um, you know Highlander in general, you might not make that play because on the surface it it, it looks wrong. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Jack being a consummate expert of his archetype, he correctly assessed the situation, knew the risks, and just went for it, and he got rewarded. Um, and that's one of the coolest things about Highlander. You, you play one deck, and you're, you're totally chilling. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was our final quarterfinal match, so let's take a look at the bracket, if we could. So here's how it sits after the quarters. So... In round uh, five, we'll be seeing Robin Sorensen with Jessica Green Tempo versus Sasha Christensen with Omnitiative. Round six will be David Brunson with Blue White Artifacts versus the Death and Taxes list we just saw from Jack there. 
And then uh, two of those four people I just mentioned will be facing off in the finals. So we're going to take a quick break now, and we're going to come back to, once again, myself and Trenton uh, here in the booth for round five. Uh, don't go away. We'll be right back with more powerful magic here on the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship here on Loading Ready Run, brought to you by us at Loading Ready Run and Yellow Jacket Comics here in Victoria with some additional pride support from Dragon Shield. As a reminder, if you're just joining us, why 2022? Because this is the top eight finals of, well, not the finals yet, but this is the top eight of the 2022 season at Yellow Jacket Comics here in Victoria. 2023 season's already underway, and at some point in 2024, we'll get the finals for that. But uh, this... It's happening now in April because of reasons. Don't because worry of things. about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a weird time, he's said, for the last 10 years or so. <laughs> um, if, you're, uh, if you are just joining us, unfortunately you've missed the quarterfinals, but again, you can go check out the VOD and you should because it's a fun time with some powerful magic. Uh, just want to quickly remind everybody that everything we do here at Loading Ready Run is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. We really, really appreciate that. And that today is the last day to get the Moonbase Space Lines merchandise collection to help uh, celebrate the launch of Moonbase Mark VI because we're moving at some point. They're currently renovating as well. Not, it's Sunday, so not currently, but broadly speaking, they're renovated, renovating as we speak. By way of introduction, I just realized I should do that. I'm Graham Stark, joined by Trenton McIntyre. Hello. Hello. Pleasure to have you. Uh, this is going swimmingly today, but if you have th been thinking up until now, boy, these quarterfinals are great, but there's not enough games. Good news! <laughs> because in the semis and finals, we're now moving up to best of five. Five whole games. Yeah, very excited for this. And uh, let's take another quick look at the bracket, actually, just to remind you sort of how we got here. Uh, Robin Sorensen defeating Connor Hayward in the first round versus Sacha Christensen defeating Benjamin Wheeler in the first round as well. So we're looking at Jeskai Green Tempo versus Omnitiative. Boy, those are the same colors, Trenton. What are we expecting to see in this in this matchup? <laughs> uh, we're going to see a lot of similar cards, but the game plan of both is uh, a little different. Uh, Robin is definitely a tempo deck, wants to be in the forefront of uh, combat, you know, is playing cards like Electrostatic Infantry, mm -hmm. Prowess Creatures, etc. Uh, and then Sasha's going to play a little bit more of a controlling role, has a little bit of a deeper late game, but that we'll definitely see some similar card choices for sure. All Just right. different enacted game plans. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what, we have received word that both players are ready to go, and not only that, have kept sevens, so... Heck, let's just fire on over to Studio C and take a look at round five of the 2022 Highlander Championships. Oh, goodness. And we're already underway. They already had a turn there, <laughs> I Classic guess. Classic Highlander shortcutting. <laughs> uh, well, okay, hold on. What's going on here? We've got a Birds of Paradise. We've got, we've got a, a Triome in play. I think there was a miscommunication about when to start. All right, we've got, let me see, Flooded Strand over there, two dual lands. Uh... Ragavan. Dash Ragavan. Okay. And uh, this is the start that Sasha uh, is looking for. Uh, playing Birds of Paradise, Noble Hierarch, etc. Just to power out those initiative creatures and every other uh, like banger in his deck. Um, oh, Murktide Regent. Is that what got milled off there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Exile. Pardon yeah. me. Don't, don't, think, uh, don't think Sasha's casting that one this turn. No. And Death Red Shaman. Okay. This is just an all star of powerful one drop creatures like Birds of Paradise, Death Red Shaman, <laughs> Ragavan. Sasha's deck is just basically all of the best cards in these four colors, <laughs> is how I describe it. I mean, that's Highlander, and isn't all, it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, a lot of people make uh, different decisions based on either what they like to play or. Um, you know, what they think is more powerful, etc. And Sasha's Sasha just playing like Okos and Minskin Boos and Solitude and just all these cards that are just so good. Um, these all seem pretty good. So Exiling Flooded Strand from the <gasps> Graveyard. Ta that's just so much mana. What are we seeing here? we're seeing, seeing here? the namesake. <gasps> it's Omnath. Now, you would be forgiven for not knowing what this card does because there's no text on it. <laughs> uh, but this is the Omnath where, 
It has a series of landfall abilities. When a land enters the battlefield, you gain four life if it's the first time this resolve this turn. On the second time, you add four mana of those four colors. And the third time, Omnath deals four damage to each opponent and Planeswalker you don't control. Yeah, so generally you're going to see the first and second ability the most just because of the nature of fetch land interaction yeah. with it. But uh, sometimes you see the third ability come up. It happens. Yeah. Uh, some people asking for deck lists. Uh, we do have the uh, deck lists. Uh, the, the, the deck lists may now be made public. They are uh, heading, heading your way. Uh, we're seeing a memory lapse here from Robin and... Um, the URLs are too long, so the mods no. are working on it. Because <laughs> it turns out there's eight players with eight names and links to deck lists yeah. <laughs> are uh, a challenge for our chatbot. So uh, we'll, we're going to paste bin, but you'll have the deck lists very soon. Highlander fans, they're jonesing for any new deck lists. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll get them to you. Don't worry. As a reminder, <laughs> uh, it is pre-release weekend for March of the Machine. So it was determined that cards from Mom are legal in this particular top eight event. And uh, we so far, I think we've only seen one. But the, the Phyrexian sensor was pretty relevant in that uh, in, yeah. in uh, round four. It was super relevant. Yeah. Uh, so we, we saw memory lapse from Robin um, on the Omnath last turn. And now Robin just passed, it looks like. Oh, no. Uh, the Rogvon was played off of a treasure. So we're on Robin's uh, third turn here. Oh, and Fairy Mastermind, yes. Fairy Mastermind's appeared a couple times, actually. Oh, I, for yes. I forgot yeah. that was from March of the Machine. I just look at the art every time I see Yeah, like, just Yuta like, Takahashi. oh, there's Yuta Takahashi, so cool. yeah. yeah. Three Fairy. Yeah, the Three Fairy here isn't, uh, isn't unbelievable. Um, but I think Robin's just looking to buy a little time here. Oh, big Omnath is back again. Look at the thickness of this lad. <laughs> oh wow, and Sasha has the follow-up fetch land too. Oh boy. So he's gonna be able to make the mana and um without the fetch land he wouldn't be able to pressure the Teferi, but here if Sasha wants to, he can just dash the Rogavon and get in there. So playing the Misty Rainforest allowed Sasha to gain four life, and then the land that comes in from the Misty Rainforest is now adding red, green, white, blue to Sasha's mana pool. <sighs> Right. Um, I mean, when you name <laughs> your when you name your deck after a card, it better do it better do the work. It better be good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and oh my gosh, his own three fairy. No, this no, is this is the other fairy. one. This is the five mana. I'm yeah. sorry, right? Using all four of that mana and the land that was just fetched for, and we are drawing a card and untapping two cards on the end step. So, n opportunity to kill three mana to fairy. They're not going for it. Yeah, and I, I like this play from Sasha. You could kill the three mana to fairy, but honestly, you're um, creating such a like insurmountable board state that you're putting Robin in a really tough position. Mm -hmm. Like Robin's going to have to have a pretty specific series of uh, spells to really regain control of the tempo in this game. And um, when we look at the differences between the two decks, this is uh, a key one. Um, the tempo deck really does want to play from ahead and is really, really strong at pushing those advantages when you are ahead. Mm -hmm. But when you're behind, um, it, it's a lot harder to like gain the small advantages you need to eke out to turn the corner. True name, that's, that's going to help, though. Yeah, true name, uh, <laughs> gosh. It's only one point. What are the points in these decks, actually? We should, <laughs> we, should, uh, we should have talked about that. True name's only one point, but boy, is it annoying. Yeah, and it's one point because uh, otherwise you'd see ubiquity, ubiquity in all blue decks yeah. playing True Name, uh, and it is like quite powerful against specifically aggro. Mm -hmm. uh, I've definitely been on the receiving end of uh, losing to a True Name playing mono red or or what have you. Um, and this is one of the best cards Robin could have in this situation because it's such a unique card, and it's really hard for Sasha to deal with once it's actually in play. And what uh, what other point we we would have talked about it back in round one? But what other points do we know of in Robin's deck? I realize we don't have the deck list in front of us. Maybe I shouldn't have asked that um, question. It's possible that Robin is playing Ancestral Recall. Right. Um, temp Tempo does really well at turning a lot of small mana resources into 
like gaining an overwhelming advantage on your opponent, so Recall can really help you with that. It could be Time Walk as well. They both fit pretty pretty well into tempo decks. Mm -hmm. I just uh, mentioning that uh, Sasha attacking to ferry there with Omnath and Raghavan, true name just eating Raghavan. Yeah, at this point you don't really need the Raghavan, right? Like yeah. you know it's not getting through later, so. Um, Looks like the points for uh, Robin are Ancestral, uh, Managerain, True Name Nemesis, and Treasure Cruise. Right, of course. So Teferi there, that is a D6. So Teferi is up on six loyalty, not nine. <laughs> Just in case anyone was confused by the orientation <laughs> of that die. Oh, That's Sasha goodness. playing the awkward uh, post combat Lelia. <laughs> I mean, it, you probably you wouldn't be able to attack with it anyway. No, but still, Lelia, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Blade Reforged. Very cool card there. This true name actually is doing quite a lot of work here to keep Robin from falling too far behind. He definitely has avenues here to like come back and, and gain an advantage over uh, Sasha. And Monastery Mentor is a great one. Mm -hmm. Which Monastery Mentor, again, was just reprinted in... Uh, March of Machine. Oh, really? Yeah, at oh. just normally, just in the set. It wasn't one of the, because it's not legendary, so it wasn't one of the multiverse legends. <laughs> Monastery Mentor is just in the set at Mythic. It might be time to dust off some standard cards. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That's really cool. Monastery was, Mentor is one of my faves. I was very surprised to see that, yeah. So, um, yeah, excited to have Mentor back. Yeah, Mentor is definitely a way that um, Robin can come back into this game. Uh, Mentor is a pretty powerful card, and it can create like a really, really insurmountable amount of tokens at mm -hmm. some stage. Um, but we'll see what uh, Sasha has to deal with it. He could minus the Teferi. Um, it looks like he has a Pyrokinesis in hand, so if things get too out of hand, uh, he can just go for it. He's also uh, chilling with a counter spell, so... I like that there's... I just I just like playing a basic forest after the four dual lands <laughs> from Sasha there. Yeah, you just play three blue dual lands and a plateau and then <laughs> in the basic forest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, why not? So figuring out what to do here for mana. It's Minsk and Boo. I I, I like casting this Minsk and Boo here. Um, yeah. four mana. I forget I, it's only four mana. Yeah. This <laughs> This card slaps. It's really good. Uh, <laughs> this card's ridiculous. And you, uh, like, you get the satisfaction of getting to attack your opponent with a hamster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is satisfying. <laughs> so brainstorm from uh, Robin there makes a token from the monastery mentor, and then decides, yeah, the cards that I have here are not going to be enough. So yeah, scoops Robin it up. scoops them up. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing, uh, one of the coolest things about Robin. It uh, doesn't matter where he's playing. If he feels like he's not not going for it, he'll scoop him up. doesn't matter if it's in the top eight. A lot of people would play it out, and I mean, I would play it out, mm -hmm. personally. But I, Ro I'm <laughs> notorious for not conceding. Yeah. <laughs> but Robin, Robin is who Robin is, and yeah, he, yeah. he saw the right on the wall, and Sasha takes game one. Takes one, it takes game one of, again, of five. We're now at best of five in the semifinals, so... Sasha's got to win two more to take this match down. So plenty of opportunity for uh, Robin to mount a comeback here. Presumably Robin's going to be on the play now. Yeah, and uh, we don't really get to see best of five a lot in Highlander. Uh, and it's a real treat to be able to uh, see two decks battle it out over the course yeah. of potentially five matches. Mm -hmm. um, Robin's definitely going first. Uh I think uh, a really cool showcase in, in that uh, game from Sasha is the power of that turn one Birds of Paradise. Yeah. It was essentially a mox the entire game. Like, Sasha used the mana almost every single turn, um, and since Robin didn't have a way to kill it, he was down on mana essentially the entire game, right? So, uh, Sasha, like, ma making these de deck building considerations building towards Omnath and the initiative, uh, playing these noble hierarchs and, and these birds, and it really paid off for him there. Mm -hmm. For those watching in our live uh, chat, we do have the deck lists now. Um, 
MTV CDM has just posted. Uh, we're, we're still working on the pace bin for everyone's decks, but MTV CDM has just posted the link to these two decks specifically. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, we'll make sure that all eight of the deck lists are below in the description as well. Masray was asking, judges for this event, co-head judges, Nelson Salahub, who's currently sitting at the table, and uh, John Milsett, who was doing uh, judging for the first four rounds. And thank you to both of our judges. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Stellar job. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the pace bin is up. Excellent. So we have all the deck lists nice. as well for those watching live. Much appreciated. Um, <laughs> We haven't we haven't seen the good boy yet, the comet. As far as I can, oh wait, no, oh, we, we, know, we did. Yeah, we saw it earlier. Yeah, yeah we did yeah. see comet uh, rolling a four and dealing uh, five damage to something in uh, the. I think it was Sasha's match against Wheeler. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, dealt four damage to a um, two two. I believe. Yeah, Sasha's deck. Here's the thing. Sasha's deck has attractions, <laughs> and I just desperately want to see attractions actually get get played. I'm, I'm emotionally invested in riding the Ferris wheel in, card, in cards from Infinity, yeah. And I want to know what attractions are good enough to play in Highlander. Graham's not joking. We were talking about this earlier. Gra yeah. Graham wants yeah. the wants the Ferris wheel. <laughs> what what attractions get into into Highlander? I mean, Ferris wheel, as you mentioned, obviously, but. Uh, I mean, like realistically, since you get to build your attraction deck, you can kind of put whatever in there. Um, I'm not especially familiar with all of them because uh, I, I think a lot of players have opted to like sort of not worry about acquiring the attractions. Um, but mm. I will say this: I think that they are powerful. Yeah. Um, for sure, and I, my guess is that there are a lot of players that aren't pl playing them that should be. Mm -hmm. Um, the same actually can be said about, um, like, Comet, for example. Yeah. Uh, I think when people initially looked at the card, it just looks like an Infinity card, right? Yeah, it's um, very silly, obviously. And it's definitely one of those cards where... Oh, we're back. We're, sorry, we're playing. It looks like Sasha has kept six land. Six land, pardon me, six cards. And is being probed... Looks like we've got Iteration, Minsk and Boo, three fetch lands, and a uh, Lightning Bolt, I believe. Yeah, that's got to be a Bolt. That? Yeah. In another language, perhaps? There's too many words on there to be Flame Slash. Oh, is it Flame Slash? No. It is Flame Slash. Okay, it's just a different language, I think. <laughs> Okay, so Robin's paid the two life to use the probe uh, to take a look. Oh, reevaluating what land to open oh. with. So we know Robin has a sea chrome coast. Um, Jataxian probe from the tempo side is uh, one of the best probes you see. Uh, mm -hmm. Having the information of what your opponent has, especially when your creatures are so specific, um, is super, super relevant. So. We'll see how Robin chooses to handle that information, whether or not he just starts to feed creatures to the Flame Slash, um, or if he chooses to try and play around it, um, play creatures in turns where, <clears throat> excuse me, he's forcing Sasha to use removal spells on them instead of casting one of Sasha's bigger haymakers like the Minsk, like the Minsk and Boo in his hand. Mm. The people in the chat who now have access to the deck lists are saying that they don't see any way for Sasha's deck to open attractions. <laughs> So now I don't understand <laughs> why there's attractions at all. <laughs> They're not even visible on screen right now. They were earlier, it, but... Maybe it's a nod to the idea that <clears throat> if you're playing in Eternal format, you're supposed to put attractions out and also initiative and monarch and all the other like side things, but... yeah. Oh, it's in case Raghavan steals something. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is the planning. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's there we go. Sorry, we just had confirmation. It's in case Ragavan hits something that could make it's it's technically correct. Uh... Uh, well I'll tell you that no one else in the top eight is running in attractions. So yeah, I guess it I guess it doesn't it, it it doesn't harm your game plan to have an attractions deck, so you you may as well. Yeah, I mean you might as well bring it to the table. Uh, you're in an event that um yeah. people you, you care a lot about. Yeah. 
Well, does he have a? Does, yeah, it's the, that's a great question from chat. Does Sasha also have uh, a sticker sheet? A uh, sticker sheet, just I don't in know. case, right? Well, we'll have to get the sticker sheet answer later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've done a lot of uh, fetching and brainstorming, and uh, there's a steam vents entering tapped. Yeah, we've got, I believe that's a Rogrin Triumph. Oh, no, sorry, steam vents. And uh, Sparus headquarters, that's what it is. Right, on um, Sasha's side. So this is the this is classic first several turns of a game of Highlander, of just uh, hitting yourself for several life points while, you, while both players hand their decks well, around and shuffle. Mana. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested as to why Robin grabbed the Steam Vents and not the um, Raugrin Triumph. Mm. Maybe it's already in Robin's hand. That would uh, be unfortunate, yeah. Because yeah. as we mentioned, we've seen the fetch lands mostly going for Triomes today. And we have so third path Iconoclast. Card is great. It yeah. It's it's better than uh, Young Pyromancer. It says non-creature, so it triggers off of Moxin. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so I hadn't Moxin, even thought of that. Planeswalkers. Yeah. yeah. We've definitely I've seen some really really good turns where people go like third path per, third path iconoclast, Mox Mox. I have four creatures in play, <laughs> and a, an extra two mana. Right, and the creatures it makes are also are also artifacts, which is potentially relevant. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's this the presence of these non-creature spells is actually cool because it means that like sometimes it's correct to hold your mox. It looks like we're seeing flame slash here. Yeah, and no, no one one in response, unfortunately. That dinosaur is having a bad day. Yeah, wow. Yeah, no one one in response is interesting. Oh, got a Ragavan on Robin's side of the board this time. Hard cast, no dash. Uh, if I'm Sasha, to me this signals that Robin's probably got some sort of counterspell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you might say, well, okay, Robin could dash the Ragavan and then hit Sasha, right. but there's no guarantee that that happens. And um, not with two open mana. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah. And and it, I mean, if Robin goes for the dash and then Sasha kills the Ragavan and then untaps and casts like the Minskin Boo that Robin knows about. Mm. That, that's going to be really hard to come back from. So, if I'm in Sasha's seat, I'm I'm thinking counter spell here for yeah. sure. So this looks like end of Robin's turn. Ragavan's being nimbly pilfered, or I guess petty thefted in this instance, <laughs> back to hand. Yeah, and uh, Robin doesn't counter that um, because he knows about the Minskin Boo. Yeah, this Jataxian probe knowledge really coming into play. But now there's like some mind games between Sasha and Robin. Like oh, Sasha, this is yeah. <laughs> this is major mind games in this in this particular game. Uh, there's a expressive iteration still. There's a mox now. Uh, looks like we're going for the expressive iteration. I like leading on iteration here. I think that's totally fine. Like if because that's Robin, a perfectly reasonable counter target too, right? Yeah, if Robin counters this, it's like whatever, you know. Um, Mis miscalculation. Oof. Get it. Getting miscalced when you have a land in hand. <laughs> <laughs> Always feels bad. I think it is correct to expressive um, without the mox in a lot of situations. Maybe you're supposed to play it there. I'm not entirely sure, but and you figure it's oh, there's they're chuckling yeah, about it yeah. now too. You figure it's correct to to counter the expressive iteration too, yeah. Yeah, I think you got to counter the iteration. Yeah. Um, if you hold your counter magic for the one card that you know about, the Minskin Boo, you're just going to get chip damaged by like the other really relevant cards that Sasha's casting. Yeah. Um, what alternate art? What's it? Was that? Oh, the Serum Visions. Oh, yeah. Serum Visions. Serum Thank visions. you. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think you have to counter the expressive iteration there. Uh, so now we're dashing Ragavan. Yeah, this frees up your Ragavan to just get in there, and yeah. he's still holding up two mana, so he's probably got another counter spell. Would be my guess. It's a land unfortunate for Robin, but still makes a treasure. Now, strictly speaking, Nimble Pilfer is in a, or not, sorry, Brazen Borrower is in a. Uh, On an adventure. A different kind of exile than, oh, that, yes, than, yeah. than that land is. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm curious to see if we'll see Robin pass the turn. Oh, one more spell, it looks like. Good. Yeah, so Robin's have still heavily representing counter magic here. Yeah. If you're in chat, I'd like to know if you prefer Moon or Fish Ponder. That's a tough call, honestly. I think, I think, for me, it's Moon. I think. I think I'm on Moon Ponder as well, but yeah. I respect the Fish Ponder. <laughs> Chat's mostly on Moon, it seems, but uh, I think we got some. There's definite. Oh, there's some <laughs> definite fish enjoyers. Absolutely. Maybe it depends on what type of deck you're playing. If you're playing a combo deck, you play Moon. You're That's playing... <laughs> very specific. Russian Moon Ponder. Wow. All right. Oh, I have a couple of Russian Moon Ponders. They do look really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wheeler says Fish Ponder is best Ponder, and this is coming from someone who literally has Moon Ponder <laughs> tattooed on his body. I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> Th those are some tattoo regrets you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got the wrong art. Yeah, like a year later, you're looking at Ponderous and you're like, wow, this fish one's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Fable of the Mirror Breaker now from Sasha. Uh, on the stack. Seems like it's, yep, it's resolving. Wow. There goes, there goes that 2-2 two -two Goblin Shaman. Interesting it resolves. May yeah. I put Robin on Counterspell, but it's possible that he doesn't have a Counterspell happening. Yeah, maybe he's um, big bluffing. Yeah. I heard an interesting stat that um, the first person to cast a Fable in Standard is really likely to win that game, mm. even if it gets countered. Really? Yeah. Fable's really, really good. It's it's um, definitely been one of the Hallmark cards from the past couple of years in Highlander. Here we see Fall from Favor. Very interesting. So that's going to tap down the Goblin Shaman and, well, for as long as Robin is the monarch, but it also makes Robin the monarch. And they're just sorting out how they were going to represent that. So time to yeah, move to end step and draw a card. So no more, no Raghavan still holding up two, two mana. I tell you, if Robin doesn't have Counterspell, this is tremendous commitment to pretending like he does. I, if someone's going to commit to it, Robin's going to commit to it. I, yeah. yeah, it's definitely in Robin's wheelhouse to have nothing but to be holding up two mana the whole game. <laughs> and you believe him because he's been playing this format for since its inception, yeah. right? So, Chapter 2 of Fable there discards Maw Core or whatever it is. It's one of the 40k creatures. Yeah, it, 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 fight, it fights when it enters. Maw yeah. Lock, pardon Maw -lock. me. Yeah, discard this Tyranid. Draw a volcanic island, play a mox, and then we're casting Minskin Boo with two mana up to pay for, well, not remand. Oh, oh wow. We have a lose focus on the remand. Lose focus on the remand. That's a big deal. See, this is the problem with it happening with... The problem with waiting turn after turn, as you say, right, is then you allow your opponent to build out enough, enough resources to respond to the counter spell. Yeah, Sasha's had a lot of time this game to, yeah. to get stuff going. And um, it's interesting because uh, Jataxian Probe, that knowledge of the Minskin Boo, mm -hmm. uh, is always in Robin's mind. And sometimes it's, it's possible that you're just supposed to ignore it. And I, I don't really know what's correct. I don't know what's in Robin's hand. But uh, it's definitely yeah. worth considering. Sometimes when you see stuff with Probe, you really... You really like get that in your head, and that's the one thing you care about. Looks like we're at no cards in hand for Sasha, uh, since you mentioned cards in hand. But now we're back to uh, monarchy on Sasha's side. So end of turn, drawing, drawing a card. Okay, well, we know it's not necessarily relevant, <laughs> but do you need more threats when you already have a Minskin Boo and you're going to be untapping with... Um, your, I mean, your Goblin Shaman's going to untap because Sash, Sash is the Monarch now. Oh, I guess, okay, Ragavan yeah, can steal the Monarchy it, yeah. back. So yeah, there's fair. still a lot of game to be played here, but Sasha's definitely in a uh, more commanding position. Yep, Exile's a Mana Leak. Oh, I think you're uh, something Something just occurred to Trenton's microphone. Oh, I can, I can hear again. I think we're good. Oh, are you? Okay. Um... Hmm? All right, well. Okay, weird little thing. Um, what was going on? All oh, right. So, yeah. Ragavan, exiling Got the Ragavan hit. Mana leak, nothing. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Makes a treasure. Passes the turn. It'll be an interesting choice to see if Sasha decides to draw uh, four Robin cards. draw for a Monarch there. Ooh, March of Otherworldly Light. Just costing one mana. Yeah. 
Oh, this before is, this. this is actually Okay. So, Kiki Jiki did flip. I'm not sure. Sorry, got distracted by uh, <laughs> by hilarious microphone uh, <laughs> issue. Tell you what, Trenton. Please explain what's going on in the game while I fix yeah. the microphone. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like my mic has uh, decided that it doesn't want to cooperate. Um. So we're getting that sorted out. Oh no! Sorry, I have an Don't have the mic. Looks like we've missed a decent amount of what's going on, but uh, it looks like Robin March of Otherworld lighted the. Uh, Minx can boo hamster after the Minx can boo tr trigger. So Sasha, Sasha doesn't get a hamster immediately. And then Sasha played uh, a four mana initiative creature to gain the initiative. And flipped to the reflection of Kiki Jiki. And what do we have in play with three counters on it now? I missed what card that it's was. It's a uh, four mana, five two red initiative creature. Okay. Um, I can't remember the specific text. Uh, Caves of Chaos Adventure. Yes. Five three trample. Five three. Yeah. Entered. So now we have now we have monarch and initiative happening. <laughs> and whenever Caves of Chaos Adventure attacks, exile the top card of your library. If you've completed a dungeon, you may play that card this turn without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, you may play that card this turn. And then we have a flame slash and an uh, f fork, fork bolt. bolt. Yeah, to take care of the uh, adventure because it came and it got three counters. Wow. Yeah. Robin's having to spend a lot of resources yeah. to deal with what's going on, and Sasha's still threatening more hamsters. Has the monarch in the initiative, or well, I guess will be taking the monarch soon potentially, but. Um, but Robin's doing a decent uh, job of managing what's going on with Sasha. Tarmogoyf now from Robin. Creature instant land. Probably four or five. How big is that Tarmogoyf? Uh, yeah, instant creature land sorcery. No planeswalkers. No artifacts. No enchantments. Sasha Flashing and Brazen Bar were there. And that Ragavan is just cast. Yeah. <laughs> the the Ragavan's... Uh, your first mate can only do so much. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so fresh new hamster. New boo. I believe Sasha chose the five uh, damage part of the uh, dungeon for the initiative. Ah, yes. Robin down on 13 now. And I think this is about to be draw for the turn <laughs> after making a hamster, <laughs> dealing five to his opponent. Yeah, nobody said there wasn't a lot of tracking in Canadian Highlander. Yeah. <laughs> so we mentioned cards from March of the Machine are legal for this event today. Uh, nobody's playing battles yet. Do you think that's because they... The folks haven't had a chance to evaluate how good they are, or are have they done that and evaluated that in fact they are not good? I think they're really hard to assess. Uh, I think you'd want to probably get into combat with battles in play before you make the call, mm -hmm. um, because it's a new card type. It's really hard to just like toss it in there, especially for a tournament that's so important. You can make your uh, Tarmogoyf one larger. 
Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's relevant. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that battles will become relevant. I think there are a couple of battles that um, will show up. And I was, uh, Graham and I were talking about this earlier, actually. Um, the four or five damage that you have to deal to a battle matters a lot less uh, depending on what you're building your deck around, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the battles generally for everything that they give you are a little undercosted. Like if you actually get to flip it and you get what's you get the creature or whatever the effect is on the other side. So I, I would expect that we will see them at some point. All right. So what's happening here? We got Kiki Jiki making another Brazen Borrower. So this is six in the air. And there's a hamster with haste, and so that's attacking for uh, that looks to be twelve, because the hamster had five plus one plus one counters on it. I think something from the from the uh, dungeon. Oh yes, the uh, the dungeon at some point does give two plus one plus one counters, but. Um, yeah, and wow. Uh, Robin scoops them up. Sasha with uh, two clean games. <coughs> we haven't seen Robin um, have a start where he gets to play a creature into a creature and have interaction backing up those creatures yet. Right. Um, but I hope we do get to see that. So I'm sorry. Uh, trap the target player loses five life room in the undercity. That is the third. Oh, level. it's the third so the, one. But the second uh, one, okay. second one, the forge was putting two counters on a creature. So Minsk and Boo happened, and then uh, made a made the hamster, and then the counters went on the uh, went on the hamster, and then more counters went on the hamster from activating <laughs> Minsk and Boo. So. And you got to attack with a big hamster, and that's just. Uh, that's just good magic. Yeah, exactly. That's what you're talking about. You just you want to be able to <laughs> want to be able to attack with a hamster. I'm waiting for a um, comet versus comet mirror. That's my hope for this. Is matchup. comet in both of these decks? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. they're both playing comet. Yeah. I would like to see good boys on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> Until now, it's just been Ragavans. <laughs> Game one, Sasha had a Ragavan. Game two. Robin had a Ragavan. So Sasha now leading 2-0. Uh, there it is. In the best of five. So one more, and Sasha takes down this semifinal. But Robin could absolutely reverse it. It's well within the deck's capabilities to do so. Yeah, so if Robin takes this one, it's worth noting that Sasha's going to be on the play both of the other games. Yeah, which could be pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, as a tempo deck, you generally would like to be on the play. Mm -hmm. um, it's a... A little more important than maybe other archetypes. Uh, again, I, I'd love to see Robin uh, be able to hit his game plan um, because this type of tempo deck is something that you can only really find in Highlander. Um, so I'd love to see Robin go creature creature into some interaction and take over the game that way. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. We'll see what the cards have uh, for both of our players here. And uh, right now, Sasha's been really uh, able to execute his game plan. Uh, pretty cleanly. Yeah. I appreciate the chats now really trying to figure out, doing a lot of theory crafting about what battles could be relevant in Highlander. Oh. <laughs> I remember reading one that I thought might be good for um, Crater Huff Behemoth decks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, I believe it was sort of a Green Sun Zenith variant. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think it's the. Is it Ikoria? It's, there's definitely one of them that lets you. Yeah, I uh, think it is Invasion of Ikoria. Yeah. yeah. What very limited amount of um, limited March of Machine I've been able to play so far has been. Pretty fun, and the battles are definitely very powerful in that format. <laughs> but I mean, here today we're looking at Highlander, which is <laughs> certainly the most powerful format I'm familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> and it's getting more and more powerful. <laughs> yeah, they just keep printing some ridiculous stuff. So. Yeah, the decks are getting a lot um, leaner in terms of the card quality. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe 
when I started seven, eight years ago, your mid-range decks, maybe you're playing Thrag Tusk, right, on your top end, but things like cards like that are a lot harder to play now. Like, you just get so many efficient threats and, and spells now. Robin so. opens with an Arid Mesa. Uh, Sasha's on a Malta 6, just for, for reference. Uh, Sasha plays a Wooded Foothills and looks like to crack it immediately. I think we're going to very quickly achieve... Yeah, see, this is what we're talking about with Highlander shortcuts, right? It's like, <laughs> look, I'm going to go search for a red source and play this Raghavan. Well, if you're in a timed round, you, you got a shortcut. Yeah. Yeah. So are we going to see... Is Robin going to crack the Arid Mesa? Are we going to see both players shuffling at the same time? Uh, yep. And we're going to see the spell before the thing. No, we're not. Okay, I wasn't sure if I wasn't sure if Robin was <laughs> cracking for a spell to cast, but no, it's going to be a triome. I don't know which one that is. That's a Raugrin triome. Thank so it's you. The blue white red one, yeah. Raugrin. Raugrin. Uh, yeah, th this Raugavan's interesting because I think if Robin had a one drop, he would have played it. So now he's going to have the decision of like. If he has the ability to, do I kill this Raghavan or do I just play a threat mm -hmm. that blocks it? Um, we'll see what he ends up deciding to do here. Basic Island. Unholy Heat? No. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's an Unholy Heat. Huh. Very, very interesting because of the presence of the Raghavan. It's sort of like Robin's lost a mana here. Mm. Uh, unless he has uh, like a recall or uh, some other blue card draw spell in his hand. Uh, another Triome on the other side of the board. Ooh. Oh! Oh! Uh, well, you were saying, weren't you? <laughs> you were mentioning that in particular. I will respond. Yeah, Sasha just laughs. <laughs> yeah. Sasha's considering. Yeah, so like, Robin uh, opted for the recall over time walk in, in terms of his point spread for this deck. Well, it's working out pretty all right this game. Yeah. That's quite a lot of card advantage now. Drawing for the turn. And re recall is going to put Robin so far ahead in terms of cards that he should be able to generate that card advantage into tempo advantage. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Sasha will have a tough time dealing with what Robin's bringing to the table. Although, recall isn't perfect. Sometimes yeah. you draw a bunch of bricks. Like, yeah. There's still a lot of game to be had. So Robin has... Sorry, Sasha has uh, Urza's Saga. The Kiki-Jiki. <laughs> uh, yeah. O Oko, it's, I think, in It's there? funny to think that the mana bases are so good. That yeah. you can play four colors and a Nurza Saga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, consider putting the five mana to ferry into the bin over there. This is still Robin's turn. Ponder into steam vents, paying the life for untapped vents. Tapping the vents now. For... And we're seeing... <laughs> <laughs> and the Raghavan on the other side. Ah, it's the monkey mirror. Yeah. Ook, ook. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't the mirror I hoped for, but it's the one we're getting. <laughs> I prefer dogs myself. We, we may yet see dogs. <laughs> There's a chance. Um, it's pretty likely that Sasha just plays land and casts Fable here, would be my guess. Um, you could Unholy Sasha Heat the Sasha drew his on. own Unholy Heat, if yeah. we want to make it a true, mi truly mirror experience. But... That's probably not a great use of oh, mana. Oh, wow. Actually, Sasha gets to... Oh, I was going to say, are we going to cast a Murktai region yeah, this turn? Yeah, this is a great sequence of plays for Sasha. So on Holy Heat, kill the Raghavan, delving the entire graveyard. Yeah, you're making a 5-5 five, five Murktai here. This is a big game. So that's because that's Consider, Unholy Heat, and I, what else was in the bin Just there? a fairy, Raghavan, and a land. Okay, so only two yeah. counters, but still, it's a yeah 5-5 five, five Murktai region. That's okay. Um... <laughs> this is powerful magic, like we said. This is the one of the w one of the ways that you beat Ancestral Recall is you just create threats that either take multiple cards to deal with, or they're just impossible to deal with. Like uh, Robin has the fall from favor, though. That's really, really big. That's yeah. Now we're just generating even more card advantage. Plays a Scalding Tarn there. 
turn, moving to end step, drawing card for Monarch. Yeah, I think Robin's drawn four or five more cards than uh, Sasha at this point. Oh yeah. my god. Is it dog? It's the dog. <gasps> art, 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 art. <laughs> <laughs> For those keeping score at home, the dog is Comet Stellar Pup. It kind of looks like when you first read it, you don't know how to think about it, but it's actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It turns out <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, you know, there's RNG involved, you're rolling a die, but you know, it's still, it's all, all upside. Well, it's sort of like all the options are good. Like they're yeah. all fine. Although I guess this Comet is a little worse than most because uh, you can't get back at two costs right now because your graveyard's empty. So I guess Sasha has a real decision here. So here's the Urza Saga. There's Comet Stellar Pup. I like playing it, though. Um, I think you're in a position where you need to take appropriate risks that turn the advantage to back towards you, because mm -hmm. right now Robin is pretty heavily advantaged. Um, so I, I like just jamming the Comet and just assuming that you're not going to hit the, um, the three. Yeah, so it's rolls a one or two, make two squirrels. With, with haste. Uh, <laughs> the three is return a card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to your hand, which is a complete whiff at the moment. Four or five deals damage to a bunch of stuff. None of that matters because it gets wow. spell pierced by Rothman. Spell pierce is absolutely enormous. That's that brutal. Just a huge beating. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Sasha does with this Urza Saga. Young Peasy. So this is the point in the game where Robin's going to start turning all of these cards that he's drawn into the insurmountable advantage, and Pyromancer and uh, the third path Iconoclast are both really good at doing that. Yep. Looks like we have a Chain Lightning heading for that Pyromancer, though. Sorensen doesn't currently have the correct mana to fire it back the other way. Uh, nor does he cast anything to make a 1-1. One, one. Yeah, if, if you're in Robin's position, Sasha only has two cards in hand. You you have a bunch going on in your hand. I saw at least an Oko, yeah. if not more. I think it's safe to assume that he probably has a counterspell. And so, realistically, you'd like to keep your Pyromancer around, but you kind of want to um, hold for whatever Sasha could have. Because you're in such a card advantaged position, like you just worry about whatever Sasha has left, and you can probably pick them apart with the pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the second chapter on? Oh, there's an Oko from Robin now. Okay, what's the second chapter on Urza's Saga do? Uh, Where Sasha can, gets to make a con yeah, you can tap two lands in the Saga to make a zero zero construct. Right. Um, the construct it has power and toughness equal to the artifacts you control, so it comes in as a 1-1 one, one itself, and then any other artifact you control pumps it. Yeah, Chapter 3 versus Saga seems a lot more powerful in decks that have Moxen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think Sasha is running um, at least two Moxen, probably a triple Mox spread. Mm. Um, so the Saga is uh, a totally fine consideration. Yeah. Like, you can get Mox here. He, he might be playing a couple of small, like, one-mana bullets. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we're seeing like some spell bombs here or there, maybe a pithing needle. Sasha's on three mocks and a bauble, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I wasn't implying that Sasha's deck didn't have those things. I meant better, it, the, the saga's better here than, say, limited or yeah, yeah, commander. Yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've seen saga be better than it is in Sasha's deck, too. Like, if you, in, in, in the next match after this, if David uh, Brunson puts a saga in play, like, those tokens are going to be huge. He's yeah. playing blue white artifacts, so uh, interesting decision here for Sasha on whether or not he makes another zero zero before the saga triggers. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you can make two, um, but you have oh. to commit uh, on your turn right. to the saga. So um, I'd say like it's pretty equivalent based on what's in Sasha's hand, whether or not because you're sort of to... spending. Well, I mean. You're spending the two mana, but then you, you'd still sacrifice the Saga and go looking for, in this case, a Mox. So you, you know, you're down two mana, but you're not down three mana. I don't know. I'm just saying words. Yeah. yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, Sasha, Sasha knows that he's already drawn the Ponder. So like, 
a consideration if you knew if you knew you had a land in hand would be to pay for the saga. You get a mox and then you play your land and you can cast one of your three drops. Right. But Sasha doesn't have that, so he has to make the consideration on whether or not he thinks the construct is worth uh, paying the mana for. Uh, and this is a really really key decision point, and I can see why Sasha is taking the time that he's taking to figure it out, because uh, this is a really really pivotal turn for right. him. So it looks like he tapped to float colorless. Because that doesn't lose that ability, right? It still taps no, it, for colorless. No, it doesn't lose the colorless. And uh, since you, since sagas are done after your draw step, you, you get to retain the mana as well. So yeah. this is a heads up play from Sasha. Very cool. Goes to get Mox. Help. <laughs> Sapphire. <laughs> Sapphire, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so five mana available then for Sasha this turn. Yeah, I think we're probably going to see Sasha lead on a Ponder, um, looking for a potential 4-drop. Uh, we could also see an Oko. I like playing Oko over it, Fable here. It's Oko, yeah. Yeah. I think um, Oko has your highest potential to get you back into a board state where you have time to reaccumulate card advantage against Robin. Mm -hmm. um, F Fable is great, but I think it's very likely that Robin has answers to both the 2-2 the two -two that you create initially and then also your reflection of Kiki-Jiki at this stage. It's definitely harder to answer Oko. Um, so that was a uh, force of negation from Robin there exiling third path iconoclast to counter the Oko. Exile the Oko. Yeah, and Robin gets to just kind of do this because he's drawn so many cards, right? Like, yeah. He, like, he sees, like, an Oko or whatever. He just wow. dishes it. Construct into the red zone to try and steal the monarchy, and it gets pathed. And this is the consequence of drawing, like, five or six extra cards. Robin's just going to have every answer, right? Right. Um, this does give Sasha another land, but, I mean, there's no development to the board happening here. Yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see if Sasha ponders here um, or if he wants to wait to be able to see an extra card next turn. Mm. Um, right now, Sasha is thinking of very specific cards in his deck that he wants to look for. Um, and it looks like we're pondering. So land, a strangle, and... Something else. I feel like these are not. And I, I can't tell what that third one is. Oh, not shuffling though, so clearly these are cards he wants. I didn't catch which one was drawn there. So Sh Sasha do, drew a strangle. Um, I have to feel like the third card is has got to be good, like because obviously the land isn't where you want to be. Yeah. So I think the combination of Strangle and whatever the third card was is going to be strong enough, um, at least from Sasha's perspective. Sasha's also at the point of the game where Robin is uh, so far ahead in terms of cards and like mana and board presence that he essentially needs to assume that Robin doesn't have it on a lot of axes. Right. So you're going to see plays from Sasha that m to us might seem strange. Um, but Sasha is formulating a game plan in his head of yeah. how it needs, how things need to happen for him to actually win the game, and a lot of things need to go right, and he's going to play to those things. Robin ticks up Oko to turn that food into an elk, here represented with a beast token. That's close enough. Good enough for us. Yep. <laughs> Considering the rest of his turn, there's one more land just off the bottom of shot there. I think I saw Jace the Mind Sculptor in Robin's hand. Ooh. Yep, I see Jace the Mind Sculptor on the battlefield now. Jace resolves. There's an interesting point here. Uh, Robin correctly um, plus twos the Jace. Uh, Whatever that was is going on the bottom. 
Interesting. Interesting. Couldn't quite catch it. I'd be, I'm curious to, to see what it, what it might have been. Um, I heard some sort of noise that sounded like a sounded like a teeth sucking, like a <laughs> before it, before it went away. So I don't know which player that was from. <laughs> All right, Fable of Kiki Jiki now. But yeah, um, Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Pardon me. Robin doesn't need the cards from the Jace to plus tune right away. It's like. Eagle-eyed member of chat figures it was Undermountain Adventurer. Oh, okay. So Sasha was thinking of introducing the initiative, and the reason the strangle is good then is because he gets to retain it, right? Ah, yes. Okay. Um, I, I think that's the right call then. You have to assume that Robin doesn't really have much else, and your Undermountain Initiative or Adventurer or whatever plus um, your strangle gives you enough time to potentially uh, gain an advantage using the initiative right. that could potentially beat Noko. Um, that elk did indeed get strangled. Yeah. And now we're back on Robin's turn. <laughs> I, I imagine strangling an elk is a tough job, yes. but Sasha's getting it done. Sounds difficult. <laughs> uh, Jace brainstorm there, which I think we're still resolving. I think Robin's deciding what cards to put back. Yeah, so once you plus the Jace now, you can just start brainstorming because it's out of uh, lightning bolt range. You've got Noko going, so it's protected on the ground, most likely. You're drawing an extra card a turn, but looking at three. Uh, I'm trying I'm trying to come up with scenarios where um, like Robin doesn't continue to have a commanding position on this game, but um, if there's any deck that can retake uh, like from a, from this far behind, it is like the om omniitiative decks. Like they're, they have so many powerful cards that I can definitely see a sequence of draws from Sasha that could uh, get him to the point where he's um, back on, to a stable board. Yeah. Robin mm, plays a Marsh Flats, yeah. makes food with Oko, and hard casts Fury, eliminating the 2 2 Goblin Shaman. And that looks like Sasha's seen enough and realizes that, as you say, he is way too far behind. Well, and that's the game. That's the game. All right, we're now 1 to 2 in this best of five semifinal. Yeah, Robin Robin just came out came out quickly uh, with the, the Ancestral Recall um, in terms of card advantage and then just held onto it. Yeah, you... All right. the, the tempo deck's interesting because it, because it is playing a lot of similar cards, sometimes you can play a more controlling game. Uh, and we see that... Uh, there with Robin's game. Like, mm -hmm. he was fully in control of the game for basically the entirety of the game, and then he got to go from there. And he even eschewed uh, some of the tempo cards that he has. Like the young Pyromancer, he didn't care about countering the kill spell for it because it didn't matter at that stage. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we didn't see it sort of a traditional win from the tempo deck, but that is the power of that deck. It, it hits on a lot of different axes, so you get to sort of carve your game plan based on the cards that are available to you and the board state that you're presented with from your opponent. Yeah. The, uh, the th <laughs> Thank you, CD Mac. I appreciate that. Uh, we're just taking a, giving the players just a moment uh, in, between, in between games. It is, it is one to two now, yep. So uh, Sasha still leads the semis the best of five semifinal game match here. Wow, thanks. You said I was doing great, <laughs> and then I just completely... <laughs> words. Um, Sasha is leading this match <laughs> two to one. And, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so only one more game, and then Sasha's going to the finals. But uh, as we saw there, Robin could uh, could very easily take, take down two more games, and then... Uh, then, then Robin would be in the finals. Is there a place to see the bracket? Great question. Yes, let's take a look at the bracket. Yeah, We're, let's take a look at the have, bracket. We right have now. a moment here. So, yeah, Robin Sorensen versus Sasha Christensen on the left there. That's the match we are watching now. Sasha leading two to one. Best of five. On the other side of the bracket, Dave Brunson versus Jack Hanneke. Artifacts versus Death and Taxes. That is also best of five. And, of course, the winners of each of those will feed into the finals match, which is also best of five. So there's so much more magic coming your way today. One thing I really quickly want to say about this whole bracket is when you look at it, you just see Highlander 
as what it is. It's almost beautiful to look at. <laughs> like, artifacts, death and taxes, like, two uh, four-color decks that are using the totally same colors, but are enacting different game plans, right? Yeah. Like, th this is just the beauty of Canadian Highlander. Like, and when, when you look at this bracket, that's, at least for me, that's what I see. And yeah. you even have a red deck wins in there, too. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, to the credit of, of, you know, not just the pilot, but that deck as well, the, that was a tight match. Oh, that, that was, was a fantastic match. It was a match. great match to watch. It was I, very I'm, close. I'm going to go back and watch that match for sure. Um, I, as a, sometimes I pilot red deck wins as well, and um, I think there's a lot to be learned from that gameplay yeah. specifically. Um, so, yeah, fantastic match between, uh, it was Ben and Sasha. Uh, round two for anyone that wants to watch the VOD. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, the uh, this VOD, of course, if you're not watching it uh, on Twitch, it will be on our uh, YouTube channel, LRRMTG, in a couple of days. And if you are watching this on the uh, YouTube uh, replay, well, hello. Nice hello. to see you. Uh, for those who are here live, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for supporting us to, to do all of this stuff. Uh, anyone who's subscribing today will be doing all of the subs at the end of the show. Uh, which will be uh, not soon because, again, we're still in our first best of five semifinal match. Uh, we'll head back over to Studio C whenever they're ready to begin game four <laughs> of this best of five uh, match. And then um, we, have a, we have round uh, six, as I said, and then, yeah, the finals where uh, I think, we're, I think we, have a, we have a three person booth for the, for the finals. It'll yeah, be yeah. Us joined by Wheeler. <laughs> It's gonna get rowdy. That's yeah, for sure. well, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm excited. That's, this has been this has been a just a terrific day of magic already. So I'm. It'll I'm be weird to it. commentate with uh, Wheeler not in uh, a closet, essentially. Oh right, so, yeah, the, the over it, <laughs> yeah. sitting over in the back room of yeah, Yellow the Jacket. Yeah, back room of Yellow Jacket. Can't talk yeah. too loud so the players don't hear. All right. Well, luckily we're separated here by walls, and so let's head over <laughs> back to the other studio uh, for uh, Game Four of this first semifinal match. Uh, so we got to start with a Mishra's Bobble. Yeah. And it looks like Sasha at least has kept a 7. Uh, do we have both players on 7? Ooh. We have seen Raghavan from both players. Both on 7, yeah. Oh, turn, Every game. Turn 1 Raghavan yeah. from, from Robin. All right. Yeah, Raghavan's been showing up this... Uh, in a 100-card singleton deck, that's not common. <laughs> Ragavan is so impactful. This this card is uh, a huge presence in Canadian Highlander, and he, uh, decks like uh, uh, more controlling versions of Sasha's uh, build, the f sort of four color best cards decks. Even those decks are playing Ragavan when traditionally you'd see mo mostly removal in those like slots, the one and two mana slots. Yeah, it's just so powerful. It just does it all. It slices. It dices. <laughs> Sasha casts Opt, scrying to the bottom, and then draws a card. Oh, there's your dog. Art, art. <laughs> and dazing the Raghavan. Now, now Sasha has its turn. It's Sasha's second turn. Briefly, there had no land in play and four cards in the graveyard. This looks like a game of legacy, honestly. Magic the Gathering. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love dazing the Raghavan there. I mean, like. It, yeah. At some point, that Raghavan's going to make more mana for Robin anyway, so you're already going to be down. Uh, so you might as well daze it. Like, there's no point in not, not doing it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like an end step fetch. Six. Yep. Be very worried about another, you know, turn three Merktide regent here, but uh, we can see Sasha doesn't have that in hand. Could easily Ooh. draw one, but... So... Someone in chat asking, is this pre-recorded? No, this is absolutely 100% live. The games and... I mean, the commentary generally is always live. So, sometimes, depending on the stream, you might have pre-recorded gameplay offset by an hour. But in this case, not today. This is absolutely live. F just flashing in Brazen Borrower as a 3-1 flyer. Yeah, that's not, not something you see often, but, I mean, I think you might... You might want to see it more than uh, you think, right? If Robin can kill Sasha with damage before Sasha gets to do stuff, that also wins the game. <laughs> yeah, in this tempo deck, I mean, it's possible that Robin has this threat and then all interaction, right? So he might yeah. just hit Sasha, um, what, eight 
sorry, eight. <laughs> <laughs> some number Se of times. Some amount, seven times. Yeah. You might just hit Sasha seven times for, for the win. Mm -hmm. One big advantage Robin has in, in terms of this matchup is while his cards are gen like theoretically weaker, um, his mana cost is lower. And that does really lend itself to when you're ahead, being able to continue to press your advantage. Uh, when you look at Sasha's hand here, you see like a lot of three and four drops, right? Which uh, sort of traditionally aren't great against tempo because you ha have things like this where you're getting lose focused or, uh, and you only get to cast one spell a turn. So Ro Robin's deck is really good at double spelling as we're seeing here. True Name Nemesis seems like a pretty good thing to cast lose focus against yeah i'd like my opponent to stop thinking about true name for a little while <laughs> yeah the uh so yeah lose focus into brainstorm pretty good stuff there we get a full view of uh sasha's hand here so we've got a mana leak um five mana to fairy fury leyline binding Ooh, that's a good addition from uh dominaria united. dominaria united yeah yeah, yeah. nice domain o-ring and uh, fetch landing another triome up there. Yeah, your, li your ley line bindings are almost always two mana, sometimes one. So this feels like a pretty good spot for Robin to be in at the moment. And this is sort of the classic tempo game I was talking about earlier. Like, Robin plays a threat, <clears throat> Sasha has to use. Uh, whatever he has to deal with that threat, so the Raghavan. Mm -hmm. And then Robin sneaks through something else, like the Brazen Borrower. And now he's just going to try and manage uh, keeping the Brazen Borrower alive. Uh, even if the Borrower dies, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next couple of turns, like if, if it gets to hit Sasha a couple more times, like... I think I said five mana to fairy. That was three mana to fairy. I'm sorry. I, I think there is five mana to fairy. Oh, goodness. Okay. Maybe. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe I just... <laughs> All right. Sorry. You were saying... Um, but yeah, so uh, I think Sasha's definitely playing into Robin's game plan here, but Sasha drawing on Holy Heat was actually a really big deal. Yeah, because he was he almost using Teferi to bait out the counter there so that the bar was going to yep. die to the Unholy Heat. I'm surprised Sasha didn't um, Unholy Heat the Brazen Borrower in response to the draw trigger from the Fiery Islet. What? Um, I was going to say, the Fiery, that was a sac, he sacrificed that land? That's the Horizon land, yeah. The oh, okay. red Horizon land. Right, they did a cycle of those now. Yeah, okay. yeah. so Robin paid one to draw a card and sack his land. Um, so there's the Unholy Heat. Spell Pierce says no. Tur turns out a might not have mattered anyways, because Robin probably had the spell pierce. Um, but I think it's probably correct on Holy Heat there in response to the Fire Islet. You really uh, force Robin to have one of those one mana counter spells. Oh, wow! <laughs> counter, counter, counter. So Comet just got mana drained. So I, I hate to see it, honestly. <laughs> Robin's gonna get to add four. <laughs> going to get to add four uh, colorless mana. I just don't understand how you do that to a boy as good as Comet. <laughs> that this oh. is uh, Robin's done a tremendous job of just just like just hampering all of Sasha's resources to, to I mean Sasha hasn't been able to get anything to stick. And again, it's Robin's playing less expensive spells, mm -hmm. and he's playing a lot of interaction that is specific to when you're ahead. It helps you continue to push ahead. Um, and like you said, the plan was just resolve this fairly innocuous looking 3 1 flyer and then protect it until you die. <laughs> Well, and, I mean, look at the like mana leak in Sasha's hand, for example. Like that's just been rotting in his hand the entire game. Yeah, might have an opportunity to do something with it here, but we'll find out. There's a ledger shredder from Sasha. This ledger shredder is really important. Nothing from Robin there. Now we now we know Sasha has 
Yes. I'm whispering into my microphone. <laughs> they can't hear us from here. We know uh, Sasha has the mana leak in hand. Uh, Robin's going for path. So this is an interesting, interesting moment here because that's only one mana. Robin might have other answers, and Sasha needs to decide if that mana leak is going to be used here, and it sure isn't. So yeah, you could use the you could potentially use the mana leak to um, force Robin to pay the three mana, and then you know that your um, leyline binding is probably going to stick the next turn. But I think Sasha's sort of correctly identified that uh, he is just going to need this leyline binding to work this turn. Yeah. Um, and the uh, path to exile is interesting because it actually makes it so that the leyline binding costs two. Right. Yeah. There we go. There's the there's the binding. So that's an interesting interaction, and it it reminds you that Path to Exile isn't free. Yeah. So that was that was a uh, that was an interesting interaction. That yeah, the the Sasha was only able to cast Binding there because of the Path to Exile. Memory lapse. This memory Robin. lapse is uh, pretty good. It's it feels sort of like time walk, but. Um, this should open up Sasha to be able to uh, do a couple of things on his turn. Hard cast Fury for one thing. Yeah, so there's some consideration to just casting the Leyline Binding there and like not work like and playing around the two mana being open. Mm -hmm. But I think again, Sasha's done a really good job of identifying like what his position is in in the uh, matchup and specifically this board state. Yeah, and he's realized that like. He's at four. He needs to get pressure on the board while also uh, killing the pressure against him. And I think this all starts with Fury. So I actually do love just jamming into that two mana. Like, it, if if Robin has another counter spell, you're probably not beating it anyways. So I mean, three three double strike is uh, that's quite a clock as well. Like, how how is Robin gonna put in the last four damage here, right? Yeah, I mean, we. This is one thing about the tempo decks is like, because you're uh, playing that really, really um, intricate balance between uh, cheap interaction and cheap threats. Mm -hmm. um, like, a, your threats aren't enough to beat Fury, like almost always. And then B, um, sometimes you just draw all your interaction and not your threats, right? So we'll yeah. have to see if Robin has something that he can actually follow up with here. Um, or a way to get Fury off of the table. Now, Fury being a 3-3, three, three, like, there's a ton of red removal that can definitely deal with it. So um, Robin isn't short on answers in his deck, but, I mean, it doesn't seem like he has one here. He would have killed the Fury last turn. So. Does Robin's deck run Fire Blast? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think of things you could do before damage. Uh, the deck lists are live. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a question for, uh, that was an answer for a response from chat. That was not Trenton telling me to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Graham, uh, why don't you look it up yourself? Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll see myself out. <laughs> uh, Robin fetches for a steam vents. Merktide Regent. This is one of those creatures that can answer the fury. Yeah. Paying two mana and then then deciding what you know we know we're going to delve for five we'll we'll figure out exactly what at a later point which is now uh, uh, that's going to be a we assume that's going to be a seven sorry an eight eight Merktide region yeah what you exile here is pretty interesting um, you got to think about cards like Snapcaster Mage um, ooh that's the lose focus replicated oh wow from from Sasha there. It looks like that was replicated twice. Yep, it was. So, it was. because Robin had enough mana to pay for the first one and the second one, but <laughs> not the third one. Brutal. Loose focus is uh, surprisingly good. It it sort of shores up that, like, it's good early and, and good late as long as you can pay the mana into it, so. That seems, yeah, very annoying. So, yeah, both players now at four, by the way. Yeah. And Sasha's the only one that has... Uh, lethal on board. So let's see what Robin's going to do to stay in this game. That is... That's a chain lightning? Chain lightning. Now, Sasha can pay to fire it back. 
Yeah. Um, but then he would. It doesn't really look die. like it's in his interest to do no. that. Um, like he could, but I have to imagine this chain lightning is going. Is it going to, to the fury? I was going to say, presumably, it's going to the fury. I I mean, unless Robin has another um, burn spell in his hand. Mm -hmm. um, if it's going towards Sasha, he definitely can't bounce it back. Um, yeah. So I assume it's, yeah, there goes the Fury. Yeah. And it's not, it is not returning to Robin's face. And now we're sort of, sort of both without threats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this game has been really, really close. And I think, um, again, I think both players have done a really good job of assessing their position in, in the game state and like what they have to do to win. This death ray shaman is huge. That's though. pretty massive. Yeah, exiling an instant sorcery and each opponent loses two life. That's you know that's quite a clock. Yeah, uh, Sasha won't be able to activate that. S oh no, he will because the birds of paradise. Mm -hmm. Ooh. There you go. Ooh. Because that's yeah, that's the only black source. Well, currently, in in play, Sasha may have others in the deck, but yeah. Uh, even uh, potentially gaining the life might be relevant. Um, yeah. You know the tempo decks can burn you out. Uh, we'll see how Robin responds to this, though. It looks like he just passed the turn. Hmm. So Leyline Binding, Mana Leak, and some some manner of secret layer thing. <laughs> Mental misstep? Mental misstep, maybe? I think, yeah. Thought scour. Thought scour. Thought scour, pardon me. Someone in chat got there ahead of me. Her player mills two cards, draw a card. Targeting self? Yeah, you pretty much always target yourself. Right. Co-head Judge Nelson there, uh, making sure that Graveyard is in the correct order, because sometimes in this format, Graveyard order matters. Yep. We do have Shallow Grave, you know. Some, sometimes people play uh, another shadow or yeah. another spirit. So we're, we're back on Robin's turn. So what happens now is if Robin doesn't do something with the Birds of Paradise or the Death Rite Shaman, then uh, end of Robin's turn, Sasha drains and then untaps and wins. Correct? Yeah, which spell Sasha chooses here is really relevant because if uh, sp Sasha chooses, say, Path to Exile, um, then Robin could Snapcaster Mage the Path to Exile. Oh, interesting. Um, so... So there's Unholy Heat. I'm going to assume Robin has Delirium here. Land, creature, instant sorcery, probably? Yeah, Yeah, it's aimed at the death rite, so yep. it ultimately doesn't matter. That's true. Yeah, and Sasha going for the chain landing, I like that, because of sorcery speed. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that ability resolves. Robin's at two now. Pretty precarious life total. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sasha just drew a red card, and I thought he drew a burn spell, but oh. he drew strangle. <laughs> oh no! Can't go, can't go face with that one. No, unfortunately. You gotta go neck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sasha has a lot of controlling cards here. Ooh. Interesting. Robin is hungry for life total. <laughs> So this Oko is, Robin knows about the Leyline Binding, so he is specifically leading on this Oko. Mm -hmm. um, he either doesn't have anything left to play, or he uh, is just conceding that the Leyline Binding is going to be good regardless, and just p putting the Oko into play, getting the food so that he can pay two to not die to like a stray lightning bolt. Yeah, paying for the mana leak, Oko resolving. Oko goes up to six loyalty after the food. Robin's still deciding whether or not to waste land something. Land for the turn. Passes I back. I like passing here and holding up the food. Um, I don't think you have to risk getting lightning bolted. The the sixth land from Sasha probably doesn't matter at this stage. Like. I think you can sort of correctly assess that Sasha doesn't really have a threat going on. He's probably just loaded with answers. Yep. Um, There's that Leyline Binding taking Oko out of the equation for now. Depending on the context of Robin's hand, I kind of liked eating the food there mm -hmm. if you have nothing else to do. Because um, Sasha didn't have any red open. Right. So. 
Just uh, while you know that there's... Yeah. <laughs> while you know it's safe to eat your pie. Mm-hmm. Cycling a Triome. We're paying three for that. Paying three mana to draw one card is not nearly as exciting as paying one mana to draw three cards. Definitely not. But when you gotta do it, you gotta do it. Yeah. What was drawn there? I can't. So uh quite Sasha see it's your that. triumph of Catherine, I believe it's called. Oh, it's the, the Triumph miracle. of St. Catherine. The triumph of St. Catherine, yeah, it's the miracle creature. Right, from the Warhammer decks. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of people play this card. I haven't played against it or seen it in play. Um, I think in theory it looks pretty good though. Um, yeah, it just keeps coming back. <laughs> Lifelink is nothing to scoff at. Like it, I mean, if Sasha ever hit with this, even if uh, Robin chump blocked, like he'd be super, super happy to have that five life, right? Yeah. All right, we got another Teferi Time Raveler on the board. We're returning. Wow, Leyline this binding. This is absolutely huge for Robin. Um, being able to bounce that Leyline Binding and uh, if he wants to turn his food into a 3-3 three, three is like a really big deal. I going to say it looks like we're turning food into beast. Now we know of course Sasha has the, has the strangle, but it doesn't mean that that isn't going to get to attack. Yeah, and Robin's turning food into beast way faster than I've been able to achieve it in my personal life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <but laughs> Maybe I just need to do more weight training. I don't know. <laughs> There's got to be a way to make this work. All I know is I'm looking at that pie and I'm feeling hungry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> now he's still... I, I will say that this is actually a tough decision because it is, if you yeah. turn the food into a beast, you, you don't can't get to eat it anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, into an elk, technically yeah. speaking, but we're using a beast token here. So yeah, no, no longer able to eat that. More mana being tapped. Impulse. Impulse. Okay. I think this is sort of a... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just showing... Just flashing the three lands. Yeah, you do not have to reveal those cards, but just revealing that three of them were, were lands anyway. Uh, I think a lot of people have left Impulse at home, but Robin loves Impulse. He, he plays Impulse in like a lot of his blue decks. So there's nothing necessarily to stop that Leyline Binding from coming back down. But for now, the Elk is in the red zone, and Sasha is deciding whether to take it and go to one or chump block with the Birds of Paradise. He could also Path to Exile the Elk. I mean, the, like, 10th land or whatever for Robin doesn't really matter at this stage, like, or probably doesn't. Um, Sorry, how does he do the Path again? How does he Path the Elk? Sasha has a Path to Exile. Oh, I missed I it. Think. Does he? Know, did I? He's got the Triumph of St. Catherine, and he's got Leyline, Leyline Binding. Binding and a path to oh, it is a path. Oh, yeah. there it is. It's I, like the other art I path. missed yeah. that being drawn. Interesting. Um, Teferi says, can't path. Oh, you're right. Ooh. I will well, happily take credit for that, but I, it was 100% chat reminding I, me. I always forget about three fairy. Card's got text. Okay, Hardly this, seems fair. This decision is actually really complicated for Sasha then. So Sasha's um, taken the damage and gone to one. Drew a Marsh Flats. Yeah, so he skipped his draw step. Yep. <laughs> Cause, Basically, because that yeah. doesn't do anything here. Yeah, cannot crack that. Um, you'd Boy, think the Triumph close. would be good, but uh, Robin can turn it into an Elk. Yeah. It's an Elk. Oh, you got a creature there? Oh, no. Elk. You do. <laughs> you do have a creature. It's an elk. Yeah, it's a 3-3. Three, three. It no longer has <laughs> lifelink. Yeah. Gosh, this is a really tough spot for Sasha here. Uh, yeah, Sasha could um, Leyline Binding strangle the elk. Um, you don't get to play the Triumph. Uh, you could also Leyline Binding the Oko and then just play the Triumph. Um, if your Triumph dies, you lose uh, because you have to tap your bird to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you could pass. The other line you're thinking, sorry, was to Leyline Binding the Teferi? The Oko. The Oko. Yeah, so you get to keep your And then triumph. strangle the beast and then you're not dead on board. You could also pass the beast, but like I think this, the life on this Triumph is probably important enough. Yeah. So um, we went for the Triumph, keeping birds untapped. 
you're probably supposed to ley line binding Miyoko here. It would be my sort of inclination. Um, you feel like maybe Sash is, oh. I can I could see pathing the, like that's happening. the elk, but I think you want to do your best to try and get a swing in with this triumph. I th yeah, it definitely looks like Sash is considering leaving path up. This That's, is a really complicated decision. Yeah, though. this is huge. Like, this, this is, is this, this could decision could decide the game. Yeah. Very easily, yeah. Mm -hmm. So strangling to ferry because strangle can hit planeswalkers, mm -hmm. leaving up path, leaving Oko in play. But there is a five-five life linker there. Passes the turn. Yeah, so now that the Teferi's gone, you have access to the Path to Exile. Um, this is an interesting decision from Robin whether or not to elk the Triumph. Um, based on the context of his hand, he might just be able to deal with it. Well, because if, if he turns, if he turns the Triumph into an elk and attacks, then on board Sasha can just chump with the birds or egg, or. Um, path it or something and then kill Robin. What was that? Wow. March of Otherworldly Robin's Light. Robin's paying six mana for a March of Otherworldly Light. Wow. Okay. So this is going to force Sasha to path to exile the elk? Yes. Because there's yeah. otherwise... Or, or chump with the birds, I suppose. But then that that's... Oh. <laughs> that's that's, that's one, way, one way of doing yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, that is one way of doing it. Um, Blocks... And this path. is the correct way to do yeah. it. You want to block first. Yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. Holy moly. This All has right. been an incredibly tight game. Yeah. Like both players are playing lights out magic. Um, they're both uh, ahead of the curve when it comes to anticipating what their opponent could be doing. Um, there have been back and forths where you thought one player was winning and then the other player was, has managed to regain the tempo. Like it, This has been an incredible game. This is yeah. This this game absolutely is a just a a clinic in what we mean when we say powerful magic. Yeah, definitely powerful magic. Straight cheesing from Chad says I'm sweating just watching this. <laughs> I know this is intense. How many left in library? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's typically not a problem in Highlander, but you know it's it's. <laughs> yeah. For a second, I mistook the life totals for game wins. No, the game wins is actually the opposite of the current life totals. Uh, that is... What blue draw spell is that? Sleight of hand? Sleight of hand, yeah. And that looks like Elvish Archdruid? or it's was It's Noble Hierarch. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes way more sense. <laughs> That's actually a clock. Well, yeah, when you're at two. Yeah, Robin's yeah. at two. He, he plays... He plays the Leyland Binding, and then he plays the Noble Hierarch and gets to attack with the bird for one. So he puts... Oh my goodness, you're right. Yeah, so he puts Robin on a one-turn clock, and Robin both has to deal with the either both creatures or like deal with the bird and have a blocker for the Noble Hierarch. We've oh. never seen Exalted be so relevant. <laughs> Both players at one. Robin opting not to eat his pie at the end of turn there. I It might be early to call it, but this might be the game of of the tournament. It's like this, very this is strong. A, this is a really, really intense game. Main phase, chow down on that food. Go back up to four, pass the turn back. Oh, boy. Sasha still has that completely dead fetch land in hand. In for one with the ignoble hierarch. Wait, did Robin? Oh, Robin gained life with the food token. Yep, Robin's at three All right. now. All right. Sasha playing. Oh, this is uh, the four mana green initiative card. Ah, now we're into the finally because the deck's called initiative. We haven't seen a lot of it. This is a huge amount of pressure for Robin because if uh, if the game goes longer and Robin isn't able to take the initiative, Sasha can just dome Robin for five. Right. Yeah. Also, this itself is just a huge body. Yeah, that's two more two more steps through the dungeon. Yep. It's got to go... There's so many threats now, yeah, because the Enderman Adventure is lethal on its own. Step 
or the room two of the initiative is putting two plus one plus yeah, one counters on the thing, which, relevant, which makes itself room three is relevant. Like yeah. the creature you play is relevant. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Robin's trying to figure out if he has an exit that doesn't look like it. That was Third Path I Iconoclast. I think we can say that I, whoever won this... Is that... What's happening oh. here? Is this the end? What happened? I guess... Did Robin just concede? I think, I think so. I think yeah, Robin I think our drew a land and drew Third Path Iconoclast, and that was it. Wow. Holy moly. What an absolutely intense game of magic. Ooh, that is ooh. powerful. Oh, that was amazing. Magic. Holy. Boy, oh boy, what a game. Oh, that was amazingly hard fought from both of our competitors. Like, yeah, that was tremendous. That, again, the mastery that we've seen from both of these players in that match, like figuring out exactly what position they're in, like what matters to them at every single board state was just phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, well played to uh, both our players there, but indeed it is uh, Sasha Christensen moving forward to the finals. We can take Congratulations. another quick peek <laughs> at the bracket. Uh, there we go, Sasha Christensen, Omnitiative, going into the finals. But who will Sasha face? Will it be David Brunson with Azorius Artifacts or Jack Han Hanukkah with Death and Taxes? Well, I don't know. How, how do I find that out, Graham? Oh, you just have to stay <laughs> tuned because uh, we'll be back for <laughs> round six uh, with Wheeler and Alex in the uh, commentary booth. And... Uh, I don't know what the where the rest of that sentence was we'll going. We'll be back. But but we'll be yeah, back for we'll, the finals. We're going to take a quick break. We're yeah. going to come back with uh, round six. With 100% more Wheeler, you'll see us yeah. in the finals. Don't go yeah. away. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the 2022 Canadian Highlander Year-End Championship brought to you by Loading Ready Run and Yellow Jacket Comics. Uh, Mimi Benjamin off by one Wheeler. And joining me in the booth, I've got Alex. Hello. How you doing? I'm well. How about yourself? Oh, I had a real pisser of a match earlier today, but, you know, it's we fine. Can, can, wait, you already had a, a, like, a game lost, but not through uh, ill sportsmanship. I was trying to make a gag there, but it's sort of like cratered. Um, Just like your record. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Joke's on you. I'm used to losing in the top eight. All right. Um, but... We have a matchup where the players are not used to losing in the top eight mm. because they've been winning their matches. Uh, we're about to go into round six uh, with our players being uh, David on blue-white artifact mid-range. Excited. Very generalized name, but you'll get the gist of it I'm once you I'm excited see to play. see an actual outing for this one because uh, it uh, unfortunately didn't get a chance to do much. It didn't do, yeah, it's it's an interesting deck and, and kind of an emergent arc, uh, archetype almost in the mm. past year or so of players starting to recognize, like, outside of even decks with a bunch of initiative cards, mm -hmm. hey, Moxen are pretty good. And also there's this card called Talarian Academy. Did you know it taps for like a bazillion minutes? Yeah, it doesn't take much. It's redonkulous. Um, and then Jack, of course, being on Mono White Death and Taxes. Um, don't get it twisted with the little color pips. It's just mental messed up and dry milt and making it look bant. Um, but Jack's been playing. I mean, he's a he, he's a D and T aficionado. Mm -hmm. If you couldn't tell by the very fancy versions of cards, um, it's a very very has, elegant deck. It's a I very like it pretty a deck. Very pretty deck, and one that he has been working on for quite some uh, mm -hmm. quite some time. So uh, I mean, hopefully that work will pay off. <laughs> I, if, oh yeah, 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 just it is tax time. I have something to do immediately after this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think we're about ready uh, to go into uh, the gameplay and see what our uh, what our friends have for round Yeah, this, six. Is, this is going to be a, a good old slugging match, I think. This is a big slugfest. Yeah. Um, both decks have access to, I believe both of them are running Stoneforge Mystic and have access to a bunch of equipment, mm. some spicy equipment. I hope we see dueling GTAs. Do you really? I mean, I don't have to play against them. That's true. Can you That's true. That? Ting, ting, ting. I, having played against Dueling GTAs in, um, I mean, with some regularity back in uh, when I played Legacy and was good at this game, um, air quotes, uh, it can get real messy. Real messy. 
But I mean Highlander. The creatures are big. Mm -hmm. Toughness is there. You know. Gita is there. The Gita is there. Yeah, the Gita is there. Um, well. It sounds Shall like we? they're ready. Shall yes, we? let's. Let's. Please. Please put some Magic the Gathering in front Show of Show us potato salad. <clears throat> So Both players kept seven. And we've got, all right, <laughs> wasting no time at all. Let's see if we can get a mirror uh, Mox land start. Both players on Mox Pearl. This, this right. could be one of these matchups where, contrary to popular belief, Highlander is not all about high rolling your opponent. Um, it is also about incremental Ooh. advantages. Oh, wow. The, the Sensei's dividing top getting mental misstep right out the gate. I'm getting word that Highlander is indeed about high rolling your opponent. Um, both decks would like to get fast mana off the ground, if possible. That lets them obviously do their thing ahead of schedule. But they both have a lot of long game. You know, they got tutors, they got protective creatures like uh, Giver of Runes and Mother of Runes. And Just Giver. Top is kind of a funny one. That Yeah, that is a, an interesting choice for a... Well, I mean, I hesitate to call it an aggressive deck, although it is... It has a lot of fairly aggressive creatures in it. The floor for a lot of cards in this deck, in the artifacts deck, is mm -hmm. that they are uh, cheap artifacts. Yeah. And so if it's a cheap artifact that you can get off uh, Urza Saga, or that could say, Pump Master of Ethereum. Yeah, th look, he's back. I guess he never left this this kind of archetype. He's always been pretty good. Don't call it a comeback. He's been here for years. <laughs> Don't talk to me or my son ever again. <laughs> Quite literally holding a child yep. made of... Ethereum or something? Assumably, yeah. Is that a Vettelkin? It is. And this is a Thalia's Lieutenant ah. off the Rising Canopy. Not one... This is where uh, creature types start to really matter. Jax list for death and taxes has a small-ish humans package humans the secret archetype or the the secret tribe mm -hmm. but if we want to talk big packages this master of ethereum just smashed in for three whole damage and keeping this man up is uh, a little suspect are we going to see a counter spell at some point Oh, what a charming lad. Ah, ha, ha, I see. Is he, he's choosing to flicker the lieutenant to get some... Uh... Mm. So if he flickered the lieutenant here, it would put the counter on the prince, so he'd have a 1-1 one, one, and 3-3. Three, three. Mm -hmm. Looks like Jack is just opting to go for the scry 2 and leaving the lieutenant in play just to get a 2-2 two, two body. Mm. Um, okay. One card on top, one card on bottom. That's the thing with Eldraine cards. It's just like the default, like, I guess I could use this mode, is still pretty good. Yep. Uh, channeling. Which one is that? A Ganjo Seat of the Empire. That's four damage to an attacking or blocking creature. This is kind of a sick spot where Giver of Runes has this line of text that it can tap to give protection from a color of your choice. Or colorless. Oh, so it does work against uh, against the land ability there. Yeah, doesn't come up too often, but when it does, uh, your opponent almost always forgets about it. And in this matchup, it can be quite relevant if we have artifact threats running around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Giver of Runes could be pretty potent against uh, this deck. Trundling in again. CD Mac in chat was asking, what points are both players playing? Um, both players are mostly using their points for fast mana. So David is running Soul Ring mm -hmm. for four points, Mox Pearl for three points, and then Mox Sapphire for another three points. Hey, you know what card finds all of those? Which? Urza Saga. An enchantment? No, it's a land. Oh, okay. And a Mardu Woe Reaper from Jack. You're not really doing anything. This isn't exactly the matchup you want it in. But, I mean, it pumps the Lieutenant, which uh, lets you get on the beats. It's one of a innumerable list of uh, one-drop pikers. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, this list is very spoiled for choice, and it only takes the, the, 
the very cream of the crop, unlike a... Oh, look. Oh, we have a Jite. Which helps segue into That's, what Jack's points are. Uh-huh. Flawlessly. Uh, Jack is also using a lot of the points uh, in fast mana, so Mana Crypt being five, Mox Pearl being three, with the final two points being opted towards Umezawa's Jite. And we get Odawara channel to bounce the Jite. Don't want to have that on the board and holding up Odawara for like, oh, what if I get it when they equip it? It's, uh... Yeah. Yeah. You want to use your mana to be pumping out these Karnstruck tokens and trying to make some ground here. <clears throat> so we've got some search options on deck, but just going to continue cracking away. He's been chipping away at Jack's life total pretty effectively so far. I don't know if this deck plays too many haste threats. Um, not a huge amount. I don't think in this version specifically we're going to see anything. Um, it does have flash threats, mm -hmm. and you could theoretically activate the Urza Saga at the end of turn, make a token, untap and do, yada yada. Um, These are going to be big constructs. Yeah, it's going to be quite big. It's that robot from uh, Borderlands, isn't it? <laughs> Graham... Uh, on a uh, card right here assuring us it's clap trap. How do you do? So this is seasoned dungeoneer. Uh, this is a fancy altar of it the uh, because it does not come in foil and well Jack wouldn't be able to sleep at night if <laughs> one of the cards in his deck is non-foil. Mm -hmm. As you can see the initiative token and the dungeons are foil. Wait, really? Yes. I didn't know that they came in that variety. Oh, yeah. Huh. Can slide more easily from room to room. <laughs> Glistening dungeon right there. Yeah. Glistening dungeon. So this represents a lot of pressure immediately. Getting to uh, trigger off of attacking off of basically, well, not everything, because as we see right now, Jack's creature type spread is a little off. The Mardu Woe Reaper itself is a, a warrior. Um, thank Khan's block for that. So you have a creature that can attack to get protection from creatures. So we can start to poke through here and get past these big robots. They're going to be very big robots. Because <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, the tokens are counting each artifact and getting pumped by Master of Ethereum. Yeah. So these are one, two, three, four, those are five fives? Yeah. <laughs> the Explore off of Mardu Woe Reaper here, uh, well, off of the Seasoned Dungeoneer making the Mardu Woe Reaper Explorer is going to be a Castle Ardenvale. It's a nice castle. Looks like, unfortunately, David missed a triggered ability on the Inventor's Fair there, which can help with the race. You need three artifacts in play in order to gain the life. But that's okay. It's token time. Some more. So these are now six sixes? Yes. <laughs> Versus Saga is an interesting magic card that creates Fetch. a lot of discussion amongst players. Fetching Shadow Spear? Oh, yeah. That's the good stuff. That's the, uh, the super bone splitter. So now they're seven sevens because the Shadow Spear comes into play. We got a pair of seven sevens. Uh -huh. The Shadow Spear, if it loads up on one of those constructs, that's an eight eight trample lifelink coming through. Uh, yeah. yeah. Notably the activated ability on Shadow Spear is only going to get around hexproof and indestructible. So not protection. The, exactly. Now, does protection reduce the damage to zero? It prevents the damage. Okay, so dope. he can actually effectively block. Something holding that spear. Yeah. Trample will muddy that up a little bit. Um, but still, I mean, you got to get you got to get your damage, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is scary. Yeah. 
It's going to be tough to push through 13 damage somehow. I'm thinking Jack might have to go on the defensive for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm a little surprised that Jack didn't take a slightly more defensive role with the Giver of Ruins mm. on a couple of the early attacks, because this is the situation that you end up in where um, you might run to some difficulty. Uh, so. Remember, Jack does have the Umezawa's GTA in hand, however, to oh, provide some amount of life gain. So we're looking at a triple <coughs> block on the Karnstruct. And the Giver of Runes is going to try and save the Veteran. Yep. Or a Seasoned Engineer. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, this will die for sure. These three are blocking this? Yes. Yeah, but this got protection from the And it was ordered for They're right now just figuring out all the damage being dealt, because there's a lot yeah. going on. Oh, right, because I don't gain for that. You don't gain for this, right? You're okay, right. Cool. So you gain yeah. three. You'll gain three life. My charming prince and my giver prince will die in your construct. So what they're doing right here is that they're just uh, double checking everything with how much damage is being dealt because the seasoned dungeoneer was given protection from colorless in combat there, um, which also protection prevents the damage, meaning that there is uh, not going to be life gained from the damage that would be dealt. You still have to effectively sign assign damage. So it's eating two, three. What's its toughness? Four. Oh, it's a pretty good soak. <laughs> Love a good soak. Yep. Let's get some Epsom salts, a cauldron complete, whatever. Let's put a spear in there. Why not? Go nuts. Buddy, that sounds like a great Just Sunday treat to me. Just treat yourself. It's the Ite. Going for the equip, asking permission. You never know. So this is going to potentially claw him back into this game. GTA is very potent. Ooh, that's a march of otherworldly light on top. This is. Right, that's the the. Um... Okay, so march. So march is on top. Oh, interesting. I did not realize it hits uh, artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. Mm -hmm. Notably, it can hit lands. So artifact lands or enchantment lands, for instance, like Urza Saga. Can be taken out with this for just one damage. Don't say. Yeah. So the CZDZ smacking in for six damage there and getting two counters on the GTA, but David being at a pretty hefty life total. Mm hmm. So as oppressive as GTA is, still got to play it cool. Um. And we don't have a Giver of Runes uh, hanging out anymore. Uh, do I see a solitude in David's grip there? Yeah. Okay, so if you draw your card from the turn, you can answer, right? Because it's the beginning of your upkeep. Sure. You um, <coughs> are we missing more triggers on Inventor's Fair, or are we trying to activate it? Uh, no, it looks like uh, a missed trigger on Inventor's Fair there. Yep. Suiting up and rolling in again. Or thinking about it. That's still a 7-7 seven, seven Trample Lifelinker. Mm -hmm. Jack is at 4. Virtually yeah, at 8 one. with the GTA. Yeah. Um, but depending on how Jack blocks or what Jack wants to play around, um, <clears throat> we could see a spot where... Um, you know, you might want to get some minus X, minus X, like give a creature minus one, minus one. Mm -hmm. uh, give the construct holding the Shadow Spear to limit some life gain. Looks like David had a play, though, opting to, uh, and deciding to uh, fetch the Arid Mesa instead of uh, taking the good old Canlander shortcut of, you know, just tapping it. <clears throat> Trust me, I'm good for it. I guess you have a dilemma here with those counters. It's like, do you use them to survive or do you use them to keep your opponent from clawing back this is this is something that comes up with cards like gta when it's not just a roll over your opponent with all their x ones where mm -hmm. you know are you making the play to survive or are you making the play to try and win the game yeah because david's at nine 
which is not nothing. But yeah. still, when he got a seasoned engineer and a four fourth alleys lieutenant. Ooh, hanger back Ooh, walker. Hanger back walker. <clears throat> Shiny boy. Yeah, so the hanger back walker there, uh, boosting both the large artifact lads. Dave, looking to play a little safe here. More damage. Oh, no. Solitude pitching Armageddon. I've never heard that pronunciation. And what, Armegadon? Uh, Armegadon? No, Armegadon. Yeah. I didn't know uh, that Jack was on dinosaurs in this deck. That's interesting. <laughs> Ooh, so that changes things quite a bit. Yeah. It's um, refilling David's life total quite substantially, but it's definitely worth it getting the um, uh, car instruct out of here. Right. And as Jack progresses throughout the dungeon, um, can I get some some loot? Getting to the trap, I believe, to minus uh, to dome out for five, as well as we know there's that march of otherworldly light in hand, um, which is pretty gross. Yeah, which route is he taking? Left hand? He's on forge. Yes. So contrary to what some people online might say, uh, you do go down both sides of this dungeon quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, especially in Death and Taxes. Um, but going down the more aggressive side, the left-hand channel with Forge and Trap, I mean, that's just a one-two punch that when you are in the driver's seat um, and have board control, great. Do yeah, that's, so. That's, that's savage. This board state is all of, a, all of a sudden looking not as good for David. Four counters on that Jitae. Jack is still at four. We know there's a March of Otherworldly Light in hand, which is a little awkward. But we do know that uh, David has a Solitude himself in hand. Mm -hmm. And if Jack has been committing to these attacks with only one creature, we might find a spot where uh, Solitude can pick off something holding the GTA and maybe catch, uh, maybe David can catch Jack in a spot where the attacks don't go as planned. What do you figure the best thing he could fetch off Inventor's Fair is? Hmm. I mean, a cranial, a cr cranial planning doesn't push the damage unless this hanger back walker produces a flying attacker. Mm -hmm. But even then, the GTA is pretty, pretty miserable for that. Um, I know that David has, uh, I believe, Phyrexian Revoker. Mm, that wouldn't be too bad. Which, uh, GT doesn't really have an opportunity to get rid of that, uh, to, to name um, yeah, I mean, the GT where Jack and then kill off things. Uh, so the deck looks lists are public now. Yeah. Really uh, whereabouts can people find those? Uh, there are, is a command in chat that can show the deck lists uh, being posted. Command deck list. Uh, we saw a concession there, from David. A um, little bit swarmed with stuff going on from the death and taxes list. And if you are watching on YouTube, the deck lists are in the description down below, along with other. Presumably other information regarding the format. And also uh, plugs for patreon.com slash loading ready run. And then I was like, we communicate to the future. That's kind of how it felt when you played the top and not a two. Yeah. Like, I was talking about that top. It's wild. I got the 33% chance that it's. It's certainly a different game if the top's in play mm, yeah. as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Why not, right? Maybe it's just sort of, you know, a cheap artifact that can pivot your play style. Because, you know, sometimes aggro decks do have to play the sort of control or tempo uh, right. mode, depending I, on the matchup. As somebody that also plays quite a bit of artifact decks, and for, for last year in particular, several of the tournaments that I won were off of um, the Welder, the, Gr the Grixis Welder, Jeskai oh, Goblin, Goblin Welder deck. Basically, 
a, an artifact mid-range list. Not as aggressive as David's version here, mm -hmm. but a deck that looks to play mid-range that can maybe pivot to control or pivot to, here's a turn to Kappa Cannon here, or whatever. Um, you get a lot of questions about why is this cheap artifact in your deck? And the answer is usually just, it repl it, I need to have a density, and it replaces itself. So the cost of inclusion is relatively low. Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, that style of card, it's not, it's not just an egg. It's a card that pays for itself in a way and draws It's a weird way of else. just sort of like having value without, you know, with it on the board rather than in the dumpster. Right. What if your cantrips also increased your cranial plating damage? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Um, or it could be recast yeah, off of cards yeah, like Luris or Tutor. You know, there's just a lot of little <coughs> shocking, I'm sure, synergies in your what? synergy strategy. I know. Good dunk, a dunk. Looks like David's on the play here, going into game two. Yeah, I'm looking over David's deck list right now. So 37 creatures, a large amount of those are artifacts. Um, 20 artifacts. Nice. A lot of those are also artifacts. I'd get out. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a whole bunch of artifact lands now we've received from Modern yeah, we got a, 2. How many did we get? Did we get a full 10? We got a full 10 of the dual lands. Uh, That's crazy, honestly. Yeah. David's on Razor Tide Bridge, the blue-white indestructible uh, tap land that's an artifact. Mm -hmm. Also on Treasure Vault, which is just kind of an untapped artifact land. Uh, Power Depot, another one from Modern Horizons. Yes, the, uh, the modular the one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Which I think is actually a reason why we've seen this deck you know, show up over the past year, is that... We've just gotten more cards that are incidentally artifacts, which means getting up to a level in which your uh, synergy cards are threatening is so much easier, and you get to do so without playing unplayable cards like Hover Mirror. <laughs> no comment. Um, there is a lot of new, um, pretty aggressive uh, white artifact creatures. Particularly coming out of um, Modern Horizons 2. Yeah. Like they, they had a whole modular sub theme that was tied mostly to white. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Um, none of the Arcbound cards from that set show up in this, but it's not. Really? It's. Uh, I know David has tried, I believe, Arcbound Mouser, the one mana 1 1 modular lifelink, yeah. for instance. Uh, there's a chance that Skrelv, a brand new card from, well, a relatively new card from one mm -hmm. that came out, which is also a one mana white artifact creature, could have replaced that. Gotcha. You know? We're on our way. Vroom, vroom. Soul Ring. And, oh, Soul Ooh. Ring into Cranial Plating. That's a, that's a hot start. The Sauron uh, altar there. Very nice. So answering equipment with a tutor for <coughs> his own equipment. <laughs> this is truly an equipment mirror match here. Um, both players have quite a few pieces of equipment. Um, let's. I'm going to take a look at them actually right now. There's a chance that Jack is either just going to find him as was Jute, pretty good in this. Ironically, it looks like it's even depicted in Steel Shaper's Gift. It's very close. It looks an awful lot like a Jute. It's very close. Uh, it's Skull Clamp. Clamp's another good one. So there's a core of equipment that we see throughout most decks that are on uh, Stoneforge Mystic and equipment packages. Skull Clamp, Shadow Spear, and Umizawa's Jite. Then Death and Taxes takes it one step further because they have fast mana, they have uh, a bunch of ways to replay their Stoneforge Mystic and whatnot. Um, and Jack goes up to Cauldra Complete. Another card from Modern Horizons. The too. Complete Package. Oh, there's Ooh, that I treasure like vault. The Dungeons and Dragons retro style. Mm -hmm. Is that an ancient tomb? That is ancient tomb, mana. You can't see it, but I'm doing the hand thing. They, they can see it. They can see in their mind's eye. Oh, and we've got a hate... <clears throat> a, it's not a bear, because it's a 3-3. Three, three. Anointed Peacekeeper. Mm -hmm. This is one of these weird white cards that mimics uh, black hand attack. 
Yeah, we've seen kind of a dip into so cards like that, that white cards that basically say, I'm not saying you can't do this. Just you're gonna pay for it. I'm just saying you gotta pay a little bit more. I'm going or to make it inconvenient. For yes, you. or you only get half. Yeah. Would you settle for half? So we flashed out a hull breacher, and so the peak is seeing two lands and a trinket mage. There's two more to cast and two more to activate. God, that trinket mage looks so good in the oh, retro yeah. border. That's, oh. a, that's a nice plunder magic right there. What language is that? Deutsch. Deutsch just. Um, David does have the mana to cast this trinket mage. Uh, even with the uh, anointed peacekeeper popping into play, so Unless they're mad at even they're with yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the peacekeeper yeah. kind of hitting the yeah, board, yeah. it could be cranial plating here. We could just be looking to uh, yeah, lock Davy out or of no, cranial plating or Odawara. I believe the the call here was Odawara Soaring City. Hmm. What if I just play it? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> David saying, what if I just play my Odawara? Ha, ha. Which is a valid thing to bring up. I mean, if we're looking to develop mana, we're not bouncing this anytime soon. It, it, David did have multiple lands in hand at the time. And so, don't need to play it, but it does have some flexibility there. So what do you think your Trinket Mage is finding here? That's a great question. Um, it's like Mox, Artifact Land. David think... is missing white mana right now. Not yeah. really anything in the current that he's looking to cast with it, but still. Like an expedition map. Ooh. So he wants a non artifact land. That sounds like an Urza Saga target to me. Or it sounds like something that can find I was going to say saga. the irony of using Trinket Mage to find Urza Saga that finds a zero drop. <laughs> Or one drop. <laughs> yeah. He's just getting really sour. It's just like, you know, I could have found that for you. <laughs> like, two weeks sooner. Good old expedition map. Crunching in with the cranial plating. Yeah, big old Trade hole breacher in. coming in. Yep. Just getting blocked by the Anointed Peacekeeper. Oh, it's um, Hope of Giraper. This is real scary with uh, cranial plating. Yeah, holds it quite well. Jack's hand looking like a couple of lands in a, a Skull Clamp. We have um, Skull Clamp, Cave of the Frost Dragon, a Gonjo Castle. The uh, Kamigawa, Champions Kamigawa one. Uh, a Siege... Is that Siege Veteran? From Brothers War. There's a Recruiter of the Guard as well. So mm -hmm. it looks like Jack could be doing his own tutoring here shortly. Oh, this is the old Iganjo? Yeah. So I was going to say the new one would be pretty live against uh, Hopi Giraper here. Mm -hmm. so going for a Recruiter. Oh, Finding Solitude. Classic line. That's a hot pick. Yep. Is it, is it a 2-2? Two -two? It's a 3-2. Good gravy. Yes, it's not bad. That's... Uh, mm. Especially, I mean, on one hand, this could just be insurance. Jack doesn't feel too pressured, and Death and Taxes has a lot of tools of getting you know rid of creatures and not really, care, not really caring about what kind of creatures on the board. Right, it's all exile. It just scales to whatever, how much you want to commit into getting rid of it. Um, and the skull clamp can help if Jack ends up putting himself in a spot where he, you know, effectively two for ones does the pitch cast to solitude. Could be. Clamp the recruiter, draw yourself some cards. Yeah, I could see that. Looks like Hope of Giraper is getting in, as is. Solitude is getting flashed in, pitching Sun Gold Sentinel there. 
the Garriper is gone, so. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. So that's six life. Wow, that was attacking it for six damage. Crunch. Still getting these Trinket Mage beats in. God, you mentioned the interview that uh, Recruiter had with Solitude. It's like, what do you think your qualifications? <laughs> You present a compelling case. You're hired. David cracking the map here. I would imagine Urza Saga. Did play a land, played the Sea of the Synod here. I do like the idea of just like ripping the map in half and finding the place. Yeah. We're here. Rip. Wow, you were right. Getting the Urza Saga. I mean, ultimately, in the long run, it's going to get more goodies for for the fetch. Yeah. Looks like Jack drew a Thalia Heretic Cathar, I want to say. Got to pull off. Uh, the three drop? Yeah, the three mana, three, two, one. That's a good one. That is, I believe, my quick glance read on... Yeah, it is. Boom. Oh, going for the Siege Veteran, though, instead. I guess you want to get this ticking quite a, quite a bit sooner rather than later. It does have kind of an interesting uh, synergy with Recruiter of the Guard and Skull Clamp. Oh, goodness gracious. Yep. Yeah, this is a card where you look at it and you go, oh, cool, it's a Luminarch Aspirin number two. I'm, I'm happy to have it. Um, and maybe I'll get a, a soldier here and there. There are so many soldiers in Death and Taxes. Feed just incidental soldiers. soldiers. So with Skull Clamp in this, we get to clamp the Recruiter, make ourselves another 1-1, one, one, and then obviously draw two off Skull Clamp. And then we can clamp the 1-1 one, one again if we want. And so we go from a, a, a point where we're looking at Jack's line with the, the Solitude off the Recruiter of the Guard and saying, like, well, he's, he's down so many cards in doing this. And now he's just back in it. He is at 12, though. That Ancient Tomb has been costing him a couple of life points here and there. Worth. <laughs> Suiting up. Trinket Mage, rumbling in, yep. Getting in. The chomps. Looks like Fight as One from Akoria. Oh, is that uh... Esper Sentinel, which, guess what? It's, it's a soldier. A, it's a, good, wow. Yep. Imagine you show up on the first day and they just like slam a, a skull clamp on you. Sounds like the military. Extraction specialist <laughs> coming in here as well, being able to rebuy. Oh, uh, wow. Is that yeah. going to get back? Uh, well, what's that going to take back? Mana value two or less? Yeah, that's going to get back. Uh, we'll just get back this as per Sentinel. No, you know what, JK? We'll haul you out of the dumpster. <laughs> Is that a wasteland? Uh, Horizon Canopy. An unorthodox means of drawing cards off Esper Sentinel. <laughs> yeah. The capability of this deck to go really wide is remarkable. Mm -hmm. I mean, this it's one of the reasons why Death and Taxes is um, almost universally agreed upon as one of the top five archetypes in the format. What are the other four? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble with the internet. Um, As if it could possibly get worse. For Jeskai Green, mm -hmm. um, however you want to cut it. Uh, Breach Storm. Okay. It's a pretty good deck. Gruel Monsters. Oh, baby. And then number five. Is it Red Deck? Probably Red Deck wins. Yeah. Eggs. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Mm. Ha, ha, ha. Got an Urza Lord High Artificer here. Ooh, that's a good one. And he's got a robot with him. 
not to play into the meme of uh, saying eggs is one of the best decks in the format, but I will say that one of the best things you could do in Canadian Highlander in 2023 is make as many Karnstrucks as possible, they, basically. They snowball pretty hard. They are so good. They work with each other. And again, you just have more pieces of, um, you know, incidental artifacts. Mm. Uh, great joke from Graham here in chat saying, surely it's spelled Ah, Gruel Monsters. <laughs> this is a reminder to anybody that gets that joke um, to get up and stretch. And uh, have you taken your vitamins today? How's your back doing? All right, what do we have going on here? It's always difficult to see. Uh, Foil cards at an angle like this. Yes. Um, we have Thalia Heretic Cathar is at the front of Jack's hand right now. That's the 3 2 that causes creatures and non basic lands to ETB tapped. Now, between rounds, Jack said that he would make a, an effort to uh, having his hand more visible from camera. I hate to see him not following through on that. <laughs> he's, he's concentrating. Why? Is something important going on? No, oh, you wouldn't. Going down to eight life here, casting the Thalia. So with Urza out, um, David is able to tap equipment to add mana, uh, which allows for another car instruct to come down on the table here. We got two six sixes. Those are big boys. And I would be shocked if that Urza Saga found anything other than Shadow Spear. Yeah. It was no. pretty good the first time. Mm -hmm. That said, Extraction Specialist here does have lifelink. It's tucked in at the top <laughs> of the card. You have, you have to excuse them. This is a card from uh, Streets of New Capenna, so they can only fit so many paragraphs on it. Going to David's turn, we have a draw step here, and then uh, looking to see if we're going to make a Karnstruck before we end up tutoring. Because if your timing's good, you can get two of them out of Urza Saga. Yes, yeah. The uh, the timing, the Urza Saga of anything, uh, it has really helped people understand how sagas work in relation to cards like Blood Moon or Alpine Moon. Um, the timing on sagas. Mm. Girl can't do that on television. I don't know. But... <laughs> and it's a Tarmogoyf that eats you. Mm. Look at that pile of tokens. Is that a War of the Worlds Thopter? I, Jack being a nice guy here, I believe it's a world, uh, War of the Worlds Construct token. Fantastic. Offering uh, David uh, his own Karn struck token. The war, the, the uh, Martian tripods here to stomp around. Tripod? No thanks, I'm off creature combo. Anyways, David's looking to find a Shadow Spear. Got Graham to laugh. That's a good one. <clears throat> oh, hoo -hoo! hot dog, we've got an egg. Basilica Skull Bomb. So this is a... God, this card's spicy. One mana artifact, pay one, sack and draw a card, or pay two and a white, sack it, target creature control, gets plus two, plus two, and flying until end of turn, and you draw a card. You can only use it as a sorcery. That's okay. I'm fascinated by, like... I feel like I still haven't quite grokked why you're so high on these cards. I mean, obviously, the text, you know... One sack it, draw a card is very good. That's a large part of it. What what's the most broken what are the most broken three words on magic cards? Uh draw a card. Yeah, right. Or in the case of Audacity, draw a card. But anything with draw got another gram laugh. Anything with draw a card on it is going to be able to replace itself. So this card can hit the table, kind of up, up, up your count for cards like cranial plating, cards like um, oh, the constructs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're you're using it to jump. Yeah. 
one of your homies. If you want to cycle it, you can cycle it. Pay one at any time, draw a card. If you want to really cash in and try to go for the gold here, then you can, well, you can go for that gold. The, the Skull Bomb in particular as well, and the other Spell Bombs, they can uh, be tapped to cards like Urza, Lord High Artificer. Mm. Okay, that makes, and then yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. So it uh, looks like we did send something up top. We're, we played them out of a Mock Sapphire here, and we're crashing with everything. I think if I only have a Flyer... So when are you going to make a deck called Omelette du Fauage? Mm, the last eggs variant I built put me in the hospital, so I might take I, a breather on that. What? I'll, t I'll tell, you between, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you between games. Okay. Some complex combat math going on here. Jack Hanka trying to not die. Together. Yeah. Okay. These Admirable die. goal. This will live. This will die. This will die. Notably, Jack has two lands that hurt himself: the Horizon Canopy and the Ancient Tomb. He can cash in the Horizon Canopy whenever. But we're getting to a point where, you know, if he's not dead here, he will be unable to reliably tap that Ancient Tomb. Mm -hmm. No, you're supposed to die and pay taxes. It's another. It's another. I will trigger to draw two cards though. So yeah, with all things said and done here, uh, David opting for a line that sends the most creatures at Jack here to not just get blown up by a single removal spell. Um, and we, when the dust is clear, Jack has drawn some cards off of a skull clamped extraction specialist dying. On to two. Um, and we got a bunch of cards in hand. We have some mana that ancient tombs tapped off or uh, tapped off. It's it's not really. Uh, an option for us here. It's a lot of cards in hand. Mm -hmm. Just sort of segregating that ancient tomb in the don't tap. Yeah. Jack's death land, do not tap. Please do not tap. So we kind of have a fun line where, depending on how this shakes out, we can attack with everything and then instant speed equip the cranial plating using the oft-forgotten black, black instant speed activation. Uh, off of treasure tokens we make with treasure vault. Oh, oh it's shadow spear. That's a good one. That's a good one. Going for the equip. Again, David's not really threatened right now by Jack's board. Um, it's just the life gain could make the next turn a little awkward. Seems like it'd be a real headache. Yeah. David at 18, Jack at 6 here. Has a hand with Usher the Fallen, Mental Misstep. Some other stuff. Some other stuff. Ooh. Tapping the Ancient Tomb to Taking throw it on the, the post it yeah. note off of there. <laughs> yeah. How reckless. I do like um, Shadow Spear on Thalia for first strike. Judge Nelson here just making sure that all the players are on the same page, providing a caution as... Uh, uh, wait, hold on. Why are you doing that, Nelson? Oh, the land coming to play untapped, I see. Untapped. Nelson gestured to the Mock Sapphire, which is why I was from our POV. Oh boy, here we go. This is exciting. Mental misstep. So David fires off a path to exile. Jack has the mental misstep. No real way of actually adding blue mana uh, in the deck. And David made sure to pay for the Esper Sentinel trigger as well. Don't want him drawing cards. Ooh, okay. So David has a retrofitter, retrofitter foundry? foundry, which is a very nice card to have. It does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, <clears throat> David also has a Michiko, Michiko's Reign of Truth, 
which is a saga, with chapter one and two being effectively cranial plating, but toughness as well. And then it turns into, well, a construct. <laughs> that also accounts enchantments. Gosh. We're just looking to crack in with everything here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight artifacts in play. Those are two eight eights. Um, David has enough mana to generate a servo token, which could then create a nine nines. Uh, but as you can see, it's too much. All right, so that's one and one. So there was a deck list I was building called mm -hmm. Dregs which was an eggs variant that used dredge cards to further basically replace my draws with dredging okay. to dump my entire deck into my graveyard and then kill with loops involving the graveyard. Sounds pretty good. Um, I was a little concussed at the time, and it definitely pushed me over the edge of, hey, I'm doing this too much. So that's the lore on an eggs variant um, okay. sending me to the hospital. Um, and we just saw a game where we had an egg send Jack to... Um, the hospital. Well, to the funeral home. Well, not yet. This is a best of five, my dear boy. Oh, that's true. I guess that's sort of how it goes. It's like the, it's like boxing or something. Yeah. I mean, this is a good. That was a very good example of showing just how big David's deck can go. How Urza Saga and Karnstrucks just get way out of hand. So this is almost like a sort of uh, pump up competition. You know, who, see who can get this, the most swole. Yeah. The fastest. Yeah. Jack's list goes uh, can go wide and um, has a lot of the points, the power points, put into going tall. If that makes sense. Mm, yeah. So when Jack can make a lot of tokens that can chump block these constructs reliably, but the real damage is being dealt by something with a GT, uh, something with a seasoned dungeoneer, uh, kind of smacking about. Um, whereas David's deck can go wide and tall, but it gets the uh, points from having a lot of large lads. It's a little slower. Yep. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Like mm -hmm. both of them can try to just high roll each other, but at the same time, we've seen both of these games kind of grind out, like getting to a spot where either player looks like they could be at a turning point. Mm hmm Okay, I would like to play. Sure. First time. Okay. Well. Jack is going to be on the play here, uh, going into game three. Reminder to folks at home, this is a best of five. Well, like if I look at it, uh, the other semifinal match yeah, that was between Robin and Sasha was also a best of five, which concluded with Sasha advancing to the finals. Jack was uh, overheard saying that this is the first time he is on the play in uh, the tournament. Now, I'm not here to verify that statement, Jack's an honest guy, and I'm tired of chat saying otherwise. Looks as though Jack's taking a mulligan here. David is still deciding whether or not we're keeping this hand. Looks to be a yes. Yeah, I've gotten lots of that higher than average rate too. Well. I haven't played that many games, actually. This is my third game today. But you're three games today. You've opened David mentioning uh, a higher than uh, average mox draw on his end uh, allowed. Um, very humble man, David Brunson. Great guy. Both of them are great guys. You get what I'm saying, chat. <laughs> chat, I'm tired of you pitting me against our competitors and against you. I'm not here to antagonize you. I do that for free. I'm here to talk about the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship, the top eight playing out, second semifinal match here. I'm here to fill time for that. The first place reward for this tournament, the glory. Also a personally inscribed trophy. Personally inscribed by whom? Uh, me, I'm going to do it at, at, at home. Uh, no, we are getting it professionally done. Fantastic. And they're off. 
So right into uh, Giver of Runes. Pretty live against this deck. Yeah, funny enough, <laughs> this is one of the few instances where you want your opponent to have Mother of Runes instead of Stepmom. And, <laughs> and this is a card you do not want to see out of Jack. Hopeful Initiate. Um, one mana, one, two, training. Training being when it attacks if something with power greater than it also attacked. You put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. Then you can pay three uh, mana, remove two 1-1 one, one counters from among creatures you control, destroy target artifact or enchantment. So Blink Moth Nexus uh, is casting... Signal uh, Pest. Signal Pest, and we've got Skrelv Defector Might. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see some poison tokens laid this game? Uh, for Paul's sake, I hope not. We, <laughs> But we do have an anointed... Peacekeeper here, revealing a hand of Path to Exile, Phyrexian Metamorph, Wasteland, Stone Coil Serpent, and Thought Monitor. You know what, uh, what was, what's the name of the card that... Vaguely describe it. Uh, I was trying to make a reference to Thought Monitor. It's like, you know what, that card needs a body. <laughs> you know what, Thought, Thought Monitor is good and all, but can we get a sorcery version of it that costs two less mana? <laughs> There is no sideboard in this format, Squee. No sideboards, no commanders, and the only companions are the ones you include in your deck and the friends you make along the way. I'll say if you die in game, you die in real life. Unfortunately true. Um, I have some terrible news for my husband. <laughs> He's going to be so grumpy. <laughs> It looks like Anointed Pers... What did this Peacekeeper name? Something is written... Is that Skrelv? That looks to be Skrelv. It's an interesting attack. Going to have to ask Jack here uh, to potentially write with a larger marker of some sort. Or just like draw an angry face in the shape of the card it's mimicking. Well, no poison tokens right now. Well, you gotta fetch that prismatic vista before you tap it. Divi attacking with the signal pest and the Skrelf here. Not sure what we're looking to set up. Yeah, that's um well we'll see if he's got a plan here. Is, does he maybe have like a raid card? I'm trying to think of something with revolt. Uh, just to catch a couple of questions that have popped up into chat as we have some shuffling going it on. Uh, this is the 2022 championship, so it's the top eight playoffs from uh, players that competed in the 2022 uh, local tournament scene. Um, why are we doing this in April? You try getting eight Magic players together in one room. Draft, you'll take whoever. This, we had to get specific. So casting Metamorph... Paying life, targeting the Giver of Ruins. It's going to come into play as a copy of Giver of Ruins. That's pretty funny. Still an artifact, in addition to its other types. Um, the other question that I saw pop up uh, is uh, regarding what we call Canadian gold, which is that Davey has a uh, tournament or a champion edition of Wasteland. Ah, a of gold course, bordered yes. Wasteland. Um, so it is not a format rule relating to there's no format rule relating to gold bordered cards no. or proxies or anything it's so entirely up to the scene. discretion mm -hmm. of the tournament organizer the shop all that jazz and obviously not legal for sanctioned play but this is not a sanctioned tournament not everybody can own a black lotus or a time walk or whatever yeah those cards are expensive and it's not even just those sometimes people have those cards they just don't have the other cards. Mm. They might have Power 9, they might not have cards that have been catapulted uh, into the stratosphere because of Modern or Commander. Yeah, or, I mean, they have Power 9, but they're smart and they keep it in a lead-lined box six feet underground. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> 
Uh, we got a Stone Coil Serpent hitting the table. This is a certainly an underplayed card in Canadian Highlander. I know this is actually one that Jack has talked about. I love this card. I, I jam it into um, Black Mold every chance I get. It's just so good. 1-1 one, one counter pun not intended. It, it scales incredibly well. Um, it, it's a, a good target for Trinket Mages, a good target for uh, Ranger Captain Novios. We saw a Luminarch Aspirin hit uh, the table earlier, which is really helping this hopeful initiate. I mean, the uh, large bodied anointed peacekeepers also letting this uh, get a couple of counters. And Stick with me, kid, you'll learn something. <laughs> the, uh, the peacekeeper, or sorry, not the peacekeeper, the initiate's interesting as you can remove the counters off of uh, any of your creatures you control to start blowing up artifacts. The devil, you say. Yeah. So presumably Oh, it's this even is... better than that. It's from among, so you can uh, like space it out. Yeah, yeah. So you could take one off of Hopeful Initiate and one off of somewhere else. Right. Exquisite. If I target the Stone Coil, target the Gibbon. Because it's not There's only one Ooh. target. Right? My one problem with these tournaments is that I always see a bunch yeah. of singles that I need. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. Alex, how do you feel about Harm's Way? I love Harm's Way. Well, for all those Harm's Way lovers in chat, here's oh, a Harm's baby. Way. Oh, baby. <laughs> Let's go. One white instant. Next two damage a sorcerer choice would deal to you or a permanent you control is dealt to target creature or player instead. So this is an interesting interaction where you don't target with the source that is being prevented, which can cause some issues for cards like Mother of Ruins or Giver of Ruins. Um, and if you're just redirecting to the face, they can't protect mm -hmm. themselves. Um, yeah. You know, my I think my solitary um, sort of thing that I, I don't like about Harm's Way is that you can't give it lifelink. I tried doing that once. Soulfire Grandmaster? Yeah, I think I tried giving it Death Touch too, and I was like, oh, oh man. The dream. Oh, well. It's still an excellent card yeah. with excellent art. And it messes up combat math. Emery, Lurker, the Lock. My queen. He's about to lob a scimitar here. We've got an Aether Spell Bomb, a Cranial Plating, a Gonjo Seed of the Empire, and Thraven Inspector in the graveyard here. We are kind of hitting a point where, I mean, David's at six. Jack had a fairly powerful start here. Give her runes on turn one, really muddying up how the rest of this game's going. Uh, yeah, that's tricksy. Expedition map. We're not really in Urza Saga territory, or at least not, not in a, in a way that's too productive. I want to say, it takes some time. If David has the tools to be able to block and get through this, God bless him. Hmm. You'll start making card constructs. That is one way to try and get back into the game. Just seize the means of production. Yes, comrade. <laughs> Again with the Urza Saga. Yeah, so end of turn, we are removing a couple of counters off the uh, Hopeful Initiate here to try and blow up the Stone Coil Serpent. So the counters, we got a counter off this Luminar Casperin. And depending on where this counter uh, goes, I mean, even if it goes on the Hopeful Initiate, we got a 4-4 Anointed Peacekeeper here. It's a big boy. Yep. We're, we're looking at a pretty scary attack here. Any chance there's a second gets pointed? I don't think so. Uh, no. Not. A, I mean, I think it's a reflex um, to consider cards instantly pointable like there was a uh, was a micromage oh micromancer a uh, micromancer yeah. yeah because it's like well it finds an artifact yeah urza saga it's fine existing in this format does more good than her yeah yeah it's a cool card it's a cool powerful it's a card and it's okay to have a number of cool powerful cards that see a lot of flexibility yeah, and cool breathe life into these artifacts. it's cool powerful but not oppressive yeah not like, oh, I don't know, GTA. In the decks where Urza Saga is doing the most harm, 
and yep. by that I mean the most degenerate things possible. <laughs> um, there are other cards that are leading, lending to that degeneracy. It's Black it, Lotus, for it's instance. It's being enabled. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's an appealing card to talk about, but not happening anytime soon. Yeah. There we go. I was game three going One to Jack. And two. Back to the booth. So, yeah, what was with that uh, Skrelv attack? So there, I'm getting, I'm hearing some stuff from the players right now about how Skrelv couldn't block, Skrelv couldn't do anything, <laughs> uh, and Davey was under the impression he could sneak in some damage, maybe, because why would you attack with this? And you know what? I love it. Okay. I love a good bluff attack. Yeah? Not enough people just attack in the early turns when they have nothing. Because, like, I mean, what are you up to? I mean, that one... What are you doing? That one's, you know, who's to say? You who's might want to wanna keep it for an artifact count later. It might hold mm -hmm. something. But it's not really doing anything. And you know what? Hell yeah, Dave. Hell yeah. That's a, that's a sick bluff. If it works, whew, one point of damage. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's maybe it's the same as when you blind name stuff. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to do it. Yeah. Like, I mean, I did that once with uh, Cabal Therapy, blind naming Palancron. I'll always treasure that one. And who is this targeting? Uh, the High Tide player. And who is the High Tide player? I don't remember. Okay. Sorry, you'll have to understand if you think this is maybe a dig against me. If it's not against <laughs> it's, no, me. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Probably Kilby. It was just, yeah. Hopefully Kilby. Mm -hmm. Um. So we're going into game four. Davey's on the play. That's good. That's where he wants to be. Obviously, everybody kind of wants to be on the play. Some decks operate a little bit better if they have more cheap reactive tools uh, while they're on the draw. Um, and we're hoping we're back into the game right now. And I mean, if we're Davey, we're looking for mox draws. We're looking for uh, creatures that scale really well early on. Cards like Ingenious Smith. Mm-hmm. It's almost like who can snowball the fastest. Now hold on. Huh? Not for this. That not necessarily. They can both do that. Mm. If you wanted to see a snowball fight, um, well, I would have had to have won my first match, but <laughs> we knew that wasn't happening. Um, looks like Jack is mulliganing here. Davis kept his hand. God, I cannot think of a more stressful mulligan than ones in a tournament like this. It can be tough, you well, know? you're just, like, so much at the mercy of, you know, the heart of the cards. We... I, I think it also just kind of gets missed by um, viewers or, or individuals that don't regularly play on camera, even in lower stress events. Mm. Playing on camera is so infinitely harder yep. than you would ever believe it is. And neither Jack nor David uh, do this on the regular. Mm -hmm. So they're a little out of their element. And this is a pretty high-stress environment. Uh, Comp REL, we got a table judge. We got people watching. Shout-outs to the people lights. watching. Got studio lights, you know. It's tough. It is. It asks a lot out of you. And so people might not, you know, you, we might see a slip up here. We might see people take aggressive lines when they don't need to or whatever. But that's fine. That's just magic. This yeah. happens at all levels of play. Mm -hmm. Except for me, I play perfectly. Jack's opening to keep this six-card hand. <laughs> Thought I could squeak and that away out. Away we go. Windswept Heath pass. Jack having a turn one Aether. Oh, Vial. that's hot. Ooh. Turn one Aether Vial is... Very good. Spicy. So this isn't um, necessarily going to sneak around any counter spells, is it? Does, no. Does he play counter spells? Get this. Uh, David has a total of three instants. Uh huh. Swords to Punishers, Path to Exile, Blacksmith's Skill. So All two right. removal spells and then a protection slash pump spell. So this is going to behave more as a, like a pseudo ramp effect. Yeah, it's going to help accelerate, well, it's going to act as a uh, mana positive card as well as the timing for a lot of powerful ETBs mm. uh, or, you know, 
if David's going to get a lot of uh, pressure through equipment and set, you know, setting up attacks with certain expectations of the board looking one way or the other. Um, yeah, Ether Bottle is one of these just very flexible, like innocuous seeming, but very potent cards. It's obviously the nuts on turn one, right? Real good. Um, but a lot of players tend to undervalue this card in uh, creature archetypes because they think, well, what if I draw it on like turn five? Well, then it's like, well, yeah, well, you what have if, a dead draw. What if you do? But it's not even that dead. You just have something that is not great, but it will scale to having some relevance mm -hmm. in play. You know? Maybe I should play either vial. See? It's working. Blink Moth Nexus. Oh. Aether Sworn Canonist. Kind of funny into Aether Vile in that, oh no, I can't play, I can only play one spell a turn, one artifact oh, spell. No. Oh, there's a lot of hot sort of turn <clears throat> ones. Yep. Did, wait, did he keep a one lander? Potentially. Jack is on a mulligan. A one lander with Aether Vile. That's not uh, so bad. Yep. And Jack did draw a Giver of Ruins for the turn here. Okay. So we have something that we can vial in, which is nice. Sometimes you only need one land. I did notice that David has a Teferi Time Rattler in hand, which can reset the Aether Vial Yikes. if need be. Maybe draw a card. Like, neither player, this is kind of interesting, because both players can be very explosive, right? Mm. We can have our fast mana starts, we can have a start with a cranial plating. Um, but it's not, you're not really demanding that of your deck in order to actually play, uh, to progress your, your game plan. And so, even if David just plays this Teferi, like, resets this Aether Vial a couple of turns, knowing that Jack's on this mulligan uh, and the one lander, and then just keeps the Canis to block... Mm. Like, doesn't know about the Giver of Ruins. We're going to see, presumably, a Giver of Ruins, or an Esper Sentinel is also in Jack's hand. Again. So that makes sense as to why this is, you know, if you keep a one lander that has Legion's Landing, uh, Aether Vial. And Giver of Ruins. And, um, yeah, and the Sentinel. That uh, Yeah, that's not so bad. Yeah. So now Jack has to kind of think, like, do I want to kill off this Teferi by getting aggressive with the Mum? Maybe uh, pumping or protecting? Opting to attack with both is kind of interesting. I mean, yeah. Well, I think he just really wanted to put that Teferi away. Yeah, I think I end up prefer... I'd be curious to see why he would not just give the token um, protection from white. Oh, yeah. Maybe both players had a pact at the beginning of the match <gasps> that they both have to throw away one one mana white creature each <laughs> over the course of this match. Well, there's that pressure you're talking about. Emery's back. For sure, yeah. Could be worried about Solitude, but then you're getting mucked by Solitude either way. Yeah, Emery here, milling. Uh, looks like Hangerback Walker, Sensei's Divining Top, Etch Champion and Trinket Mage. Got that second land. Yep. Um, I see a Leonin Arbiter. Sure is. Which I think is coming down. Well, that's his spell for the turn. I'm going to do my darndest to make sure that this pun rolls off the tongue quite well. Captain Kirk. Get it? Because it looks like Captain Kirk. He's yeah. like cat, and he's a cat. Ooh, David with the swords to plowshares on the end step, looking to get that Leonin Arbiter out of the game here. Toasty. Could also unlock a couple of fetch lands that maybe David has in hand, or tutor effects again. This deck does get some strength off the tutors. Drawing a mock sapphire for the turn looks like it. Ooh, it looks like a nettle cyst yep. in hand as well. Does that one count enchantments as well? I believe so. Just a big old ball of hate. Activating Emery. Gonna pick 
at it, champion. Oh, wow. Edge champion with Metalcraft Online. Yeah, not not bad against a mono white deck. Oh, and playing an egg. Yes, let's go, Davy. <laughs> playing out an Aether Spell Bomb here as well. We have redundant artifacts here to keep the champion alive. Vial up to two. We're gonna start getting some uh, getting some real cards coming down here. Looks like Jack's hand is Luminarch Aspirant, so that's something that can come into play here and start progressing eventually. Um, there's a White Plume Adventurer, so with the cheap initiative card, the three mana one, which will let Jack uh, hit his third land as well off the Aether Vial. And I believe a Siege Veteran, which in combination with the Luminarch Aspirant is just brutal. Does Jack have any way of dealing with this uh, Etch Champion? So... I don't, I don't believe so. There was a time when you would run into Death and Taxes lists playing a Council's Judgment. Mm. And, and from time to time, you still will see that. It's just a, you know, it's a deal with everything style card. Um, Jack tends to prefer a much sleeker build. So we're talking no Planeswalkers, very few four drops. Mm. And we're not, I'm not seeing anything, so... Oh, Jitay. Jitay's a good one. Just stick him with the magic stick. Yeah. It's always Jitay. It's always It's Jitay. always Jitay. We do need to put Jitay on a creature and have it connect yeah. through um, your edge champion that can block. That is a scalding turn, right? Awkward. Hmm? Uh, yeah, looks like we got a scalding turn being fetched here. Did I miss this? Oh, did... If David found a scalding tar or planes off the scalding tar, that is not a legal land to find. Yeah. Although, funny enough, this is like the number one misfetched I think I see in the format. We're hoping to uh, catch it uh, before. Oh, and it looks like we've managed to relay it to the players of hey. Whoopsie doodle. Again, it's a thing that happens more often. Then you, you, you know, you just get tunnel vision. You're like a fetch. It finds anything I want. Yeah. Yeah. No harm, no foul. Although David will be receiving a match loss for this. <laughs> Paul, play the clown horn. Uh -huh. Thank you. Maybe drawing some cards here. Esper Sentinel making the don't let me draw tax worse each turn. Potentially checking for a missed Esper Sentinel trigger off this Aether Vial. Or off this uh, Aether Spell Bomb, excuse me. Cranial plating. That plus etch champion is very, very hard. That's horrifying. some old school I'm gonna kill you. Oh, gimme the loot, gimme the loot. Dally is a bad, bad you know. Um <laughs> Thalia's lieutenant here. Or here in Canada, Thalia's lieutenant. Nothing, really? Oh, I mean, I agree. What? I mean, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, left you on red. Hey, Edge Champion with this cranial plating is representing a whole bunch of damage here. Like, I don't even want to think about how much it's representing. It's pretty bad. If you want, I, uh, I got an answer for you. What's that? Well, it depends if this hanger back walker is hitting play. A squinjillion. It is six... For the cranial plating, plus two from the etch champion. Eight. That's eight coming through. Ain't nothing gonna block that. Ironically, the only ar artifact creature Jack has is white. Gonna roll over it like a pudding. Mm. 
was actually commiserating with some of the players uh, about how there are so many cre white, or sorry, so many colored artifacts being printed nowadays, mm -hmm. um, and ones that see active play in our format, that Chrome Mox really, they should just do a functional update on Chrome Mox, because Chrome Mox just says you have to, you can't exile an artifact. Oh, Presumably yeah. because why would we ever have colored artifacts? The year is 2003. Just pitch it. Field of Ruin here, popping out the uh, Siege Veteran. Jack actually being able to hit a land here is pretty nice. It opens up the flexibility of not having to put in the White Plume Adventurer. There are so many plus one, plus one counter effects in this deck. Oh, I, did, yeah. I had no idea. This is a bit of a tense standoff. Here. Yeah, this is um, this is some escalation here. Hidden somewhere, we do have a Legion's Landing that ah, created this vampire token. So that when that flips, that becomes a Soldier Factory, does it not? Yes. Well, a Vampire Factory. What are you saying? Vampires can't be soldiers. I, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying. The tokens generated from Adonta, the first fort, happen to be vampires. vampires. With lifelink, no less. Yep. It's a shame they're not knights. Well, they're, they're quite nice if you get to know them. <sighs> no knight. No, no. That was all right. I chuckled. Yeah, Graham chuckled. Foolish English knickets. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mox Opal. Hitting the table, making that etch champion just a little scarier. Uh, opting not to pay for the bigger SPC. and bigger and bigger. Oh, I just had a horrifying thought. Guess what? Uh, what could wear this nettle cyst very well? Mm. Is that etched champion? Yes. As I live and breathe. So nettle cyst, acting as a second cranial plating here. Uh, we th This is, uh, to David's credit, slow rolling this card for quite some time. Again, the sequencing on this deck and how you can take a, a series of more mid-rangey uh, game actions sure until enough. you just, oh, by the way, Nettle Cyst, and kill them dead. Uh, the artifact count at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's 16, 16 that's just 18. That's lethal here, isn't it? Yes. 18 total if we include the two uh, power off of the etched champion. Maybe for good measure, we're uh, animating this Blink Bot Nexus, <laughs> making an even 20. It's for the old rubbins. Honk, honk. Oh, what could he possibly have? So it's a recruiter of the guard here. Flashing, uh, violating the recruiter of the guard. Okay. Which can get Solitude. But that won't help. Well, Solitude can exile a creature but and it have its controller gain life equal to its power. But it's got protection from all colors. But what if we Solituded our own card? It's still not worth it. But I'm just saying you could Solitude your own creature and uh, gain some life. Hmm. The biggest thing on the board is a three-powered creature for Jack, um, which can put them to 18. But again, the count here for the Etch Champion, and I'm just going to do my math one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times two, 16, plus two, 18. And then the Blink Moth can also activate, just tap for itself, and produce 20. So even if Jack gains three here, we are uh, we're looking at exaxes. Now Jack could have this. Uh, Jack has. Does Jack have another? How many cards in hand does Jack have? Right. So the bluff, not doing it. We're going to game five. Good gravy. Woo! You love to see it. Heck of a series. That is really something. Well, we knew that this was going to be very interactive, very back and forth, um, and we have not been disappointed. God. Oof. 
I love artifacts. They're very good. I, I love them. They're so, they're so great. They're so great. <laughs> You just you just get them and you bust them and then you get them again and you bust them again. Mm -hmm. And not to say again, not to say that like, you know, David had that game unlocked for the entirety of it. Jack kept a one lander on six, but that was a pretty powerful one. Was a good one. And to David's credit, again, kept the nettle cyst relatively hidden, like that was in his opener. Yep. He could have slammed it and had it scale and try to challenge the board, but that's we've kind of seen that that's not exactly how we are going to. Uh, come ahead in this matchup, right? Just one big thing getting big that can't get through, that doesn't have some form of evasion, mm -hmm. not gonna cut it. And then subverting Jack's expectations for how much damage he's gonna take, you know, what's actually coming across, that's, uh, that's a lot. God, I love this format, huh? <laughs> it's very good. You're gonna get me coming out to Mondays again. Oh yeah, join us. <laughs> Both players shuffling up, talking about the match. Sorry, uh, we have a, a comment from uh, one Graham Stark <laughs> of uh, how do we get into Highlander if you can't come to Y'all Jacket Comics and Toys tournaments on Monday night? Well, there's a couple of ways. One, there is a website, www.canadianhighlander.ca with uh, plenty of information on the format, the band li or the points list rather, as well as some helpful links to some of the following things: a Discord with a bunch of active players, uh, leagues, webcam tournaments, all that jazz. Find people in your city, find people in your area. Coordinate with people that might be going to larger events like uh, Command Fests or say MagicCon Minneapolis, where some number of us will be there, and I will have some number of Canadian Highlander decks. Um, there is a video as well that has been posted in chat, uh, and if you are on YouTube, you can check in the description down below about what the format is, uh, what for, the uh, basic ro rules rundown. But it also probably feed into North One Hundred, um, which is not a set review podcast, but <laughs> we do a lot of set reviews and North One Hundred Showdown, which has gameplay videos, deck lists, and all that jazz. And if I may make a personal plug, I won't. I won't be too greedy. Uh, moxfield.com mm. slash bwheelermtg I've got 300 Canlander decks on there. It's a lot of decks. It's a lot of decks. It's a very good resource. If you are going to ask yourself, but Ben, can I play this in Canlander? The answer is yes. Like, Unless it's Battle of Wits. <laughs> See, Elf Lawyer in chat saying, I'm going to Minneapolis some, with some paper Canadian Highlander decks. There are a bunch of people showing up with it. I, we have ran kind of impromptu tournaments at these, at uh, previous uh, Magic Fests and Magic Cons, where it's just like, hey, we just have enough people to run a 16-person event. Get it? Then I'll yep. Get Why not do it? Okay, back to it. Hopeful initiate on turn one here. Not exactly what you want to see if you're David. Ah, uh, the old one drop squire. See Chrome Coast for an egg? Oh, you love to see it. <laughs> well, I mean, you love to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, is that? A lion sack? <clears throat> no, that's a... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Ghost quarter? That's the one. I'm almost surprised to see this one. It's, uh, there, there are decks that don't have a huge amount of basics. You get a lot of flexibility in the utility well, lands you that you can play. also play the cards that muck um, search effects. Exactly. So. Oh, Steel Overseer. Beep boop. It's a good one to get out early. Jack's coming out the gate quite quick, though. Yeah, this is going to be an exciting one, to mm -hmm. be sure. The Aether Spell Bomb. Ooh, and oh, and a So that can put a counter on the Lion Sash, and when both the Lion Sash and the Initiate attack, training is going to trigger. So we got a 2-3 coming in and a 2-2. Two, two. My snowballs have rocks in them. I did see somebody else uh, ask in chat, this might be too high velocity of a game to really sneak this in. 
with an Urza Saga and uh, what? Thalia Heretic Cathar. Hey, wait a minute! You, I thought you worked for me. It's more of a flatter hierarchy. Uh, <laughs> great card just to have in any kind of white aggressive or white mid range deck. Yep. Um, there was a question involving proxies, as Fateful Absence targets to Thalia again. Proxies, gold border cards, not actually in the rules of the format. Always up to the discretion of the event and the TO and all that. Uh, but if you show up and you have a deck with proxies in it and you're like, hey, I want to play Canlander pickup games at a Magic convention. Heck yeah. You know, the number one thing a, a Canlander player wants? What? Games. An opponent. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, in our local scene, um, Monday Night Highlander ELO, 10 proxies. 10 proxies. It's great. It it helps get people out, lets people experiment. I doubt that without that uh, rule being in place and uh, you know the flexibility of letting people do different things, hmm. we wouldn't see decks like Davy's Blue White Artifacts pop up. Absolutely. Jeez, I mean, that's a lot of damage. That is a lot of damage. This board is getting big. This is just death and taxes at its core. One drop, two drop, three drop. Kill Blow you. up your blocker. <laughs> Winding up the robot. David's in a bit of a tough spot. Yeah, this um, is this is scary. He's down to six already. Down to six. Good heavens. We have the Aether spell bomb to be able to bounce. Something. I see a batter skull. Oh, that's kind of a hot tech. We have the batter skull to be able to reset, or sorry, the Aether spell bomb to be able to reset one of the creatures. We have a Karnstruck token being able to come down and act as an additional blocker. Jack drawing a Mana Crypt here. Ooh, has Ravages of War in hand as oh, well. Yikes. Yeah, that's, that's pretty scary. Ravages of War. Um, come on, Jack. Do me a solid, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> and what? Blow up the board? I, I just want to see what other cards you've got. And also to blow up the board. Yeah. Do you think those walls in the Mana Crypt are soft or hard? Jack going to combat here. Vroom, vroom. Don't the know if I want to answer that. Making a construct here. So training trigger resolves. Looking to make a construct here. Jack, before blocks, trying to figure out where we are, what we're blowing up. And he can wind that robot at the last minute too. Yes. Opting to go to blocks here. Which I don't hate. If Jack makes, uh, if Davy makes blocks here that um, can leave Jack with a pretty dominant board position and then just a very clean Ravages of War. Yeah. I think we're taking it. The clue token off Fateful Absence pumping the uh, current struck is uh, pretty pretty classic. That's pretty cool. Is Mana Crypt two points? Five. Yeah. It was two points at some point. But then it's just like, hey, completely free mana? Hey, wait mm, a minute. Nah. Computer says no. But the damage. It's perfectly balanced, as all things should be. <laughs> mm. So Steel Overseer here tapping. Are we ghost quartering our own land? Por qué? What's going on? Are we looking to open up a, a bunch of white mana to activate? Oh, we could be... Oh, so he's putting cards in his graveyard to be able to feed into the Lion Sash. Oh, wow. Hmm. So that Karnstruck is a 5-5 five five right now. 
this is this is, is a game so of cat long. and mouse. This is this is a, a real game of cat and mouse. Are you here. saying that just because Lion Sash is on the board? No, but thank you for asking. Um, so we're looking to spend another white mana here to make this a five five, which means we trade. It's awkward because if we cash in the Aether Spell Bomb, we end you up lose losing power. an artifact. Yeah, exactly. So we're going for the trade here. Crunch. <clears throat> so we're not getting this turn. Oh, blowing up the Urza's Saga. Mm -hmm. So he's going to strip mine him anyway. Oh! Ooh. Yowie zowie. Okay, so the Siege Veteran had damage marked on it. Oh. And removing the counter from it off the Hopeful Initiate put the Siege Veteran's toughness into a spot where it just died due to the state-based actions. Good heavens. Well, it's a clean sweep. It's like we're starting again. So well, now the Veteran's in the yard. I mean, we have this Hopeful Initiate. David's at two. But the Hopeful Initiate being reset is pretty big. Oh, one time harm's way. <laughs> no, just a skidamarinky trinky dink. Trink a mage here. So what is he gonna get here? Is Shadow Spear is appealing. Yeah, that seems. But also, what if we got a mock sapphire and developed our mana a little bit? As a treat. Could be. Yeah, there are so many moves. Even a deck that can be... I mean, Death and Tax is not the best example for this because it's far from linear. But this was a game where we were talking about how it's just good old-fashioned one-drop, two-drop, hey, look what he got. Drop. Be professional, be professional, be professional. <laughs> um, it's a game where we were seeing Jax just playing good old-fashioned magic. A play creature turned them sideways. Oh, um, boy, I see a GTA. Ooh. Tres. That's an anointed peacekeeper. Yep. Smuggler's Copter, Batter Skull, Expedition Map. Good gravy. Yowza. So notably, Davy doesn't have uh, access to Tolerian Academy in this point spread, which is worth touching on. Uh, Expedition Map was the named card. Doesn't want him fetching anything, I guess. No. Nope. Ooh, is that a walking ballista? Yeah, it, it is. is. It's pretty good, but not a lot of mana to cast it with. I wish I got a better look at Jack's hand. I know there's the Ravages of War. There's one more card that we've seen. Looter Scooter. And a Walking Ballista. Walking Ballista. So Smuggler's Copter only having Crew 1. Meaning that the Ballista can hop on in. The water's great. Uh, yeah, that's a... Uh... Proposing a tree. Uh -oh. Of course, sorry, we, we knew about the GTA. It's the Yitte. Walking Blizzard does a great job of uh, preventing counters from being put on Umezawa's GTA. Oh, yeah, you can just block and uh, never have it suffer damage. Yep. So we're looking to crew here to mm -hmm. block that, and we're kind of forced to jump block and then throw this uh, counter at something else. There is a looter scooter loot. So we can even get rid of this expedition map. So right to the face. We're on a point to the face. Uh, I guess we're on the mana vault uh, long game. You fool, you've drawn one step closer to oblivion. 
there's an island, and that could be a batter skull. It sure could be. Yep. Chugga, chugga, chugga. Mm -hmm. Making a germ here. Looks like David's opting to, I don't want to count my uh, eggs before they hatch, but opting to not commit the, the looter scooter here. Just giving themselves another blocker, if need be. Don't want to lose in a spot where you don't have to. Uh, has he got... Oh, mama. Is that a March of Otherworldly Late? So that can kill the germ token for one, right? Yep. Or it could get rid of the batter skull uh, if an extra card is pitched. Which is kind of interesting. If you do it for one, you can throw the germ into the copter and have the copter trade with the Anointed Peacekeeper. But then you have two counters on the GTA. God, Magic's a complicated game sometimes, mm -hmm. huh? Looking to cash in on Silent Clearing instead. Try to get some more options, more, more information. I think he got a Planes off of that draw. The deck plays a lot of them. Two Manos. Adeline, woo, resplendent Cathar. Mm. Oh boy, yep. Okay, so we're getting rid of the germ here. Did not crew copter. He may have crewed with the gesture there. I, I didn't actually pick it up over the mic. I mean, we'll, we'll see once we, you know, get to attacks. Oh, opted to not crew, unfort. That represents one point of damage here. Adeline is real good. Is that token at the bottom there? Uh, that's the clue token. Oh, no, not the right hand side. No, it's um, human. Oh, human. the human token off of Adeline. Yep. Oh, boy. Oh, jellyfish. What? I believe that was the reality chip as the draw. Not that it's, it's not that at its best in this. Like, he goes to for a quip and loses his trinket mage here. Like, yeah. this has got to be pretty close to over. Yep. See ya. Yeah, that March of Otherworldly Light was a hell of a draw. And there's the and handshake. That's, that's match. Woo! What a humdinger. Jack Hanukkah. Moving on to the finals to play this off against Sasha Christensen for the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. It's like they say, there's only two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. Death and taxes. You're forgetting the third thing. Death, what's the third thing? Me losing in a top eight without actually winning. Uh, welcome back to the booth. <sighs> some good magic, some good proper. Some great magic. Excellent. Yeah, heck of a match. You love to see a game go to five mm. like that or a match go to game five. We got both archetypes uh, showcasing what they can do. Yep. Showcasing there are tools to recover. Um, what more can you want? No, nothing. Nothing. Well, I mean, I'll let you have one thing if you want. Borgar. Burger? Yeah, Borgar. I don't have a burger, but what I do have is that after a quick commercial break, we'll come back, we'll talk about, you know, Highlander, mm -hmm. what we have seen so far. Maybe what we have seen in 2023 as well, because we're enough into the year. And then we'll have the finals uh, with myself, Trenton, and Graham on commentary. Some combination or all of them. We can fit a lot of lads in this room. Um, let's see that bracket. Let's see the bracket too, if you don't mind. Look at that. Omnitiative and death and taxes. Four yep. color versus one color. A lot of white at this tournament. A lot of, uh, lot of swords to plow here. It's pretty good you, magic what are you card. To say? I'm just trying to, try to say it's a pretty good magic card here. <laughs> Lightning Bolt, also a heck of a magic card, but uh, swords is clearly uh, the best one mana spell. So we're going to have Sasha facing off against Jack. Omnitiative versus Death and Taxes. Uh, myself, Graham, and Trenton on commentary here. Uh, so don't go away. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. And then we'll have the finals for the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship.
Welcome back to what will very soon be the finals of the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championship. Uh, I continue to be Graham Stark, joined as before by Trenton McIntyre. Hello. And uh, now we are joined in, uh, is now a three-person booth <laughs> by uh, Benjamin Wheeler. Thank you for having me, Graham. It's great to be here. <laughs> Good to hear. It's bittersweet I to also, be here. I, I also enjoy being here, but I just come in for the quick nod. Hey, well, it's great to have <laughs> yeah, you yeah, here. Yeah, thanks, you know? man. Yeah, I showed up. Yeah. And I got to <laughs> tell you, like you said, this is so much better than a closet at the back of YJ. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. I mean, the cause, not as good. No offense to the winners and to everything we're doing here, but, you the know. The connection between two two homies, not as good. Did you have to, like, not talk too loud so the players didn't hear you? Or, like, how bad was it? So, good news. All the back stock of Yellow Jacket helped act as, like, <laughs> really soundproofing. Muffled the sound. All right, yeah. Right. Yeah. It uh, good, good. was a thing. <laughs> uh, before we get to the final round, I want to remind everybody that uh, this show and everything we do here at Loading Ready Run is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. We really, really appreciate it. You can also be subscribing here on Twitch for those of you who are watching live. We'll be welcoming all the subs at the end of the stream. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you know, just follow the channel. Just being here. Anybody, even if you're watching here live, just uh, being here and uh, briefly lending us your eyes and ears. We, we need them so badly. Uh, no, it really helps. Uh, so thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, and today is the final day to... Is my mic working? Jeez, I hope so. Someone told me it was. Yes, it's oh, working. Oh, I fine. can hear you. Oh, it's working. Uh, today is the final day to pre-order uh, the Moonbase Space Lines merch collection to uh, help celebrate the launch of Moonbase Mark VI because we're moving at some point. We don't have a firm date yet. Work, <sighs> work is underway. Um, but to Highlander, let's take a look at the bracket and what led us to these finals, shall okay. we? Okay. So quarterfinals, Robin Sorensen defeated Connor Hayward. Mm -hmm. We had Sasha Christensen defeating yourself, Benjamin I Wheeler. don't know what happened there. It happens. And uh, <laughs> the Omnitiative deck was able to best Jeskai Green Tempo in the semis, bringing Sasha into these finals. On the other side of the bracket, Dave Brunson's Artifacts defeated Matthew Greer's Jeskai Tempo and Jack Hanneke's Death and Taxes over Jace's Seeker Walk Control. Heck of a match we just watched with uh, Artifacts versus D&T, but Death and Taxes was successful. Again, this is it's mono-white Death and Taxes, but there were, there's... As Wheeler has been saying, there's a Dryad Militant and a Mental Misstep in the deck. <laughs> sure are. So that's that's why those colors are there. But that brings us to, yeah, these finals. Death and Taxes versus Omnitiative. How, what do you think? What do you make of this? You know, i got to say, Graham, I thought that the matchup between Robin and Sasha would take the cake, but that last one between Davey B and Jack Hannock is fantastic. And now we're moving right into... What I think is going to be probably one of the most interesting matchups, and it's a common matchup that you'll find uh, at, at the store itself, like Death and Taxes versus Four Color Initiative, it's just a staple of the format at this point. It's, I mean, both of them are top tier archetypes, certainly, top ten. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of, there's kind of a nice narrative, because... The the omnitiative deck and the four color green decks. Yeah. They have a nickname in other formats uh -huh. that they've popped up of these like twenty twenty cards all together. They're called four color money pile. <laughs> and you know what it doesn't cost a lot of money? <laughs> Basic planes, baby. <laughs> Ignore the mox pearl. You don't need it. You really don't. <laughs> but there's something really beautiful about basic planes. And a deck playing like sixteen of them. Wow. I, and, and we've seen it before. Yeah. Not to set myself up for being um, owned online, but uh, I got to the finals with Death and Taxes. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Is this where we're going? Uh, well, I was going to also say that we have uh, Adam Thorne oh, was a yes. previous uh, winner, mm -hmm. previous Canadian Highlander year-end winner on Death and Taxes. I believe a white-black variant, but again, it's okay. Scrubland is about the same price as the Basic Plains. Um, this is this is a two like you said two mat, mat two archetypes kind of emblematic of everything that you can do in Canadian Highlander, um, just just facing off for a good romp, and we're gonna get to watch two masters of the archetypes battle against each other, which mm -hmm. I'm just really excited for. Do you feel like either of these decks is especially favored in this matchup? 
this is not to get a little nostalgic, but this is something that back in our old legacy days right. on the legacy forums, you would have the person playing Death and Taxes going like, can't beat Omnitiative, it's impossible. And you'd have the Omnitiative player going, I can't beat Death and Taxes, it's impossible. So, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I hate to say draw dependent, but it's it's one where Omnitiative has the tools to clear the board, right. but Death and Taxes accounts for that. And both the protection that it has from its creatures and also its ability to recover. It's recovery tools, it's recursion. Um, if Sasha draws the wrong part of the deck, mm -hmm. the counter magic, Right. And Jack has, you know, Aether Vial, Cavern of Souls, or just gets underneath there, then it's a problem. So, I don't know. My money's on Jack. If I have to pick, I uh, think if I have to pick, I'm on Sasha. I think the four color deck really uh, provides a lot of value over the long term. And I mean, uh, you say that Sasha has to draw the right part of his deck, but I mean, the deck is full of bangers. Yeah, I guess the deck's at a point where there is no <laughs> wrong part of the deck. <laughs> Now, Graham, we're at a one-in-one -one split. Yeah, and I refuse <laughs> to change that. <laughs> what about you, the viewer? Wait, hang on. <laughs> don't, don't. Yeah, it's. Uh, it, I'm. I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing this. And you know, the players are ready. They they have their hands, and they've decided who's going to go first. So I think let's just let's let's dive into it. This is a yes. best of five. Final match of the 2022 Canadian Highlander Championships. Let's go. Turn one, Mardu Woe Reaper from Jack there. Jack on a mulligan to six, apparently. Mm. It's a big deal in this matchup. Mm -hmm. And is that ignoble hierarch? It is. Oh, excellent. Goblin. <laughs> I love ignoble Goblin. hierarch. Goblin. That's not even from an unset. That's just a funny thing they did. Wow. That's this to me. This is classic Death and Taxes. Ancient Tomb into Thalia. Yeah. Now this isn't ha this isn't ha ha funny, but it is funny. Right. It's just like, <laughs> oh, you thought you had untapped lands or creatures? My bad. Yeah. Turn one, Savannah lands with marginal but likely irrelevant upside mm -hmm. into turn two Thalia. Well, there goes Thalia. Thalia yeah, got strangled. strangled. A big big deal. I mean. The land was coming to play tapped oh. anyway, <laughs> Sasha. You sure you? Oh. Big money four drop. Oh. So that's the... Seasoned Dungeoneer. Seasoned Dungeoneer, thank you. It's mm -hmm. heavily, heavily modified, this one. <laughs> yeah. As mentioned previously, um, if you haven't noticed, viewer, all of Jack's deck is foil. Yeah. However, you can't get this one in foil. It was produced uh. in the Commander deck. Um, and so you got to get a little... Fancy with your altarist requests Fair in order enough. to get there. The first room of the Undercity. The time, secret entrance. <laughs> time and time again, Jack has just been showing us the power of Ancient Tomb in this archetype. This is a fantastic start. And yep. it all begins with the turn to Ancient Tomb. Like making Sasha answer the, answer the Thalia, can't advance his own board state. This is just classic death of taxes, like you were saying, Graham. I think people, when they look at Ancient Tomb, they are always worried about what three drop comes out first. Mm. That's not the issue. The issue is the follow-up. If they could, if they have a threat to back it up, then you strangle the first one, and now you have to deal with this. And you're revealing a Skyclave apparition on the Explorer, so you know building to the board isn't really going to help. Woo! This is tough. The Dungeoneer has four toughness, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Can't even be strangled. <laughs> Thick neck. I was about to say exactly <laughs> that. Thick neck. Thick neck. <laughs> that would be a good altar. Maybe we can convince Jack to alter a new CZ DZ <laughs> with just a really thick neck. <laughs> like Photoshop it? Sounds yeah, like wider. a good idea. Express <laughs> expressive, ugh, expressive iteration here from Sasha. We got ourselves a Steam Vents, a Maw Lock, and a Fury. Wow. So I'm impressed that you can recognize that. It's so fun for me personally to see cards uh, from the Warhammer 40k decks mm -hmm. in this format. Boy, we've seen a lot of Fury today. It's a rage filled format. <laughs> <laughs> Card on bottom, uh, 
it was at the Moloch into hand. Yeah. Yeah. And then Fury. Uh, are we going to be looking to evoke the Fury? I imagine nope. that's the case. Yep. Yep, um, yes, yep, yes, okay. That's the seasoned engineer mm -hmm. doing that. I didn't see what was exiled, but... That's uh, a pretty good use for it. Maybe it was the Moloch. <laughs> I think it was the Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Uh, okay. Um, getting exiled. Yeah, that we. I, I believe we heard the... Uh, Sasha Aska, the judge, Nelson, at the table there, um, regarding, can you cast Evoke from Exile? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a common judge question. You can. So one in with the ignoble hierarch and Sasha steals the initiative and traipses on down and through the secret entrance himself. And does that Woe Reaper have a plus one plus one counter on it? Where'd that come from? Uh, from the explore trigger off the seasoned engineer. Wait, that card has more text? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it has more text, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's seasoned. No. Who's, who's responsible for this? <laughs> Gavin. <laughs> I gotta say I love the way that Sasha attacks with the ignoble hierarch. Gusto. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's taken the initiative. So Jack's got a couple of options here. The Skyclave Apparition could hit the table, get rid of that noble hierarch, which uh, prevents the initiative from coming back after he takes it with this attack, but also um, well, just stifles Sasha's mana development. The basic land he got off the uh, initiative trigger is not, you know, it, it means that it's kind of moot. But we have Phyrexian Sensor here, a new card from uh, March of the Machine. Yeah, if you're, just, if you're just joining us, I'm sorry, if you're just joining us, uh, it's his pre-release weekend of March of the Machines, and the, the, the cards are legal in this tournament as determined by the tournament organizer. Correct. I believe they're also technically legal in events everywhere. As of, as a pre-release, so they've, they've changed that. Every, everything's changed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, Phyrexian Sensor, you were saying. Oh, it's a three mana three three that says each player can't cast more than one non Phyrexian spell each turn, uh, which more or less just says, hey, one spell per turn. And non Phyrexian creatures enter the battlefield tapped, which basically says, hey, everything except for the self uh, is entering the battlefield tapped. Because I'm assuming there's not a glut of Phyrexians running around the format. No, there are a couple here and there. You might run to an infect player. Somebody might have a spell skite or worm coil engine on blocking duty. But we did see earlier the germ token. Yep. It's a Phyrexian. Yep. Which was relevant. Jack just cast Steel Shaper's Gift, looking up a skull clamp, mm. which we see in the right lower right hand side, and was able to retake the initiative thanks to Mardu Wo Reaper. Pretty even life totals, twelve to thirteen. Yeah, buckle up. <laughs> the Ancient Tomb doing some heavy lifting Ancient, to Sasha. <laughs> I think Ancient Tomb's done six <laughs> of that damage to Jack at this point. Yeah, it's uh, kind of a tough spot. If we can get this Phyrexian sensor off the board, then we can maybe steal the initiative back. But even then, we're not really building to the board that well. Moloch does that, though. Oh. Moloch's pretty good at building to the board. So it enters with X plus one plus one counters. If X is five or more, draw a card when it enters. So no card draw, but it is a 5-5. Five five. And it fights. And it fights and exiles the Mardu Woe Reaper. Sasha That's choosing good. to not kill the Phyrexian sensor, sort of identifying that maybe he is going to be totally fine just casting one spell every turn. Um, kind of gives us an insight into the way that he's playing his hand. Also, I guess it would have traded. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sasha took five off of the trap there, uh, putting him down to seven. We do have the sensor as a five-five itself, and the skull clamp being known information, which can push to six damage, which would put Sasha on one. But one's not none. Yep. And by none, I mean zero. One is not zero. It's very <laughs> true. Yeah, that was uh, room three of the Undercity is Trap, which is the five damage to target opponent. Cashing in the Horizon Canopy for an extra card. I will say, this is about as far as we've seen someone get through the dungeon today. They've only made it to the third room yeah. at most. Yeah, generally the game has been ended before they reach that point. The Skyclave we know about coming down. 
So Moloch is gone, and if Skyclave Apparition is dealt with, Sasha will get a 2-2 spirit, because unfortunately that is the mana value of Moloch. You say unfortunately. Like well, for a Sasha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's currently at 2. A lot of action in hand, but... I think Sasha has ways to survive this next turn, but I don't... Uh, I'm curious to see where he ends up afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a strength of these decks, the four-color Just Guy decks, no matter the build, where they're pretty good at kind of saying, okay, everything's dead, but now what? Yeah, yeah. Or most <laughs> of it's dead, and now what? Oh. Five mana to fairy, and a noble hierarch. I mean, meaning... They cancel one another out, and it's just two hierarchs. Mm -hmm. Just two? Just two hierarchs. We enter the room that allows Jack to draw an additional card this turn. Oh. Which, which means we're kind of in the... Well, it's a little bit Kenny Loggins. It's the danger zone. <laughs> this Who is am the I kidding? we've gone through the, <laughs> through the dungeon. I don't even know what this room in the Undercity is called. I believe it's called draw a card. <laughs> I, good, ro good room is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, archives. Ah, oh, thank you, John. Saga. There thank we go. <laughs> attacking for two with the Skyclave apparition. I assume attacking phase. I didn't actually catch it. Uh, Jack actually, I believe he opted to attack to fairy for two. Interesting. Which puts Sasha in a bit of an interesting spot. Trenton. If you're Sasha, do you block? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I believe you have to block here. Um, you, you're already set up on mana, but you need the extra card from the Teferi to try and come back. Um, you don't really know what Jack's follow-up is going to be, and I think the Teferi to you is worth more than the Noble Hierarch. And it looks like that's what's happening. Sasha agrees. Do it. Play the Thalia. Yeah, there you go. Another different Thalia. <clears throat> Taxing non-creature spells now. Jack's still holding the Skull Clamp. If I was Sasha, I'd be worried about potential flash creatures in Jack's hand based mm -hmm. on this, knowing that Jack has the Skull Clamp. Let's hear what's being discussed at the table okay, if we can. So, oh. It was supposed to put a non land permanent in or is already third from the top. Yep. This was last turn. I've drawn no extra cards and I did. No, you, you drew did. A, you oh, drew an drew extra, extra card. card. You drew so it's two still extra be on cards. Top. So it would just be on the very top of the library yeah, right I, now. I wasn't thinking I was otherwise, assuming it was gone. Yeah, that's my bad too. Okay. So this card's in the wrong zone. We can handle this game Both players being extremely courteous. <laughs> very much. In regards to Where's this Frexian sensor going? Yeah. Okay, great. I probably also said bounce, so that's okay. Yeah, I heard e bounce. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Let's just, I'll give you both a warning here for game rule violation. Try to watch out for that in the future and keep playing this Frexian sensor. All right, so yeah, the Frexian sensor was tucked by Teferi, and it uh, sounds like it was, like, we said bounce, and both players were like, yep, that just gets bounced to hand or whatever, and not remembering that it should have been there, but uh, Nelson was able to figure out. Well, Nelson and the players were able to figure out how many cards have been drawn. The Phyrexian Sensor should currently be on the top of Jack's library, which is where it is. So, reminder that this is this is being uh, com competed. Competed? This is the competitive rules enforcement. This is a serious event for serious people. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's understandable to an extent when it comes to cards like Teferi, where you don't see Teferi 5 uh, show up that often. Yeah. It's... Yeah, and you see th uh, the thir uh, three mana to fairy so often, and that one does actually bounce. Mm -hmm. Totally a uh, reasonable mistake. This Tarmogoyf and Death Rite are really, really big for Sasha. Yeah, yeah, a huge turn. And a turn, though, like you said, flash threat. Oh, oh. the uh, th Cathar Command. Thank you for Midnight Hunt. That's a good one. This card's underrated. Yeah. It's really good. It's in the latest iteration of the Magic Arena Tinkerer's Cube. Mm -hmm. So now in upkeep, 
as Jack still has the initiative, we are going to the final, oh my god. We're going to the final chamber, the throne of the dead three, or yep. who cares what it's called? Because what <laughs> happens is it gets put into play, and it comes into play with counters on it. What does? You look the, at, a creature. You look at the top ten cards of your library. Top ten cards of your library, you put a creature from them into play, Okay. and it has three counters on it, and that creature has hexproof until your next turn. All right. What creature? Well, there's a walking ballista. Oh. Oh, wow. And since it enters with those counters, then it's going to come into play as a 3-3 with these counters, which means, hypothetically, we could see some counters from walking ballista being removed. Wow, that's, that's a combo. So that's... <laughs> this is lethal, right? Like, what? What's so what Jack Sasha has Lisa on board? Maybe has to consider like Sasha swords to plowshares in his own Tarmogoyf mm -hmm. to live. Because um, the walking ballista has hexproof this turn. Oh, what do you, you see, Miller? Sorry, uh, for the folks at home, I pogged in real life. Um, I believe <laughs> Jack may have drawn Harm's Way as well. So is that it? It's Harm's Jack way. just removed a counter from. Walking Ballista to kill the Ignoble Hierarch, and then it's just turning everything else sideways. Yeah, yeah. Jack's just playing tight here, like yeah. it, right. you know, he's got Sasha um, defeated in a couple of different ways. But you got to make sure, right? Ooh, you love wow. to see. It. You love to see the sick tight play yeah. from Jack here. Um, I mean, the power of Ancient too. Yeah, and the initiative, pretty good. Ancient Tomb, just an all-star that whole game. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I ask a request? Yeah. Can one of you set me up for a very quick blurb on the initiative in Canadian Highlander? Hey, Wheeler. Yes? I have a question. Sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> Do you mind? Yes, go ahead. I got you, Graham. What, what's the question? What's going on here? No. <laughs> me. Me. Wheeler, could you ask Trenton what... <laughs> He thinks about the initiative in Canadian Highlander. Trenton? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Graham what's up, would like to know... What you think about the initiative in Canadian Highlander. Can you tell him I'm busy? Uh, sorry, Graham <laughs> Trenchant's busy. Do you All mind right. if I fill in this one? <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, go ahead, take <laughs> it. Great. So the initiative is a very powerful mechanic. It pops up quite a uh, bit. In fact, there are decks that are built around the initiative. We call them initiative decks. <clears throat> like this one. This one, yes. Yeah. But this one doesn't go as hard as most. Okay. Omnitiative, great, more, great portmanteau. Big fan of a clean portmanteau. Yeah. And that's what we have. Uh, but there are some initiative decks if you're a real initiative initiative deck, you go hard. And I'm talking like 10 of them. Hmm. Every one you can get your hands on, you put your dark rituals, your, your fast mana, whatever. Um, and that's okay. okay. There are a lot of people talking about, you know, much like Urza Saga being pointed, that gets thrown around a lot. We hear people talk about the initiative getting thrown around a lot. Um, and while you can have an interesting conversation that goes nowhere about White Plume Adventurer being a <laughs> one-point card, um, it's not that bad. It's something that is... We had multiple players in this tournament, Matthew Greer and um, Robin Sorensen, who have experience with the heavy initiative decks. Mm -hmm. They decided not to bring it. They decided to go... They both went for tempo decks instead. And that's weird. You would imagine that heavy mid-range decks would suffer in a, in a... Would really punish the tempo decks, Trent. Yeah, the thing with the initiative cards is... The initiative is obviously quite strong. But the cards themselves are overcosted, and in, in like, you know, you're paying four mana for three fours. Yeah. In a powerful format. Yeah. We, uh, please do continue that line of uh, whatever it is you wanted to talk about with the initiative. But I just want to say that we're back here for game two, and Jack has the exact same start as game one, which I is I thought we were watching game one. Turn one, Mardu <laughs> Woe Reaper. Yeah. All I'm trying to say is there's new toy syndrome. If it feels like the initiative is everywhere in your local meta game. Yeah, it makes sense. It's the serotonin button. You get to draw cards, you get to dome them for... You get a free lava axe. Yeah. Right? But it's not this oppressive mechanic in the format. Right. It pushes players to be more board-based, which often leads to, well, I guess I have to interact with the board instead of just necessarily cast Underworld Breach repeatedly, mm -hmm. although that's still pretty good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, white has access to the two best initiative creatures, arguably, the White Plume Adventure and the Season Dungeoneer. Mm -hmm. good clean magic. I was going to say, I remember this happening with Monarch, too. Yep. When it first came out, um, a lot of people were 
really suspicious of Monarch in terms of how powerful it was in the format, but it ended up being just a good ability, right? Some would argue that Monarch is now a bit of a liability yeah. in the format. Where, we're deck, where, again, every deck plays to the board, or a lot of decks can play to the board. There are more flash threats running around. Everything's just so efficient. Yep. Sasha has used Scalding Tarn to get a Ralgrin Triumph, played Volcanic Island, and passed. And then Jack also <coughs> played a second land and passed. Ah, Stomp at the end of Jack's oh. turn. And something in response. Oh. Jack's floating a harm's way. Oh, and he's got a question for the judge, and they're discussing it away from the table. Um, my guess is that Jack is asking Nelson about the damage can't be prevented clause on Bone Crusher because he's got harm's way in his hand. Is does harm's way prevent the damage or simply redirect it? It doesn't say prevent. Bingo bango. Ah. It doesn't prevent damage. Bongo. It just says if it would be dealt damage, mm -hmm. or the next two damage that would be dealt is dealt to this instead. Redirection is not prevention. That said, Jack opts not to do that. Which again, you can get a lot of value off of Harm's Way in this match. Yeah. And Marty Woe Reaper is not exactly the most exciting card to protect. Um, even if it is redirected, you are still... Sasha is still going to get Bone Crusher Giant as an option for follow-up. Yep. So. Two damage from Breeding Pool for Sasha and oh. then plays... Uh, Lelia. Lelia. The Blade Reforged. Oh, Thank you. Go. Jack oh, really needed that Sword Splashers there. Lelia gets out of hand yeah, real yeah, fast. Yeah. Immediately met with the swords. Oh, wow. Okay, so I know what you're, I, I know okay. what you're thinking, Chad. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the White Plume Adventurer. And uh, Jack's proving Wheeler wrong right away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, uh, this White Plume is just such a big deal. The fact that it's three mana is so, so good. Oh. oh. <gasps> Trenton, it's the dog. Arr, 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 arr. <laughs> Where my dog's at? The good boy? God. Very excited for this. Anything Wait, have we, have we finished doing initiative stuff? Yes. Where's the dungeon? I don't see where they're at in the... They haven't even... Oh, they have... Uh, it appears the players did not put the actual token into play. That should oh, okay. probably be resolved. <laughs> we would like to represent the things. I just want to know where they're at. Uh, Comet rolled three, returning a card with mana value two or less from Graveyard to hand, in this case, the Scalding Tarn. There's the dungeon. Not the best roll. No. No. At least there was a target. That's true. <laughs> the dog... People at home that might see this dog and go, hey, is this card even good? Is it actually good? It's actually good. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually so good. good. It is so, brutal. It's, <laughs> it's going to die right now, but uh, it is actually good. Yeah, but even then, it's taken five off the white plume, right? Yeah. If that five goes to the dome plus the uh, trap on the next turn, I mean, that would put Sasha down yeah. to five oh. and then dead to the next attack. Like, that's, you know, it's it's doing something. It. That was the least exciting dog I think I've seen <laughs> in quite some time, but still. Leon and Arbiter on the list. for Jack, and then untaps White Plume Adventurer on Sasha's turn because uh, the White Plume Adventurer has more text. Yep. Turns out each of these creatures that I thought was just initiative stuff also has other text. To give credit to the Canlander community, we were pretty on top of the initiative, mm -hmm. certainly before it, it other eternal really communities. Yeah. I'd even wager faster than the popper community. Wow. <laughs> like, we immediately. You're was throwing it? hands. You're throwing hands. With so, popper players? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sasha had some options there and chose instead to just pass the turn with all mana up. Is that a selfless spirit? Yep. That's a selfless spirit there. So he has Odawara available. Mm -hmm. Sasha's hand is a little. It's light on interaction. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Odawara is going to be okay to stifle the life loss, but um, Jack's still in a commanding position. However, uh, Sasha has definitely a lot of draws in his deck that can lead him to turning this around. Ops to bounce Leon and Arbiter here. Takes five, goes to five from the White Plume Adventure, having taken five at the beginning of the turn from the Trap. When you recast White Plume, do you... 
move through the dungeon again? Oh, you do, Trenton. Oh, wow. Oh, you do. Oh, wow. <laughs> Three mana. There's the giant. And Sylvan Library. Sasha doing a great impression of Magic Online by putting the Sylvan Library between the lands. <laughs> <laughs> So on board, that giant chumps the 5-5 five, five, and Sasha goes to 1? Well, remember that harm's way? Oh, right. The harm's way that Jack said, I could use this for something else. What if that something else was killing you? Master. There Oof. you go. Master. God. Wow, we, all right. Jack takes game 2 of 5. So we move to game 3. So if Jack... Wins this third game. That's a that's a clean clean sweep in the win of the finals, fellas. Yeah. You know what gets me really excited in matches of Magic? What's up? Patience. Yeah. God, I love it. <laughs> Have we seen a Death and Taxes win a year end? Yeah. We we saw uh, Adam Thorne with black oh, white yes. Death and Taxes. Yeah, yeah. I believe there was a one Ben Wheeler that. Oh, sorry, no, he lost the finals to Time Vault on the very final turn to the one outer. Unfortunate. Um, <laughs> but I mean, again. Uh, it's, it, it would be great to see this kind of deck. It's, it's so good for the format to have this kind of deck win such a prestigious event. It's, it's so cool, too, because the deck has been around for so long that it's been evolving and changing mm -hmm. with all of these new cards that have been coming out. So a Death and Taxes list you'd see four years ago looks totally different than what they're playing now, yep. even though it's all just mono-white cards. Yep, and metagame to metagame, too, and even in individual stores. Yep. Uh, locally, we have several Death and Taxes players. You know, Adam Thorne has his own D&T spread that I've seen him play, uh, you know, with the Eldrazi package, trying that again, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, can have some tech against Thoracle with Thought Not Seers and all that jazz, yeah. which is pretty spicy. Uh, we have uh, Dan King locally playing a, a more aggressive version that has like a legendary sub package for Yoshimaru. Good dog. Oh, we and, saw the Yoshimaru friends. at the last... Uh tournament we commented yeah. yeah the chris sutherland charity yeah. event and i think that's great that really shows just how this format can not only be like your deck choice is an expression of what you want to do in this game and and who you are as a player but also your individual choices you have that flexibility and you have the card pool to draw from it yeah we saw that earlier with um sasha versus robin they're both playing the same colors a lot of the same cards totally different archetypes yep and and even though there's overlap on the cards they utilize them differently. Yep. Robin's using his counterspells to push through more damage and threats. Sasha's using them to, well, survive. <laughs> Someone was asking, what's the prize? Uh, the, the, it's a couple different things. Uh, there's some uh, sleeves, etc. Uh, TBD, courtesy of Dragon Shield. There's some uh, sealed booster product from Loading Ready Run. There's a booster pack of Magic 30, courtesy of YJ. And most importantly... The glory, the bragging rights, and a trophy that Wheeler's are going to arrange. Yeah. It, uh, but the glory and the bragging rights are the most <laughs> important part. That's the best. The it's the love of the game. That's why people are here today. Mm -hmm. And the stories. Yeah. Like, I mean, we're doing it here, hooting and hollering on camera about previous events and all that. But this stuff gets brought up. People, people, Canlander players will forget to bring a copy of a card that they were going to lend somebody that they check, got checked in with over and over again. But you better believe they'll remember something that happened in their quarterfinal match in the 2017 <laughs> year-end. Like, that's the kind of pull that they'll, you know, bring up. It, this, this tournament means a lot to the Victoria community. Mm -hmm. And here we are in what I hope is not going to be the last game, because I want to see some more magic. But it's certainly game three of this Best of Five series. We've got turn one Mock Sapphire. Into Serum Visions. Ooh, and I think Sasha kept a spicy one. Oh, like a no land? Oh, he's like, got a wasteland. He kept a mox and a wasteland oh, with a Serum God. Visions. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Mostly because the two people beside me look very excited about what might happen. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> Trenton and I love Serum Visions. <laughs> Wheeler and I are just so greedy on the regs. <laughs> yeah. Into Pay to Life for Gataxian Probe. Let's see what's let's see what Jack's working with, shall we? 
Probe's actually really good in this matchup because of the specificity of how Jack is interacting with his creatures in, in relation to Sasha's deck. So. Legion's Landing, Dauntless Bodyguard, Mana Crypt, wow. Aven Mind Sensor. Uh, Spirit of the Labyrinth. Thank you. Spirit of the Labyrinth. Cauldra Complete. Uh huh. And uh, Planes. So we got a turn one Aven Mind Sensor if Jack wants. Um, we can see a Spirit of the Labyrinth, which is. Sasha's got to feel pretty good at getting that Serum Visions and that Gib probe out of the way. Yeah. We we see this Jataxi probe being so huge for Sasha, though. Like, knowing that the Mind Sensor is coming is such a big deal. Yeah. He's got that Fetch land. I mean, he has a Noble Hierarch that he was likely going to play anyways. But, you know, who knows? He might want to slow roll it, try to hit more lands by well, saving it. His his mana is, isn't perfect, right? So it's possible in a different situation he might save the Fetch land to get a Triome. <clears throat> yep. Um, but now he he's for sure just uh, like moved into casting this noble hierarch. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that Jack can go planes mana crit mind sensor. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, idiot bird as we say. <laughs> <laughs> Jack so. also drew a containment priest. Oof. So that's another flash threat that Sasha. If Sasha has mind sensor on the radar, can kind of say, well, this mana is going to be mind sensor. We might that mana could also just be containment priest on uh, future turns. Mm. Yep. <clears throat> There's a force of negation in Sasha's hand. We got a Is force. He interested in forcing. Oh, it looks like Ooh. Mana Crypt may not be resolving. I really like this from Sasha. Ma Mana Crypt is, especially based on what you've seen from Jack's hand, yeah. like it's it's just too good. Exiling Opt. So a little Savannah lands in the Dauntless Bodyguard. So now Sasha is sitting on Lose Focus and Wasteland and whatever the draw step card was for the turn. Uh, Seachrome Coast. So not a lot of pressure, but being able to invalidate the next couple of cards that Jack plays, pretty yeah. nice. I oh, like, I like yeah. this attack from oh, Sasha. Big offers fan. the trade. Why do you like that? Um, I think at this point you don't really care that much about your Noble Hierarch because you know you have mana in your hand. and like uh, Sasha's deck ha has mostly like three and four drops, so you can cast most of the cards that he has. Um, but not letting Jack uh, start to turn the corner, flip the switch, and get aggressive against him. Um, the Noble Hierarch's never blocking, so. And here we see the Containment Priest coming down, but getting hit by the Lose Focus. So this lets Jack actually untap and develop a threat without having to worry about, presumably, it getting uh, countered. So that's and the Spirit of the Labyrinth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Each player can't draw more than one card. Oh, oh yeah. Heck of a draw. Stomp into Bone Crusher Giant. Very nice. Oh! Ooh. There's that path. Oh, also when Sasha attacks with a Noble, he actually doesn't know that Jack has another land. Mm -hmm. Right. So if he's, he buys himself a ton of time to actually naturally draw out of being disadvantaged in terms of cards in hand. So that's Legion's Landing. Makes a 1-1 one, one lifelink vampire. Jack's just had the perfect answers at every uh, turn here so far. So Sasha's only got one card in hand, which was the draw for this turn, and passes it back. Sasha has so many draws that are so good, though. Yeah. I, I definitely wouldn't <coughs> count them out yet. Oh, like, I'm not. There's so many cards that Sasha could draw that just break the game wide open. I've been here all day. What is that? City of Traders. Another card that you can only get in foil. Well, you can get in foil if you have about... 20 grand ah. lying around. And you're okay <laughs> playing with the uh, test print style cards. Okay. <sighs> so, Trenton, you were talking about good draws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Sasha just drawing, uh, you know, one of his many, many bangers. This is a great card. Um, and. Hey, that Mock Sapphire is an elk now. We're playing the elk sub game. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take your word for all it. All of my permanents are elks, and all of your permanents are elks. This is actually the pre-Dan-Dan uh, Dan sub game. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I played elk. that standard format. It yeah. was just Oko Oko. <laughs> Oko. There's that even mind sensor, in case you forgot. Trenton, how do you feel about not wastelanding the city of traders there? Um, I don't really love <clears> it. I, I don't think you need this wasteland mana uh, anytime soon. And uh, the danger of Jack just being able to play um, like a four mana that threat that deals with your 3-3 three, three and killing your Oko afterwards is too high, I think. I would have loved to wasteland the city, but 
Sasha has different plans. Maybe he's looking to draw into uh, some of his five mana cards, Fury, Solitude, etc. Maybe looking to hit the Sedanto if it flips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. You, maybe you want to have considerations for this Legion's Landing flipping. Sasha's doing some counting. Two cards in Jack's hand. Three mana. Nope. <clears throat> yep. Teferi. That's another good draw. <laughs> <laughs> Canadian Highlander understatements. Uh, that's a good draw. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a good, that's hey, a good one. It's a good card. When you're right, you're right. <laughs> um, I think you bounce the Archon of Amiria here. Uh, so that if you draw into a removal spell, you can uh, kill the bird and then either leave your 3-3 back to protect your Teferi or just start getting in. I think if I'm Sasha, I don't know. Especially if you're tapping the Wasteland here, because then you're also just not blowing up the city to try and commit to like, look, you're one creature few, like one creature off the board, um, and now you're pr like you're not getting a Sedanto anytime soon. And I'm looking to leverage my Planeswalkers into a pretty dominant board position. Sasha goes for bouncing the Avon Mind Sensor there. <coughs> Sorry, the idiot bird. I think the so idiot much. bird. I think the reason I want to bounce the Archon over the bird is um, it's harder for Jack to play two spells. Uh, but now Jack could have played like a one drop into playing the Mind Sensor on mm -hmm. Sasha's turn. <clears throat> Sasha has a Hollowed Fountain, a Misty Rainforest in hand. I expect we'll see the Wasteland now. Sasha does have a pretty big board state if he makes the food token a 3-3. Three, three. That elk You could also exchange the, the food token. Exchanging the food is kind of funny because the Archon symmetrical. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the, the Avon Mind Sensor is <laughs> not in play. Oh, so if the Avon Mind Sensor was flashed in here, it would come in tapped? Um, well, he could... Theoretically, Jack could respond to the exchange and flash it in so it comes into play. Oh, I see what you're untapped. saying. But just taking the Archon, like the restrictions mostly are going to be the same at this point gotcha. when Sasha has this much. Oh, that's, that's a really, really nice answer to that Oko. Yeah. It's a fateful absence. Oko is destroyed. It does Sasha give Sasha a clue. I was going to say, Sasha yeah. gets a clue, That's which seems, I mean, <coughs> card draw seems like something Sasha would be interested in at the moment. Mm hmm not to mention, I mean, Sasha's got 20 life to work with here and two 3-3s three on the board. Yeah. So losing the Oko always feels bad. But he gets to untap with three cards in hand, two 3-3s three on the board, and basically perfect mana. So there's the Legion's Landing. Tapping two mana. Let's see what we're going to draw from this clue. This is a case where I, I think if I'm Sasha, I prefer to crack this clue at beginning of combat mm -hmm. just to see if I could potentially get a, a way of killing one of your creatures yeah. to prolong the, you know, this Legion's Landing flipping. So it does look like Sasha's <coughs> idea with that Wasteland was to kill the flipped Legion's Landing. Looks like Sasha's unfortunately dealing with three different lands. So win for six with these Elk. When you're in this situation and you're you're uh, mana flooded, I think a lot of the time you end up naturally being defensive with your creatures. Mm -hmm. So I I really like Sasha's decision to attack for six there. Yeah. Um, it definitely gives him more outs to win the game later. Also, Jack doesn't know, uh, so Jack has to respect the cards in Sasha's hand. Ooh, that's a spell. It is a lightning bolt. Selfless Spirit came down right on time. Yeah. <coughs> Selfless Spirit looks like it has bolts in it already. <laughs> it riddled with arrows, yeah. God. That was so good. Thank you. That was <laughs> yeah, so really good. For it, yeah. Wow. I, I thought really hard about it. 
damn it. I was hoping you'd like it. <laughs> so Jack blocks one of the elk with the 1-1 one, one <laughs> vampire, only taking two damage after all is said and done, factoring lifelink. Sasha figuring out what to do, passes the turn back. Don't know how I feel about holding all these lands. I feel like at some point it's nice to, I mean you are limited by one spell a turn, but I like developing at least one of these lands here, you know? Certainly the breeding pool. Sasha has um, the <coughs> Moloch in his deck, right? Yep. So, so City of Traitors was just sacrificed, which does what? Remind uh, me. So it taps to add two, but whenever you play a land, you have to sacrifice it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And notably, with the Adonto, it, you're not playing the land, so even though it transformed right. and all that, yeah. So there's Lightning Bolt. We don't know what it's targeting. Oh, but I it's saw Jack was about to play his invitational card, <laughs> the Harm's Way. <laughs> Uh, I don't actually know what the Lightning Bolt was targeting, but it was going to get Selfless Spirit no matter what. <coughs> so, Sasha down to seven. Jack on nine. What are you hiding from us, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> Show me your secrets, young man. He's got two cards in hand, and I believe one of them is a spell. Ah. Oh. John who's on run, running card reader oh. at the moment, has recognized a Brave the Elements. And that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. On a recent Earth 100 for the Mom set review, which is available now on Lure MTG, um, we talked about a card that's very similar to this, uh, Surge of Light, I believe that's what it's named. Either way, uh, one of the big differences is that Brave the Elements gives protection, which lets you push for a whole bunch of damage. Yep. Um, and that could come up. We might actually see this where blocking is uh, a, a way that Sasha kind of gets back into the game with, Ooh. say, a flyer. Oh, Speaking of wow. a way to get back into the game, Murktide Region. We've seen a lot of this dragon today. Uh, Sasha attacked with both Elk. Jack jumped with uh, Leon and Arbiter. And now we have a 8-8 Murktide Regent delving five instants or sorceries away to cast an 8-power flyer for two mana. And because of the work that Sasha's been doing to attack Jack's life total, this Murktide is now lethal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thalia from Jack, but no attacks. So now it's interesting. If, if Murktide attacks, does Sasha leave himself open to some sort of shenanigans on the crackback? Jack's tapped out at this point. Mm -hmm. Which, it's again, is never an indication of something in Highlander. But. For sure. This is a spot where if Sasha tries to play a little defensively, um, you're going to get punished by Brave the Elements. But, I mean, you got this dragon. It can kill your opponent. Yeah, Might as well try. Murktide region into the red zone. Uh, Avon Mind, sorry, Idiot Bird Thank uh, you. jumping in front of that bus. And Sasha a, holding another land. A Mox for Sasha. Mox Ruby. Iganjo, original Iganjo, which you can prevent two damage that be dealt to target legendary creature this turn. So that helps Thalia survive, I guess. It's worth noting that Jack, at some point, is going to want to push damage with the Brave the Elements, but he won't be able to cast another spell that turn because mm -hmm. of the Archon. Well, the Archon might be getting in front of a Murktown reach <laughs> this turn. <laughs> which significantly reduces the amount of damage that Jack can push. Is there a temptation to just turn everything sideways there? I guess not with all of Jack's mana open. Yeah, and the Thalia eating up an elk. With that gun. Oh, right, because yeah. Thalia just blocks one. Anyway. Yeah, the first strike, yeah. Sasha did draw a pretty good magic card, though. I missed it. Which one was it? Uh, Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah. There's Uro. Uro is kind of a funny card in our format. Yeah. It, it, it's not as... People look at it and they kind of moan and groan, but the thing about Uro is that it's not the first one. It's the second one. <laughs> and the third, and et cetera. Um, 
And so it's okay. It's pretty strong at times. Spots like this, it's, it's phenomenal. Prismatic ending to, I assume, exile Thalia there? Yeah, and, and then, then brave the elements. The elements were braved to save <laughs> Thalia. I Ooh. think, uh, interesting to note, that if uh, Sasha had been playing out his lands, he would probably have been able to cast that row this yep, turn. Double green. There we go. That's the game. We are going to a game four. Ooh wow. More magic, please. I, I really, really want to point out that Sasha played that game so well, mm -hmm. given what he had. Yeah. Like, there was multiple <laughs> points and turns where Sasha was holding three lands in hand. Um, but he kept his composure, he trusted in his deck and his archetype, and uh, he was able to come out with the victory. So, well, really well played. Yeah, I think you touched on it well with the uh, attacking when you need to attack, where people are prone to being defensive if they feel like they're behind or if their hands all lands or whatever. But, nah, you gotta end the game. Game's gotta end. <laughs> the game's gotta end game's sometime. Game's gotta end sometime, right? Yeah, I think this is a really good clinic on, like, <clears throat> sometimes it's correct to attack even when it feels like it isn't. Yeah. Is <laughs> uh... Someone in chat points out, it's, uh, or observes, it seems like there's a lot of it. it's not the first one, it's the second one in this format. Which, Which is, in a singleton format, is, yeah. is funny. <laughs> yeah. The redundancy that a lot of decks have when it comes to either um, multiple copies of, you know, a similar effect. Yeah. Like, I mean, we've seen that earlier today in Jack's Death and Taxes deck with mm -hmm. that with that Archon, and then now the brand new Phyrexian Sensor. Right. Doing roughly the same thing. Yeah, but they're all slightly different. Yeah. Which adds to another layer of gameplay where you kind of mentally have to note, like, well, this is an effect that I cannot deal with, mm -hmm. and I don't want to. But which one am I dealing with right now? Like, now that the Sensor's off the board, what tools would Death and Taxes have to pull Archon out of its deck? Or if it gets Archon, how bad is it for me? Like, should I be developing my mana in a certain way? Um, and that just adds this level of skill testing like to, to some of your decisions. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, maybe it's easy to just go like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to play my stuff. And that works, honestly. Yeah. Sometimes just being like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, make them have it. Yeah, it definitely does work. But there are tons of situations where like the... Flying on the Archon matters a lot more than the extra point of power from the Phyrexian sensor, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, so, in, in retrospect, just because you were commenting on it at the time, how do you feel about the Wasteland on holding Wasteland for Adanto versus firing it off on City of Traders? I, I, I can see why Sasha would want to hold it for the Adanto, uh, especially given. Sasha's knowledge of what he had in hand, which was basically nothing. Mm. Um, it it kind of feels like, okay, well, if I wasteland the um, two, two mana producing land, the City of Traders, then Jack can just follow up with one to two drops, and I'm just going to die to those anyways. Um, so it's possible Sasha sort of thought like, okay, well, if I do end up dealing with the rest of whatever Jack has, regardless of how much mana it costs the Danto is going to be sort of like the last thing that I have to deal with, and it's going to be hard for me to to handle. Mm -hmm. um, I think, personally, I would have wastelanded the the City of Traders. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan at that stage of, like, because of the Jataxian Probe, you know that Jack is, has to draw lands off the top if he's going to cast other spells. Um, like, just killing two mana, I think, is a really big deal. But I can see why Sasha would make the choice to to wait for the Adanto. The counterpoint, which I can, not to say this is exactly what went through Sasha's mind, is that Archon of Ameria is already limiting a one spell per turn. And sometimes you'll, you'll run to Death and Taxes players that'll they'll tap their city for the two mana like twice and then throw it away and that's fine. But they get that one big turn of tap it, play a thing, play my land and then double spell. But that's off the table with the Archon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Turn one, Shadow Spear from Jack here in game four of this best of five finals and another Gitaxian probe opening for Sasha Christensen. Elite Spellbinder, Thalia, two planes, and a Flagstones of, of Trocare. All right. <laughs> Gotta play it for that arm again. <laughs> mm -hmm. ah. Fascinating. Uh, chat user Bub Rub for Real says this is the first time they're watching Canadian Highlander. Welcome. 
Oh. Enjoy it. Thank you for being here. It's great to have you. Yeah. Hopefully it won't be the last. Mm -hmm. A lot of Flagstones fans in the chat, too. <laughs> Flagstones is kind of a charming card. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. Like... <laughs> Ignoble Hierarch for Sasha. And there's that Thalia. But Thalia's on the I board. think Sasha has <laughs> the Warhammer 40k card. The, uh, oh, the Moloch. Moloch. And if I'm correct... Moloch X is 1, make a 3-3, three, three, fight Thalia. This Moloch eats the Thalia. That's pretty good. I thought the Gitrog ate Thalia. <laughs> uh, evident, not in this timeline, apparently. Interesting. Yeah. You'll have to change, update your notes, I guess. Sasha also has a prismatic ending in hand here. Something that is uh, able to presumably get rid of the next thing, but here we are. Versus Vices in chat says, you have no idea how tempting it is to get a can lander community going in Chicago. Do it. Do it. Do it. The interesting thing about Prismatic Ending with Elite Spellbinder is Sasha can basically just cast it for the same mana cost yep. because of how Prismatic Endings Converge works. Um, you pay the three mana, the one white and the two extra from Elite Spellbinder, but the mana that you put into that two extra mana you're paying still counts towards your overall colors for Converge, so... The old um, Thalia trick. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case... So Moloch attacking for three. Uh, the rest of Sasha's hand is three land and a mox. Attacking for four. I'm sorry. Four. If we have... Uh, if, if, if Sasha right. remembers Exalted. Right, of course. And Sasha's Seacrum been considering Coast. moving out of the city and starting a ranch <laughs> with some lands. Oh, there we go. Land, Sapphire... Her. And Sasha's overpaying for this um, because uh, I, I don't think he thought about the interaction between Elite Spellbinder and the uh, the colors, but it doesn't matter. No. Like he's not it, casting it, anything. Anyways. I mean, you can make it to the finals of this event, but you you know, not everybody's a Trenton McIntyre or a <laughs> okay. Benjamin Wheeler, am I right? <laughs> So now, I mean, Sasha has a clue and a draw step and two cards in hand, but the two cards, I believe, are lands. So we're kind of at the mercy of the top of our deck. Fateful Absence on the Moloch gives Sasha a clue. Is that Hierarch going to attack for one? Well, let's cycle the clue first and find out. Uh, it looks like a Pyrokinesis from Sasha. That's a brutal magic card right there. Yeah. Somebody was asking about... Um, the Moloch living through that fight. That was the two power Thalia. So it was a three power, it was a three toughness Moloch fighting a two power Thalia. So Moloch gets to live and be a tyrannid menace another day. Uh, until, of course, the fateful absence. Esper Sentinel now equipped with a Shadow Spear. That's uh, kind of scary. Are we going to see hard cast Pyrokinesis in the finals of this? Uh... 2022 top eight. He's got to be thinking about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, the Sentinel makes it kind of awkward because you're <laughs> like, well, this is six mana and now I have to pay two. Ooh. Ledger, Ledger Shredder. Shredder. Another idiot bird. <laughs> Emphasis on the bird part. How many idiot birds are there in what this What do you have format? against Too birds? Too many grams. What do you have against birds? <laughs> you, know what, you know what the wild thing is? I love birds. <laughs> <laughs> Steel Shaper's gift from Jack here. Previously, we've seen that go looking for a Skull Clamp. Uh, I think we've seen it looking for a Shadow Spear. What's, what's Steel Shaper's gift looking for today, do you think? I would wager Skull Clamp. Although, heck of a... Double spelling in this spot gives Sasha a draw, mm -hmm. uh, which is not the greatest, especially because he's sitting on this extra land. But, you know, if you want to get it down, you got to do it now. Yeah, Sasha would be happy to connive. It is Skull Clamp. And, yep, that's being cast. Connive away. Yep. That's I've, all, yeah. I've been thinking about, well, do you get Skull Clamp or Jitte, etc. But I actually like the Clamp a lot here because you um, move the power up of the Esper Sentinel. And then if it Sasha ends even up killing more annoying, it, right. yeah, if Sasha ends up killing it, then you just are drawing your two cards anyways. And um, it's probably, I think Jack's probably identified that Skull Clamp is just one of his best cards against Sasha's game plan, right? Like you, for sure. You stop having to worry about trading for with one for one removal, and eventually you just overrun Sasha with, you know, a bunch of creatures that you've drawn off of the clamp. Oh. And Sasha misses his connive trigger. Uh oh. Uh, this is competitive Ariel. We have to remember. So. Um, well, he did connive. Oh, he did. The 
botanical sanctum. Oh, okay. Never he mind. just didn't get never a counter. Mind. Never mind. He just, yeah, no well, he wouldn't get a counter anyway. Yeah, so. no counter because of discarding the land. So. But uh, did you see what Sasha drew? I did not. It's I a very not. good dog. But you, <laughs> oh, it's a very oh, good oh, dog. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> very good dog. I'd like to use this moment where Sasha is shuffling about the player asking about a scene in Chicago. Uh, I literally had a discussion on Twitter with some people from Chicago playing this format. Well, there you go. This week. Where is it? Chicago. No, but... <laughs> Where's the format? Oh, Illinois. <laughs> I've, I've Graham, only, why I, are you tearing up my contract? I've only heard the album. Uh, no, where, uh, roughly speaking, in Chicago, do you know the LGS or like where? Uh, where should Versus Vices go looking? Uh, find me on Twitter and look at my replies from the last week. Uh, there you go, B Wheeler MTG. He plugged me, not me. Dog. Very good dog. So not paying extra for, or, or yes, paying extra. Yep, paying yeah, so seven paying mana, full seven for this good boy to deny the draw. Oh Six. no! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, so that's rolling a six, meaning you get to activate Comet's ability twice more and takes Comet to six. I didn't see what the draw was there. That was a, was one. a one. So okay. that's two hasty squirrels. Will we see another six? So we have squirrels. I assure you, we have squirrel tokens. Oh, it looks like Sasha might. Have his own. There we go. Look at that. We 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 asked the players to come prepared. Come and boy, on, come did on, they. money, 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 <clears throat> and more squirrels. More squirrels. <laughs> dog, dog, dog. Mark Rosewater, eat your heart out. Correct me if I'm wrong. Esper Sentinel currently has one toughness. That's right, Graham. All right. So these squirrels pose a credible threat. <laughs> yes. To that Esper Sentinel. And Comet is now on 10 loyalty. Wow. I wish nothing but the best for this Comet. <laughs> <laughs> You've been waiting all day I... <laughs> to, see, to see the dog pop off. This I mean, you were hoping for the dog mirror match, but still. Fateful Absence on the Moloch is looking a little goofy. <laughs> 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 I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty green cards, but, you know, in this case... Uh, all oh, those squirrels yeah. and the shredder. Well, how many attacks at Comet? Because at this point, take? Comet can just tank a hit from the mm -hmm. Esper Sentinel. Sasha's the 17. Um, yeah, Sasha's in the driver's seat right now. Um, but Jack is going to be getting some draws off the Skull Clamp. So, yeah. So, one. <laughs> One squirrel down. There's a change of life totals. The Esper Sentinel had lifelink. Uh, the the players and judges have worked that out. So it's 17 to 14, and Jack draws two cards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not bad. Now, if we can get this Comet off the board, which might be very difficult at this point in time, <laughs> yeah. but through a spell, yeah. if we can get this Comet off the board, Jack can very easily just kind of trump everything in play, mm -hmm. right? These, they're only one ones. You got a bunch, but Jack's got life to work with. He's got you're, a Shadow yeah, Sphere. Yeah, your Shadow Sphere is taking care of those one ones. You don't yeah. have to worry about them. It's the fact that if this Comet rolls a four or a five, uh, Jack might take ten. Champion of the Parish, Mother of Runes, Champion of the Parish Shadow triggers. To, Shadow to Champion of the Parish and Innistrad in general. Letter Shredder triggers. Discards lose focus. Equipping Shadow Spear. Nope. Equipping Skull Clamp on Champion. Passing the turn. Nice little rebuilding turn there for Jack. Yeah, not bad. Who's that good boy? <laughs> Who's that good boy? <laughs> I assume you just start with Dog. Yeah, you that's a that's a pretty dog. that's a pretty good you know setup. Oh my God. Three. So three is the the I'm doing air quotes here. The bad roll, because you merely get to return a card of mana value to realize from your graveyard to your hand. Oh. Oh, Sasha can get the Moloch back though. Yeah. Oh wow. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Actually, wow, that's very strong right here, isn't it? It's not bad. It's not bad. I'd say it's even quite good. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I think you have to get like. 
Oh. Oh. Looking at something other than Moloch. Oh. Getting back the prismatic ending. It is oh. a card with mana value to Oh, wow. You'd assume permanent, but... Um, Turns out Comet's too good. Yeah, I just assumed permanent, but getting this prismatic ending back is definitely yeah. the right call. You get Exiling rid of the skull, skull clamp. clamp. Goodness. It, the clamp is the only, uh, or is one, one of Jack's best ways to get back from this position, and like being able to exile it right away is very strong. Yeah, it's appealing, and we got this pyrokinesis, which is going to clear the board. So we are in fact seeing a hard cast pyrokinesis in the top eight. Oh, so that was one. That was damage to the champion and mom. But Jack has fight as one in response to save. I think it was the champion. I wasn't sure exactly what was indicated there. Uh, Ledger Shredder connives, discarding tribute to St. Catherine. Looks like Jack saved the Mother of Runes there. Yep. Got to invest in that future. In for three with the Ledger Shredder. Extraction Specialist. It's back. This card's been impressive. Esper Sentinel, not a bad one to get back. The lifelink on the specialist might be really relevant. Yep. There's still the issue of this dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog just keeps on barking. Nope. Oh, couldn't see that. I guess I'll have to infer for three. When you get home and you tell your loved ones the dogs were barking, which isn't <laughs> what they think you mean. No, honey. I'm not talking about my feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're looking at Moloch this time. And I think this is a perfect example of, if you haven't played Comet, you don't, it, it's hard to really evaluate the card. Mm -hmm. But every turn we're seeing Sasha, and it, does, it almost doesn't matter what ability he rolls. Yeah. Like, all of them are good. Yeah, reminder, this is the air quotes bad ability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> With an activated Mother of Runes, though, that it's hard to get through. Uh, right. Mother of Runes is up right now. Yeah. So, yeah, that fight is going to be tricky. Mom's up. <laughs> There's a Teferi in hand for her. Oh, oh, here comes the Moloch. All right. So what's the what's the plan here? Moloch uh, doing some math. <coughs> so Sasha Moloching for three here. Yeah. If you're Jack, you you have to assume something's up with that last card in Sasha's hand. But uh, honestly, I don't think you can really pay or play around it. Moloch X is four actually tapping the noble hierarch. Oh, Sasha's nope. Sasha's thinking about it. Changing how to happen. The allure of drawing a card. <laughs> Every magic player ever has felt this allure. I mean, I could double spell, but I could draw a card. But I could divination. <laughs> oh, oh. What a world. I, I think playing the Moloch for th like three or four is correct, though. So who uh, are we fighting? Doesn't matter. I go for Mum, force the issue. And now you can reset the mom if you want. You can bounce the um, the Esper Sentinel. So playing Teferi, paying for Esper Sentinel. Can I have discards a Ponder? Makes the Letter Shredder even bigger. Minus Teferi. Bounce this Teferi bounces. Bounces mom. I like bouncing the mom here. And that's Letter Shredder for five. One power, three counters, and an exalted yeah. trigger. Yeah. And and now Jack doesn't even get to free roll attack with his lifelink creature and, and use mom to gain the life to not die from the ledger shredder. What's Jack got here? Ballista. Ah, this ballista's going for a walk. Shredder keeps conniving. 
Ooh. This shredder keeps conniving. I think that's a brainstorm <laughs> and a lightning bolt. The shredder is his conniving. Hands. Oh, it's <clears throat> chain lightning. I'm sorry. Chain lightning. Right you are, Graham. Um, this puts Jack in a bit of an awkward spot. And, yeah, just kind of says... He's getting a blocker either way because this Esper Sentinel can't block um, where, as long as Extraction Specialist is in play. Why did Extraction Specialist just leave play? Because uh, it attacked. Jack had to attack oh, for see. three lifelink because otherwise uh, he on board loses to the right. Of bird. course, yes. Come on, show me a show me a lightning bolt. Ah, oh, squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> Chain, chain landing you? Yeah, chain landing closes it up, and wow, oh, we are boy, going oh boy. to game five. Game five of the finals. Very exciting. Boy, this this has been this has been a match. Oh yeah. Yeah. This I is, gotta go replace the batteries in this mic pack. Oh, right, right away. Um, this is why this format's so addicting. Yeah, it's just like even the same matchup, you play a ton of games, and every game feels so different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got the Comet doing Comet stuff. I initially, when I looked at Comet, I thought that card was bad, mm -hmm. and I've come around to the good boy. Such and high it, loyalty. It just does it all. Everything it does everything. But like, but like your dog at home, it doesn't do everything you want all the time. God but, no. But you still love him. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, you you returned a card to my hand. I mean, thank you for the <laughs> fetch land. <laughs> you know? I mean, if it's a dog, then it's going to want to fetch land, huh? I imagine a six. This dog's is... like fetch. <laughs> yeah, Trenton. I get it. I get Trenton! It. <laughs> Sorry. Trenton! Dogs like fetch! Uh, I imagine I rolling a six room. is like uh, giving Comet a treat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, getting confirmation from lawyer dog in <laughs> chat. That's so true. Dogs do like fetch. <laughs> I have heard that myself. Taking Just innocent men dogs. What? Dog, dogs men's? I agree, Siebs. Uh, Wheeler, stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not okay. happening. <laughs> who, who are you? Um, a pithing needle on polluted delta? Stop trying to make a fetch happen. Oh, I get it. So we're taking a quick bra uh, bathroom break here uh, <laughs> before going into game five. Um, I'm so glad that we got to see the full five oh, yeah. in the finals. We've seen both of these decks at their, like, operating just at full capacity. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, <clears throat> not necessarily in the same game, but uh, certainly over the course of this match. And uh, this has been... Uh, just, just a delight to watch. I think one of the really awesome things is that we've both seen all the uh, these decks operating at full capacity, but the other deck has been slugging through and act, and having opportunities to take take back the initiative, for for lack of a better word. Uh, Lean so, into yeah, it. Like the games have been good. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't just that the, the one deck is humming and the other deck is folding. Um, we've really seen like really tight plays, really close calls. Um, what say Jack finds off of his um, uh, like searching for an equipment, mm -hmm. like th those things are uh, matter a lot, mm -hmm. uh, and it really shows you how um, co complex the format can be if that's something that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. If I'm Jack, yeah, I mean I'm hoping for fast mana, right? Trying to get out there underneath. The removal that Sasha might present. But again, I'm going to need a couple of pieces, right? I need the fast mana. I need my first threat. That's probably going to get killed. I need a follow up. Yeah. Let's say we're not getting the nut draw. Okay. What are you looking for if you're Jack? I, I think you're looking for a Mother of Runes variant on turn one. That's probably one of your strongest openings against what Sasha's doing. Mm -hmm. Um,. Because it, it insulates the rest of your cards so well against Sasha. And like like we've talked about earlier uh, in the matchup between Sasha and Robin, it's like uh, <clears throat> Sasha is playing a, a more mana, co a mana value higher, like a higher mana value version of the four color deck. Mm -hmm. And so like double spelling is a lot harder. So if you land a mom or, or a giver of runes, uh, it can be hard for Sasha to deal with the follow up plays. Mm -hmm. Same question, but now you are Sasha. No Moxon. 
what are you, what am I looking at for my seven? Do I want to have a Tarmogoy for a Ledger Shredder? Am I just all burn all the time? Do I want to get the Comet in play again? You definitely always want the good boy. Let's just get that out of the okay, way. It's, it's a good girl. dog. It's <laughs> just a good magic card, uh, as it turns out. I actually think the removal is a little more important to Sasha than the creatures. Like, Tarmogoyf is obviously very good, but, um, it, like, coming back to Jack's deck, a, like, the ability to pick and choose which creatures you care about is what your removal gives you, yeah. right? Like, choosing what you path exile or swords or unholy heat. Um, so... And you can trust the rest of your deck to sort of fall into place afterwards, right? You have so many hits. You have your Okos, your Minsk and Boos, etc. Um, so I think you're you're really looking for hands that interact early on the removal front. And then you just trust the rest of your deck that eventually you're going to draw some big haymaker that's going to sort of turn the, the tables on Jack. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the players are just uh, resolving their mulligans. So, or resolving their draws. Have they both taken mulligans? What's... Sorry. All right. Sasha's keeping a seven. Jack is going to six. Hopefully no fewer than that. So, this is also worth talking about. Yeah, You please. mentioned... Trent mentioned earlier about, you know, mulliganing... I mean, it hurts us all. But... <laughs> Yeah, in but its, in its own way. Why but can't I, we all just draw perfectly the first time? <laughs> why, why, why must mulliganing happen? I've been pitching an eight-card hand <laughs> <laughs> for years. Um, a one-hundred-card hand. But against such a removal-heavy deck, going to a mulligan just even to six is something that can hurt. Uh, even if you are a deck that recovers pretty well, like Death of mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so this is where you know you might have uh, some sevens. Jack might have some sevens that you, we're not seeing the fast mana, but again, we have the mum. We have the way to build up a Luminar Aspirant, whatever. Um, and as we cut cards from that, there are fewer cards that we can kind of say like, well, this protects this. So then I can, you know, they have to try and double spell or, or get through this. Because we got to assume Sasha's going to kill one thing, presumably. Yeah, you definitely assume Sasha has at least one removal spell, if not a couple. This looks like Jack is mulliganing to five. Jack is going to five. Um, this is where we are looking for some fast mana. Yeah. I think this is where we can take advantage of the mulligan. Again, people say you have to mulligan, uh, including myself about two minutes ago. But <laughs> it's that you get to mulligan. Uh, yeah. The privilege of mulliganing. Yeah. And di hey, Digimon players know it well. <laughs> it is a privilege. Once you get it, you're like, oh, yeah, this is kind of necessary. Um... I've never played Digimon. Uh, I, I played it once. I mostly it's mostly a rib at uh, John, who plays quite a bit of Digimon. Uh, John there, but uh, a format that they didn't have a mulligan, and it was recently added to the game. Hmm. They didn't. They just didn't have a mulligan. Yep. Huh. They're, they're going full Yu-Gi-Oh. All right. Uh, what do you think Jack's looking for here, in his five-card hand? I was thinking about sevens, but I'm not sure about fives. Micah in chat suggests that the nuts might be turn one white plume from Mana Crypt. That is pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. All right, looks like Jack's found a keepable five, or at least a five that he's willing to keep more than he would like to go to four. Oh, oh, whoa, uh, uh. <gasps> hold on. Flagstones into Mana Crypt. Sasha has a mental note in hand, or a mental misstep, excuse me, in hand. Wow. I believe. Flagstones into Mana Crypt, into Mom. Where is that a Merc Tide? If you. Um, so. Does Sasha have land? So playing. Yeah, Sasha has land and a Mox. Oh, okay. Um, so playing this Mana Crypt, probably a, a misplay. Uh, Jack was really excited. Uh, I, I do think, e even though Jack's played the Mana Crypt, that playing the Mother Runes is better than leading on the Thalia. It could be, Jack could be worried about, like, losing to Spell Pierce. That's true. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you could lose a Mana Crypt flip. <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> uh. Petty Theft returning Mom to hand. Mom's back. And Frexing Revoker. <gasps> Guess what that can name? Non-land cards. Doesn't matter about it, mana abilities. That Mock Sapphire might be shrek as they say. <laughs> As I've said. As, as you've been known to say. Specifically, I've said it about Mox Sapphire, yeah. Um, 
that Phyrexian Revoker is really, really big for Jack. It's definitely one of the ways that he comes back into this. Um, and the Mom is, is absolutely huge, too. Like, Sasha's mm -hmm. very, very pressured to kill this Mother of Runes this turn. Mock Sapphire, indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Nelson, for that note. <laughs> Sasha has a Marsh Flats in hand, a Birds of Par Paradise, Ponder, Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes, uh, Fable the Mirror Breaker, and Murktide Regent. Now, after everybody's recovered from kind of, you know, getting upset to their stomach with all that value, um, we kind of have a conundrum, right? The Marsh Flats is going to find a white X dual land. Sasha already has the basic planes. So we can look for a triome, for instance, like the Bant triome to set up our, um, our ponder and our birds, but that's kind of slow. Comes, we in, comes in tapped. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We could develop our birds of paradise here which is fine, but we're getting Savannah, and then we're playing this card that might get got by any number of cheap removal spells. Yeah, like, like if Jack sorts Plashers, it, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I think you still want to play the birds, potentially, um, but I can see an argument for Ponder as well. Like bo Both of them are fine. Um, my th thought process on playing the birds is... Um, you're kind of looking for land with your ponder already, mm -hmm. and so playing the birds uh, is sort of the highest upside play. And Jack also kept a five, um, <clears throat> and I think it, it if you're if like, if you know uh, this like a lot about this matchup, you can probably assume that Jack is looking to keep <sighs> proactive fives. Wow, right? that is a hell of a. Wow. Spread. We have Prismatic Ending, Force of Negation, and Scalding Tarn. So that lets that opens up Sasha's mana eventually. Prismatic Ending can be drawn immediately to deal with this mana crypt, which Jack's on a one lander. Um, yeah, he, he might deal with the Mother Ferns. He would have to wait a turn to do it, which then opens up the Mother. Nope. No? Yeah, oh, just, wait, no. Mom yeah. got bounced. Oh, yes. right. Petty theft. Yeah. You'll have to excuse me. I got so hyped over Phyrexian Revoker. <laughs> I mean, this ponder was in impressive from Sasha. Mm -hmm. Like, this ponder is really, really good. Jack has taken six <laughs> off Mana Crypt. So Jack passed. Um, if you're Sasha, you probably have to assume that Jack has, like, a, some sort of mind sensor, maybe. Um because of your mana situation, you probably can't play around it, so Sasha's probably just going to fetch here. Yeah. We knew that he had the Fable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this is this could be oh the crack of the knuckles from Sasha there. <laughs> Looking at the top four, whiff, whiff, whiff. Sea Coast. Whiff. Fire Buff Canal. <sighs> wow. Brutal. Jack is really punishing Sasha on a lot of different axes, and remember, Jack Mulligan to five. Yep. yep. I've used a, this descriptor for Highlander in the past year where the cards are so good. I mean, a lot of these are older cards, but the cards are so good, especially from the past years or so, a couple of years. Um, and it's like two heavyweight boxers just slamming fists into each other <laughs> for the first couple of turns. And then when they're all woozy and kind of coming to that's when it really hopes to have, be about your senses. Yeah. And like figure out like, okay, well I still have to actually hit the person a couple of times. Um, and yeah, it's just like fast mana, bounce your mom on turn one, just hilarious. Lock yeah. you out of your mana with this revoker and hit you the kill my mom. Hit ending off yeah. the ponder, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that an Iganjo into Athalia? That is an Iganjo right. into Athalia. An Iganjo seat of the Ganjo. Empire. Oh, and a Mardu Wo Reaper. The Sally is extremely punishing for Sasha. And, um, so, oh, Sasha's going to have to hit. Oh, that, we got a hit we got right a away. Hit, we, got a hit. we got two hits. Or no, we only have one hit, but it's painful. It's a uh, shock land in the form of stomping ground. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, you have to shock here, right? Yeah. Um, what are you casting? Uh, nothing. Fable, Fable <laughs> Actually, of the Mirror Breaker? Thalia, Guardian of Thraven. Yeah. You're not, oh, you're wow. not casting that's anything. What I, that's what I mean. Like, do you, if you know you're not casting a thing, do you even shock? Well, I guess that's not fair. There's also a uh, Birds of Paradise that um, could be played. Although, taking two to play a thing that's not blocking. Yeah, is kind of harsh. Yeah. Sasha may be in a spot where the card... It's worth me mentioning... It's not in hand currently, 
but pyrokinesis or fury clears Jack's board entirely. Yeah, and he's got a red. He's got two red cards. Jack's gotten lucky on the last two uh, mana crypt rolls. Sasha did opt to pay two life for the. This is a lot of damage. This is one. One. Oh my goodness me. Ballista, do it. <laughs> one draw. Pyrokinesis or Fury. Chaos of Chaos Adventurer. Not doing it. Wow. That's it. Wow. Oh my goodness. And Jack Hanniga takes it down on a mulligan to five. We went to game five. Jack went to five in his hand. Must have got a mis mis mistranslation. <laughs> um, <laughs> and holy smokes. That was a fantastic series. Um, Jack, Jack having the wherewithal to, in the finals of what, uh, what you were describing, Ben, is one of the most important tournaments for us mm -hmm. in, in Victoria. Like, uh, and to have the wherewithal to be convicted, mulligan to five, trust job, the cards that you've brought, mm -hmm. and to get there, like, absolutely incredible. And Jack, fantastic way to end Jack's a disciplined pilot, too, for death and taxes. He could look at a seven. We don't know if it was no lands or whatever for them, but Jack's the kind of player that has the, the uh, history with this deck, certainly, yeah. to look at a seven and go, this is not good enough. I need better, especially in that game right there. And... Super dense plays for every every little decision mattered there, on every single turn. Every every mana mattered. Yeah. Every point of life mattered. Yeah. I couldn't think of a better way to end the series, honestly. Yeah. Let's take it. Oh, what? Robin's in the booth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your uh, thing, we gotta have to crash the booth every year. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. That was an awesome thing. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I was going to say was congratulations, brilliant. obviously, to all the players today for making it to the top eight, for making it to this event today. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, obviously, congratulations to uh, Jack Hanneke. Our Death winner. Texas, our mm -hmm. winner. Um, can we get that guy banned? From <laughs> <laughs> we can take a look at the uh, the final the final bracket uh, of what uh, what what this day looked like. What a long day, but boy, it's been some powerful magic. God. Terrific. If I may stuff. do a little bit of storytelling. Yeah, let's come on back. <laughs> Not What's to delve too much into Jack's personal life. <laughs> okay. Too, but Jack uh, moved to Victoria from across the country, from Halifax, Nova Scotia, but I believe. That's about as far as you could get. It's quite, quite a ways. Yeah. Um, and Jack had actually flown to Victoria previously, before even moving here, before even maybe it was even a consideration of moving, to just show up and play some Canadian Highland. <laughs> I think there was a larger yeah. trip involved, but it was like, oh, we're, we're going to the West Coast. Terrific. Got to make a stop gotta, to play some Canadian Highland. Got to go, go play and, some land. And, you Love know, there's, there are fewer putt players and pilots in the format as dedicated to the format as Jack. Active on the Discord. Uh, plays in, you know, basically every weekly. Constantly jam, like getting, trying to get groups to jam outside of it. You love to see it. You love, love to see that kind of commitment pay off, you yeah. know. Well, this has been an absolute blast today, and we're so glad that you have all been able to join us. Uh, I want to thank a bunch of folks before we let you go. I don't know what's going on with my microphone. Hello? There okay, there go. we go. It's just, it's been a long day for everybody, <laughs> including the microphone <laughs> and the receiver. Uh, the, uh, so myself, Graham, and the rest of our commentary team, Trenton McIntyre, Benjamin Wheeler, uh, Nelson Salahab, and Alex Stacy as well. Um, tournament organizer, and player, Benjamin Wheeler. Oh, stop. Uh, James Turner, who, uh, of course, uh, has produced uh, the day of putting uh, all this together. Uh, Paul, who's been running tech all day. Uh, you haven't been hearing him, but we have occasionally. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, and our co-head judges, Nelson Salahab and John Milsip, who stepped in also at the last minute to run card reader for the finals. So much appreciated there. Uh, and our players and all of you for being here and watching. We really appreciate it. A reminder, everything we do here at Loading Ready Run is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Uh, or those of you who subscribe here on Twitch uh, or just watch on the YouTube, again, thank you. We really appreciate you uh, being here and supporting us and uh, it means a lot. So thank you so much. Anything else to add before we say goodbye? I mean... 
the last event that we did, the last tournament that we did, <laughs> yeah. the last year end that was broadcast here, there was a death and taxes player mm -hmm. in the finals yeah. who fell and oh, lost God. in the game five. No. <laughs> Jack has reclaimed the honor for death and taxes for everyone, and you gotta love it. Yeah. Also, thanks for having me, Graham. It's, it was great to be here. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, social plugs. Sure. Yeah. Where can people find oh, you on gosh. the internet? Do you, um, is that a thing you do? I'm, I'm a little social. I guess you, if you want to find me uh, at Twitter, uh, or sorry, at Twitter, uh, um, at Trentiano on Twitter. It's T-R-E-N-T-I-A-N-O. Yeah. B Wheeler uh, MTG. B Wheeler MTG. Benjamin underscore Wheeler at Twitch. But also, for a more Trenton and me commentary, there's oh, yeah. the VOD for the Chris Sutherland uh, charity tournament that we did last September in 2022 yeah. uh, that is still up there. It's a great tournament. Mm -hmm. Lot, Lots of great, powerful matches being played. Yep. So. I'm still Graham underscore LRR uh, on Twitter, but also Graham underscore LRR at kind.social on Mastodon, where I'm doing most of my interaction these days. Mm -hmm. Cause Twitter sucks. Smart. All right. Given that, uh, great moment to end on. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna take off. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us for this very very long day of stream. <laughs> it's been a blast, and we will talk to you all later. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.